I'm a porcine gourmand of the art of romance. I'm a maestro of the boudoir when I take off my pants. All of this is true, all of the above. I wouldn't lie to you, cause I'm a pee for love. He's a My appetite's rapacious, but my capacity is dim. I seem so audacious, some call me Gentleman Jim. When all is said and done, and a push comes to shove, I'm second to none, cause I'm a pig for love. Others won't come close Cause they think I'm suspicious Please pardon me If I'm somewhat repetitious Like a hand in a glove I'm a pig for love Time right now for the David Feldman show. He's talking politics and comedy too. He'll tell a dirty joke if you want him to. He's just a lefty from way back. He's a union man with an Emmy for writing. Someday he's mad and he feels like fighting. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show So get your ears on right, buckle in real tight He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way to say and he's coming your way he's got a lot to say and he's coming your way he's got a lot to say and he's coming Thank you, Professor Mike Steinel. Welcome to the mop up for November 18th, 2021. I'm David Feldman coming to you from an air shaft overlooking a parking garage in New York City where the temperature is 67 degrees and sunny. So they say, they say it's sunny. I wouldn't know, I live in an air shaft. Jacob Chansley, the QAnon shaman who became the face of January 6th was sentenced this week to 41 months in prison. Wait. 41 months, you add up four and one, that comes to five. 
January was the first month of the year, the number one plus the four and the five and the one, that's January, that's six. January six, it's all, it's all making sense now. Two men convicted of the 1965 assassination of Malcolm X were exonerated during a court hearing Thursday after a half-century effort to clear their names. Walking outside the courthouse steps, they reached for their wallets and were promptly shot by police. The New York City Police Union is holding a pancake breakfast tomorrow to raise money to buy one of those police officers a new bullet. We... <laughs> They're raising money for the bullet. Uh, we have some breaking news. The journal called Science, the journal Science reports the world's first known COVID case turns out to be a vendor at a Wuhan market. This unfortunately settles nothing since the name of his store was Lab Leaks and such. Congressman Paul Gosar was censured yesterday for posting an anime video depicting him killing Congresswoman AOC. Here's an interesting side note. Uh, Congressman Gosar is a dentist from Arizona, so it's not the first time he's heard the word censure because that's how all his patients end up pronouncing the word denture. Censure. You see, he's bad at what he does. Dr. Gosar, are you certain these censures fit? Build Back Better, is Sam Cedar still here? Did he leave yet? Okay, Build Back Better is hurt. Build Back Better is, <laughs> Build Back Better. Uh, I'm, I'm setting the table now for Sam Cedar. Uh, this is uh, now, call, it's called setting the table. Build Back Better is hurtling towards some kind of resolution this week, hopefully. Speaker Nancy Pelosi is adamant about inserting four weeks of paid leave into the bill. She's proposed a, a pilot program to get used to paid leave. Uh, the pilot program would be uh, four weeks of paid leave for every member of Congress first. And then if that works, obviously the goal would be to expand it to eight weeks for members of Congress. Build Back Better, the social safety net bill, is still being tweaked, and word is that the social spending bill will include a $285 billion tax cut for the wealthy. This will be the second largest expense in the social safety net bill, a $285 billion tax cut for the richest 10%. Now, this is, I'm setting the table for Sam Cedar here. According to CapitalTrades.com, our friend Jeff Blackwood turned us on to CapitalTrades.com on Tuesday's show. Uh, New Jersey Democratic Governor, not Governor, Congressman Josh Gottheimer, Harvard Law School, New Jersey Democratic Congressman Josh Gottheimer, he's the one who attached this massive tax cut to the spending bill to provide a social safety net for us. And, and so how do we pay for this social safety net? Well, we give a tax cut to the richest 10%. This is from Josh Kodheimer, the problem solver. And uh, it's in the bill. It's in the social safety net bill, a uh, massive tax cut for the, the wealthy. Josh Kodheimer, according to this new website that we've been turned on to, Josh Kodheimer, Sam, I'm going to bring you in here. Please welcome the, the star of... Majority Report with Sam Cedar. Uh, hey, Sam, thank you for doing this. I know, congratulations on being asked back. <laughs> Welcome back. Thank, thank you, David. It's, um, it's a real pleasure to be here, I gotta say, a uh, real pleasure. I think you're in the Three Timers Club now. Well, um, that is an oversight on my part then. <laughs> <laughs> because I thought this was only the second time I was doing this. I think you get and the there's three. Something, times. Isn't there a saying something like um, one time shame on you, two times shame on me, and then like three times is you really, we won't get something should be revoked, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So you're a member of the two timers club. You cheated on my wife, my second wife. You're a two timer. Wait. You cheated on my wife. My, you cheat on my second wife with my fifth wife, mm -hmm. but let's keep it. Let's not bring up the personal problems. 
between us. We didn't find it to be a problem at all. (laughs) Okay. That's how you... It's my my third wife you're talking about. Well, and actually three through five. Yeah, three three through five, yes. Correct. It's getting hot in here. Okay, Uh, New Jersey Democratic Congressman Josh Gottheimer... I just want to read you off some statistics. I know you're a big fan of Godheimer because you're a problem solver. Yeah, yep. He purchased $15,000 of Apple stock this week. Godheimer sold his Texas Instruments stocks, used the profits to buy NVIDIA. Godheimer bought $50,000 worth of Microsoft last week. Hold on for a second. I want to, uh, I want to write this down because I want to shadow <laughs> that guy. <laughs> I just need to do the uh, I just need to do the math where I split up one hundred and fifty dollars in the same sort of configuration as he's spending his hundreds of thousands of dollars. Oh, it gets worse, my friend. It gets worse. Godheimer this week also purchased fifteen thousand dollars worth of Netflix. Not a fan of uh, transgender people, obviously. He sold $15,000 worth of John Deere stock, Mm -hmm. no doubt in solidarity with the striking workers who just agreed agreed to accept a new contract. Gottheimer sold close to $50,000 worth of stock in PayPal this week. He has made hundreds of thousands of dollars in trades in the lead up to the passage of the bipartisan infrastructure bill. So Two months ago, he was buying and selling individual stocks. This is all public knowledge. You go to CapitalTrades.com. He sold stock in Twitter. He sold $15,000 of stock in Zillow right before Zillow tanked and said it was getting out of the home buying business. What did Josh Gottheimer know? Back in August, this is where, Sam, this is where it gets... And then I want your response on all this. Back in August, he bought and sold close to $8 million worth of Microsoft stock options. He was going long, then going short. He's a Harvard Law graduate. Josh Gottheimer was playing the stock market during the summer when the rest of the schmucks were working out an agreement on the bipartisan infrastructure bill. He w- you know, and the softened you know, the, the social safety net bill, he was trading on the information. Meanwhile, this is, I want to discuss Jimmy Dore, because this is how people become Jimmy Dore, okay? Uh, Nancy Pelosi purchased $19 million worth of stock, right? This is how you become Jimmy Dore. Kevin McCarthy purchased zero stocks in the past 12 months, Republican minority leader. Um, Ro Khanna purchased $25 million worth of stock and sold off $15 million. It was trading stocks this year, Ro Khanna, who we like. Matt Gates, zero trades in the past year. Multi-millionaire, zero trades. Louis Buller Gomer Jr., zero trades. Do you see how people start off criticizing the Democratic Party? and become either crypto Republicans or crypto fascists like Jimmy Dore? Do you see how that happens? Seriously. I, 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 yeah, yeah, no, no I, I do. I'm getting a little bit of feedback. Um, I, I do, I, I mean, look, there is um, a significant portion of the Democratic Party. I don't know if it's 40% or 60% or, or more, but we can also say, you know, it's nearly 100 percent of our pol- politicians in both parties are incredibly wealthy. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know what's more egregious, uh, the the money that that Nancy Pelosi is, is making, you know, on these trades. I mean, you know, she's she's so rich. I can't I honestly don't know if five or ten million dollars makes that much of a difference to her, you know, in any given point. I, I, I think just as bad was her officiating a wedding at the San Francisco City Hall that was done up as if it was like, um, I don't know, uh, what's the, what's the, uh, <laughs> you know, some castle uh, for some right. billionaires. Santa, I mean, Santa do. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it, you know, so, uh, um, yeah, it's a real problem. I mean, I think like, um, and I think the complaints about, 
the Democratic Party and, and our politics, uh, broadly speaking, are very often legitimate. It's really, how do you respond to that? And, you know, if there was, um, if the solutions or the non-solutions that folks like that offered made any sense, then they'd have a much better case. Um, I, I, you know, look, I mean, I had uh, on my program, uh, Shahid Buttar on the program, like he co-hosted co -hosted the show a couple of times um, while he was running against uh, Nancy Pelosi. And it didn't seem to move the needle uh, in San Francisco and uh, that congressional district. And I, and I, I say that facetiously. Right. Um, but, you know, that's um, there are certain realities that it doesn't bother a lot of the other uh, uh, Americans um, that our politicians are this wealthy and that um, they are using their positions as a way of enriching themselves at the I mean, look, at the end of the day, I I think it's a problem that Nancy Pelosi is extreme, you know, is 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 both. Indic her wealth is indicative of other uh, members, and I think it's a problem that she's trading off of this. I think it's more of a problem what she's doing as like, you know, preventing certain policies from moving forward and not just her, others. Um, I wouldn't feel, um, I mean, I think it's, an, it's another problem. I think we have a huge uh, uh, problem with wealth uh, disparity and inequality and, and how it leads to our politics, but I'm not as mad about the salt tax thing by Gottheimer as I am about the fact that the bill's not three point five trillion or six trillion dollars big, right? Like, it, you know, it's one thing to have to trade. Okay, fine, you get your uh, salt deductions back that are basically just a sop to the top ten percent of 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 wealthy people in California and New Jersey and New York. But if we get expanded Medicaid, Medicare, um, you know, if it goes down to the age of 60 and everybody gets a paid, you know, gets a vision taken care of, I'm willing to have that fight about the salt deductions on another day. Mm -hmm. uh, but what's infuriating about it is that they're getting those t as what are effectively tax cuts. Um, and the money that is uh, being allocated for stuff that the country needs is still being just hacked away at. I mean, so that's, um, but yeah, that salt, uh, salt deduction is just, it's absurd. And, you know, I would say even some portion of that is they've already worked out workarounds in New York state and in New Jersey and California, but, but nevertheless, uh, it, 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 it's, um, it's gross. It's gross. Right. So you're a Democrat, I, I think, right? Uh, I am registered as a Democrat. Yes. You're also a register. Well, we won't bring up the other registration. Right. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. Uh, also political, though. <laughs> well, that's your you have a good attorney who right. made it political. Right. Right. So Gosar, Marjorie Taylor Greene, they, they've lost their committee assignments. Gomert, uh, Gates, these are all Republicans. They're jokes. They Bobert. are. Huh? Bobert, too. Bobert. Bobert. Yep. Well, I forgot about Bobert, who doesn't even know she lives in uh, Utah. She filled out it, right? She filled out her FEC filing and got the state wrong. Oh, I mean, it happens. U it happens, right. UTCO. You thought you were doing the Young Turks today when you came on. People make yeah. mistakes. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to hold that against you, that I was able to trick you into doing this show. The there the republic when we get angry about Bobert, Gomert, Gates, Marjorie Taylor Greene, and now Gosar, there's more of an aesthetic problem. They're not, aren't they more of a, an offense to our left of center aesthetics than they are a genuine threat to our future? In other words. Censuring Gosar, I, my two questions are, one, was it smart to censure Gosar? And was it a distraction from Build Back Better being diluted by Josh Gottheimer? Um, 
let me just start with your pronunciation of aesthetic. Um, okay. Uh, I have pronunciation. Uh, that's actually, I'm a member. I mean, of I am, I am also, I, I, I have problems with uh, pronunciations too. And that's why I don't mind when people correct me. Okay. Um, I do. So, okay. Well, I'm very sensitive about I'm, I'm sorry how about I pronounce that. Uh, words. Look, I, I think it's not just the aesthetic that is problematic with someone like Gosar. I mean, I think there is a valid concern that from that whether it's great. Kenosha or, you know, the White House, I mean, or the, uh, the, the House or, you know, rallies or whatnot, violence is being promoted um, in the context of our politics. And, you know, it works to the benefit of, of the right on some level because they're the ones who are more often than not going to show up at these places with guns. And it also it also makes it, I think, sets a context for uh, the Supreme Court to OK things like, you know, expansion of the Second Amendment, et cetera, et cetera. Um, as a political matter, I don't know. I don't know if it was helpful to censure Gosar because I don't think the Democrats have quite figured out how they play this. I know what they're trying to do. They're trying to you know, uh, repel uh, the, the Republicans who were repelled by Donald Trump. And, and I just don't know that they're doing that well, to be honest with you. Um, like, I think they, they don't do this on a sustained, uh, in a sustained way, and they're not building a broader narrative. And frankly, with the Republicans, it doesn't work to single out one of them. I mean, in some ways, it's sort of like, in censuring Gosar, and then maybe they should have or they shouldn't, and I'm really making a, a broader point. It is the functional equivalent of Donald Trump is bad and we need strong Republican Party. And when in fact it should be Donald Trump is bad and every one of the Republicans are just like him. <laughs> and right. we need to get rid of all of them. Um, but they don't seem to quite get this or they don't want to get this or whatever it is. I mean, I... I, I you know, um, I, I think that's more the problem. I think, you know, th this is a, a bank shot. If they're trying to show that, like, the Republicans wouldn't censure Gosar, it's just like a, a third order argument. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, the first argument should be this party is just horrible and Gosar right. is just like all of them. Um, right. And... I, I, you know, I, I believe that's what I believe, you know, largely that in this era, negative partisanship is what's going to drive people out to the polls. So as a political matter that does that, the, the idea that it's obscuring what Gottheimer's doing, I mean, you know, I don't know. That's been out there. I mean, the um, the. Uh, the the issue for me again is more like you know the cuts that aren't the things that aren't in the bill and what did you get for Gottheimer's support I mean it's going to be they're going to pass the the bill in the House the question is is it going to pass in the Senate and um uh, you know I, so let I, me go back well let's get to that in a second let me just follow I, I want to ask you a question it is received wisdom on this show the we have a little community here and. The consensus is the following, and I wonder what your response to this is, that if the Democrats focused on the 99% and ignored the Republicans and ran on giving the 99% what they're so desperately in need of, then they wouldn't have to stoop into the gutter and censure anybody the problem, the received wisdom in my community, our community, is the problem. And this is this is why I want to talk to you about Jimmy Dore. Eventually, the problem becomes the Democratic Party and not the Republicans, that we need to fix the Democratic Party and make it a party of labor and the working class. Th that's why the the censure of Gosar seems performative, but not of substance. What, what do you say to people? And I believe that. I believe that Bernie could have won 
had they not put the scales, uh, adapt, put their thumb on the scales for Biden. Do you think that if the Democratic Party suddenly became the, the party of labor in the 99%, that would be a winning strategy, given the current climate, from your understanding of polling? Well, I, I mean, look, I... Um, you know, there was a, a Freddie DeBoer wrote a piece in uh, the New York Times um, that I think maybe maybe overstates the case a little bit. Uh, but, you know, he, he pointed out that Bernie got less votes in the Democratic Party than Clinton and, and Biden. And I, I, I believe the Democratic Party should become those things as a matter of policy. I if when you say they become the party of labor overnight, in other words, let's say they passed the PRO Act, let's say. Let's say they repealed uh, Taft-Hartley, <laughs> for that mm -hmm. matter. And they did the $3.5 trillion version of the Build Back Better, or the $6 trillion version of the Build Back Better. Would that mean that they would win elections? I, I, don't, I don't think that's, I, I don't think you can take that for granted. I really don't. Um, I, I think as a policy matter and in terms of like what we need to do and where the Democratic Party, I mean, I look, I don't care if it's the Democratic Party that, that does it. It's just that it happens to be the most likely of the two parties that we have um, would would it, it would happen within the Democrats if it was. Um, I think they should so do that. I just, so this is what you're because. I've known on your show, it seems to me you surround yourself with leftists for the most part. Or I don't know, Ms. Viglin, I, I think she's sort of to the left of you. And you tend to be the more. I don't know. No, I don't think that's true. I, yeah. I don't know. I don't know if I don't I really don't know where where she would be right. in that regard. I mean, right. I. Um, but you tend to surround yourself with people who are more to the left. Than you are. I, I, I mean, I, 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 I try. Sure. I mean, I mean, the, the, the bit you did, you know, Michael Brooks pretended to be a leftist on your. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> That's, well, I mean, uh, look, I, I, I mean, I think that my politics are pretty far to the left. I mean, I, the, you know, I would nationalize a lot of fairly large uh, industries in this country, um, and. I, 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 I would, I, we would have single payer health insurance and um, uh, the, our utilities would be, all be government owned if I were in charge of this and um, heavy regulation. Well, I agree with you, and, I agree with you 100%. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I, but I'm not talking about, I'm just doing political analysis here and, and whether, you know, I don't see evidence, for instance, that the Democrats were necessarily rewarded politically for the, the, the child tax credit. Like there were more, like, you know, there, there were, a lot of people got a lot more money um, for the extended unemployment benefits. It all ended. But during the time that they were there, I didn't see like, you know, it wasn't like there was like a, a crazy polls. I think the problem became, I think what people are reacting to now is just sort of like, the fecklessness of the Democratic Party. It's not even so much what they're delivering per se. It's that they're just, it's fecklessness. And it's just, I, I think most people don't pay attention to politics very much. And right. by the time it hits their ears, it is some type of like subtextual, you know, sort of like um, a, almost a, almost a, a shadow of what's actually going on. Right. And well, let me um, ask you, you're 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 an analyst on MSNBC. Well, and I'm a contributor. I don't a know. Contributor. But you donate money to MSNBC? Is that I don't know. Well, I mean, I want to keep them. I worry about uh, Comcast bottom line and right. I worry Thank about, you. Um, you know, I worry about uh, I think GE has a uh, small ownership stake. And I'm not sure, even sure if they do anymore. But, you know, so these are you, important job yeah. creators. Yes. And doing what is the difference? I think we get confused by the role of a political activist and a political analyst, because when you're doing political analysis, you're constrained by the, by what is possible. 
and then you come across, not you, but you come, not you, but you come across as a political analyst, as a centrist, because you're dealing with what the polling shows, and then people accuse certain people of not being left enough. But I think a lot of those people are not left enough, in my estimation. I mean, but I'm what I'm what I'm doing is. I'm just trying to make sense of 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 what our reality is in the moment as a uh, as a way of uh, of basically saying there are certain things that we need to do on the broader left, you know, uh, to 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 get our our policies implemented. Right. And part of that is we need to take over what I think is the most obvious vehicle available to do that, to do those things. And then that also, there has to be a rear guard action, which prevents backsliding. I mean, look, the bottom line is, is that so much, you know, four years of Trump destroyed so much of our government. You know, I, I mean, like there's, it's, it's boring and it's not as interesting, but the fact of the matter is like the Supreme court, it doesn't matter. Like what well, you could talk about, like global warming initiatives that Joe Biden's not taking. If the Supreme Court decides that the EPA doesn't have the ability to assess like what. Like, you know, what creates greenhouse gases or um, doesn't have the ability to uh, assess whether, you know, this is detrimental to the environment or not, or the FDA doesn't have the ability to say, like, this is safe or not. I mean, to the extent that these, you know, these entities are already compromised, if they don't even have the ability to function well, even right, we're aft. And um, and, and so um, I, I think there is like I think there has to be a, a like a a cold eyed. What am I looking for? Like you, you, we need to we need to have like a, a, a dose of reality in when we're assessing these things. I think we should pursue these things as a matter of policy. I think they're better. Mm -hmm. They're better for people and people deserve them. But I also think from as a political matter, you know, I'm not sure how much people really, um, you know, focus on this stuff. I mean, I think this, this stuff all uh, polls well, but you know, like gun control polls, polls really well. But right. The, the problem is, is that people who are for gun control, they don't, vote based on gun control the people who want the second amendment to mean that they can carry around a pistol you know on their chest like this and whip it out like it's a, they vote based on that period single issue voters it's not even just a question of single issue i mean there's like there's a they they subscribe to a sort of like um you know there's a couple of things that create their identification and the the, the republican party is lockstep in that um and they that that issue is more important to them than 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 it is to broadly to people who say like you know because we we have polls that say 80 percent uh plus want some form of gun control but people right. don't come out and vote necessarily on that um right. and so i think there's 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 different aspects of politics that there's the the politics that are you know sort of public facing then there's the internal politics um you know there's there's the the the, the struggle for the squad, the squad to develop power within the progressive caucus and the progressive caucus to develop power within the the broader democratic caucus i mean these are all sort of microcosms uh, right. and they're different you know there there's different dynamics at play at all these things let me do this. You, you have. Uh, can you spare a couple more minutes before? Yeah. Now you can't see my kids wandering around behind here because of the yes. big Fox studio. I mean, right. What I'd like to do is we have people in our Zoom room who I know would want to ask you a question. So if you would like to ask Sam a question, raise your hand in the Zoom room. By the way, if you're listening to this show, please go to my website and there's a button to press where you can attend a live taping and sit in the Zoom room and meet these animals, uh, uh, people. And uh, they're, they're animals, Sam, the people who- You really sit. do six hours every day. Uh, no, no, twice a week. Yeah. 
Before we uh, take questions from our virtual studio audience, I want to ask you about a caller to your show. I believe it was, I don't know, I saw it yesterday. He was a former Jimmy Dore viewer who finally realized that Jimmy was selling anger but not substance. And why haven't you chosen anger? Why didn't you? Because I get angry. I, I, I have, like, I, I'm telling you what, you know, after a while, I begin to see what the truth is. I know what the answer is. I'm utterly convinced that I know what the, the solution is. And then I get angry and intolerant. That's kind of the path Jimmy went down, but it's a bad path to go down, isn't it? I, I don't have a problem with anger. I have a problem with just fucking total stupidity and disingenuous. I mean, I think he's gone from, uh, honestly, I think he is actually traversed from just complete ignorance and not uh, interested in doing any work. I mean, I have no problem with anger. I get angry at times. I don't I necessarily get as angry as, as Jimmy does. Um, but getting angry is, is fine and it's good. And I think it can be very helpful. Not knowing, you know, like what the filibuster is or not knowing, you know, some of the basic ways that our government functions. Um, and then, you know, I think he's really just taking a turn to chase clicks, you know, at this point. Right. I think that's really problematic. I don't think there's something wrong with being angry per se. Um, I just think that he, um, I think he's, he's lazy, he's ill-informed, he's disingenuous, and I think he's increasingly craven. So yeah. it's not the it's anger. Because I don't, Jimmy doesn't talk to me anymore. He, he has to have a falling out with everybody. And he, and he, for some reason has blocked me on Twitter and that's neither here nor there. Here's what I knew Jimmy before anything. I'm stunned by how good he is, given how little he reads. It's a stand-up comic. It's kind of like he took what a stand-up comic, you put a series of jokes together and you develop an act. He's, he's gathered up a series of talking points and it's an act and it's just he rifles through that rolodex of cards and bulldozes and it seems it's i i think it's a pretty good i hate to say it act it's pretty i'm stunned by how good it is oh i i mean you know he has the advantage of not having anybody on the show to question him when he has been questioned at the times they edit that out um right. and um, the guy reads through uh, a series of tweets and develops his arguments based upon headlines. And, and if you don't have anybody who's questioning him, I mean, look, you know, I, I, I had my really my only sort of involved interaction with him was in 2016. I saw a clip that he was doing uh, on his show, Aggressive Progressive. And it was talking about how he did, they didn't care about Peter Thiel becoming uh, a Supreme Court justice and that the Supreme Court wasn't in and, and misstating what the filibuster was. And I saw this clip and I don't, you know, at that time I was like, you know, hesitant to, to, you know, I wasn't looking to attack him as much as I was like, say like, this is wrong. And so I contacted him and I said, look, I got this clip. I got this beef with what you, I, why don't you come on and we can talk about this. No, go ahead. Mm -hmm. So I went, I started to introduce it and he was obviously listening to the show and he called in and we ended up having this uh, debate about it. And um, it, I, I didn't want to go that hard at him, but there was a lot of stupid stuff he was saying. We were supposed to have another one to, you know, work it out. And then all of a sudden, like he couldn't do it for, I don't know, it's been now five or six years. Right. And I think the idea, the, you know, what he does, he, he, he either a avoids any type of situation where he could be questioned. There's a lot of people of his ilk who, who will do this and the right does this. Right. I mean, and, um, and, or he will start yelling at people who are not 
terribly comfortable with conflict. Right. And I am comfortable with conflict. <laughs> and I don't, it doesn't bother me if someone's yelling in my face. <laughs> You know, uh, I suspect that in, you know, our own ways, Jimmy and I probably had, you know, some similar experiences as, 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 uh, as young people. And so I don't, you know, I, I don't, I don't care. Someone can be yelling, you know, uh, expletives in my face, right? But it doesn't make me back down or be quiet or get intimidated. That doesn't happen. And I think that is, um, you know, I think that's, that's why he's never wanted to talk to me again. Right. Um, yeah. He, because my, my experience with he him doesn't know what he's talking about. Right. He th there was nobody home. He would get in my face, and there was nobody home. Because we were I would I considered him. I don't think he considered me his best friend. But I because I have such limited exposure to people. I considered him at one point my best friend and he got really? in my really? face not, not, not know that. yeah and at one time and i love i do love to be, to be, to be fair, fair you feel the same thing with me too i imagine at this point like you feel this i feel like with a lot of people i i was but i was pretty i mean i used to go to the difference between you and jimmy is i would go to Jimmy's house, invited, you would come to my home uninvited, and I would, I would discover never, you yeah, there. Yeah, I would never have you in my house invited. I mean, that's true. That's true. You would, would be in my invited. house, and I'd come home from. Oh, Sam came by again. Right. No, you, yeah, were, you were like a fixture every time I seen. Good. It was bizarre, but we never. Uh, anyway, let's take a. We we have. Oh dear, I'm not going to. Is this? Are you going to ask? All right, this is from let me, uh, my my listeners. All right, I'm going to do this. Yes, go ahead. Hello, um, Sam. Oh. I am from Blighty. I'm from Britain. Okay. And I've been asking this is Lane, these this is Lane from Britain. This is Lane from Britain. He's um, a major part of our show. He is a brilliant man. Well, I've been asking these reprobates because I've not understood this for ooh, a year and a bit now. Um, why the hell the left aren't fighting tooth and nail on the streets for universal health care? And I know it's slightly different for us because us losing it is different because you've had it and then it's gone. But for you guys, I would think that is the... I've always... To me, from my viewpoint, because universal health care affects so many other things that the left fight for, I see it as a as a kingpin, and if you knock that pin out, the bullshit about like oh socialism's evil and all that stuff will collapse. And I think it's like it's to me it's the key thing that will sort of literally make progress. So I don't know what your thoughts are on that. I mean, I think I think there's a I think there's an argument that if we were to have a some form of single payer health health insurance, that that would be, you know things would be a lot easier after that in terms of pushing for 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 greater you know social policies because that's such a huge part of our of our economy but what why is there no mobilization of the left i mean mm -hmm. i i i mean the only thing i can i i just don't know that there is a and a tradition of it i don't know if it's the size of the country that makes i mean uh, David, you remember, you know, we had millions of people on the street at different times in the run up to the Iraq war, and there was barely any coverage of it. I mean, like barely, you know, right. I would come back to like war a, protests in, in, in history. In, yeah. I mean, they were massive. I mean, in New York and in DC, I went to, I don't know, three or four, uh, combined. And I remember coming home in like, like a, a, a 30 seconds on the TV and, right. and that's about it. And there was no sense um i i i you know i i don't know why i think to a certain extent that there is there is not a left it doesn't animate people you know mm. politics are just are are somehow we're depoliticized in this country and i think we're getting more political but like mm. i grew up in an era in the 80s and the 90s and i guess to some extent in the 70s 
mm-hmm. where there was just like massive hangover from the late 60s. Mm-hmm. And I just, you know, I was talking about this the other night on this uh, program. This is, is revolution. I remember, you know, uh, Abby Hoffman had basically, you know, uh, commodified uh, his descent, you know, traveling around with Jerry Rubin and they were doing like yippie versus yuppie debates. And it was like, mm-hmm. th- there is, there's there's something about American society that makes it very, very challenging to um, to create and maintain sustained dissent. Like, I mean, look at what we had in terms of BLM in 2020. These were mm. the biggest, uh, some of the biggest protests this country had seen. And I mean, in terms of like numbers and in terms of frequency in, in you know, f- 50, 60 years. And... Mm what did we ultimately get out of that there was a couple of cities and there was like a a, a a slight change in consciousness i i don't and it could also be generational the the baby mm. boom generation is just was just huge and they won't go away with all due respect <laughs> david and um i mean look nancy pelosi has been the leader of the democrats in the house and during that time, there has been what five or six Republican uh, leaders yeah. in the House. Now, part of that is because you know half of them had to leave because they had molested, uh, you know, uh, uh, college wrestlers, or they had, you know, they were, were so sauced they couldn't find their way out to the door. But I mean, there they was were also lot- driven crazy by the far right. I mean, well, I, I mean, uh, yeah. and Paul Ryan, although Paul Ryan was probably going to lose to Randy Bryce. Uh, that's why he stepped down. But they, they they were terrified of the Freedom Caucus and the Tea Parties. They, they, there was there were elements in the Republican Party that made their lives miserable. We don't well, have that. Well, I mean that's true to a certain extent. But you know, um, but I, I you know, I, even still, we've had six or seven different um, you know Republican leaders who've gone through. And Kevin McCarthy is like, what, 30 years younger than Nancy Pelosi? And I think there's a greater, even amongst a lot of the, the, the so-called frontline, so-called moderate uh, Democrats in the House, there's a different understanding of politics. And because I think younger people under the age, you know, younger than me, um, they, they understand that there are, that, that things are a function of political choices. There's not the same sort of, you know, respect that uh, economists are, you know, meteorologists or whatever they are. They're just they they have theories and they make political choices and then they work from there. And and we're doing that as a society. And I think there's a greater, greater consciousness, consciousness of that. Of that. Hmm. Right. Uh, Lane is great, by the way. Uh, we do a thing on Friday nights at 8 p.m. called Office Hours. <laughs> and I started and then Lane runs it for the hour after after i can do I quickly, can, yeah. can i make you uncomfortable by blowing a little bit of smoke up your ass sure go ahead i can take a compliment go ahead not Lane. you not oh. you you're more on him <laughs> uh, <laughs> when's lane's show <laughs> it's a uh, uh i've been listening to you ish since 20, uh, 2003. Wow. i found you by accident because I, I downloaded real player. You remember that? Amazing. Yes, it was a virus that uh, Air America would infect on people's computers. <laughs> yes, because <laughs> it was just there. And I thought, well, like, because the Iraq war was on, I've got a previous military-ish experience, and I'd quit as a result. And I just wanted, like, a US take. And Air America was great at the time. It was, like, getting a sort of lefty, pers- leftish perspective on... Yeah. It was about as the left as anything was on the media for the, you know, broad, like mass media at that time, like KPFK yeah. or, or WBI. It was, yeah. was, was to the left, I think, of where we were. But, but, but it, was the, it was certainly the leftist commercial media. Yeah. So I followed you ever since, and without that, I wouldn't be here with this lot. Oh, well, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Apology accepted. Oh. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Lane. The media... I mean, this is something, again, this is what makes me so angry because I'm so convinced that I'm right. 
We know, and dating back to the beginning of this country, every pamphlet, every newspaper, every source of media had a political bias. There, you know, the Federalists had their media, and it was. Why doesn't the Democratic Party and the Republican Party? Well, the Republican Party has bought radio stations, created syndicates so that you know you're listening to the Democratic Party radio station and you're li or they just did that. Actually, some guy uh, in Chicago just did that with um, WCPT. Is it in Chicago? Now, that's a low power station. And I think I know who that guy is. He I actually got booted off that station because I was too critical of of the Democrats um, at, at one point. But they just like literally, I think there was a story in Politico today that they're trying to do something like that. Um, I, I the part of the problem is and this was part of the problem, you know, the, the challenge that Air America had to some extent, too. We, you know, the Democracy Alliance was around there. That was the big money at that time. And um, they weren't terribly interested in it, in funding it at all. Um, the people who did fund it, and there were five different owners, uh, all had a different sort of like, almost like a, like a third agenda, if you will. It wasn't the politics. It wasn't the business. It was... I got to prove that I was, uh, you know, that I wasn't just a trust fund kid or right. I got to prove uh, to my brother that who is the really wealthy one that I really deserve or that it's going to help me get into politics or back right. into politics. I'm not talking about Mark Green, although I am talking about Mark Green. In that right. Instance. He's a guest on the show. So we have to. Well, yeah, there you go. Uh, tell him I say hi. And I told this story. Right. Um, and uh but also, um, uh, there were others, there, you know, uh, the guy from Real actually um, owned the company at one point. I think it was the guy from Real, Rob Glazier, who my understanding, you know, thought that he was going to end up being like a Hollywood elite. That's when the Silicon Valley people, he thought he was going to be going to Ariana Huffington parties or whatnot it was. And um, the problem is, is that that kind of money gets very nervous about populism. Right. And 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 right wing radio is really about uh, right wing and, and, and AM talk radio, broadly speaking, the left wing is about populism. And, uh, you know, it, on the left, it's a, it's a slightly it's a different populism. It's not as full on racist and uh, mm -hmm. it's a, it's about economic populism. And um, that makes uh, money, big money nervous. And so. Um, that's part of the reason why you, you don't see that because the Democrats don't want, look, there's so much money on the right. It's not just with the Republican party, right? The Koch brothers basically started a, a rival Republican party because they right. have billions of dollars. Foster freeze. I mean, uh, uh, what's the, the, the guy from Vegas who, um, Adelson, you know, his Adelson. Wife. I mean, I mean, the, the, just the, it goes on and on. Scaife and Mellon, for you know, back in the day, and I mean, there's so much money that you can fund these sort of strains on the right. It doesn't happen, you know. Well, the United the Auto Workers used to have a radio network, and yeah, Mike Malloy came from that actually. Yeah, you would think the unions, the Teamsters, especially the Teamsters, since their rank and file is on the road listening to radio. I've been influenced. I'm sure you've had Professor Catherine Liu on. She wrote Virtue Hoarders, where she goes after the professional managerial class. She's amazing. And it's, you know how. I, I'm, I, I don't remember anybody that we've had on, like even this past <laughs> week, to be totally honest. You know that I've been on your show? Did you know that I've been on your show? Yeah. That I've must been have on. been an oversight. <laughs> Uh, Catherine Liu, Professor Catherine Liu, I think she teaches at Irvine, wrote this great book. It's a polemic, very short. It's called Virtue Hoarders, and it's an attack against the professional managerial class. It's one of those books that comes along every two years that just changes the way I see things. Like Listen Liberal, the Thomas Frank book for yeah. me and for Jimmy, we're like, oh my God. And this is similar where you go, OK, it's the richest one percent, but it's also that the richest 10 percent, the professional managerial class who pretends that they're on our side. They show up, you know, 
maybe Tom Morello from Rage Against the Machine, Harvard graduate. He has these self-serving columns now in the New York Times promoting his albums. And But, you know, he lets slip that he shows up for Occupy and he shows up for the John Deere strikers. So he's, you know, but he's still Tom Morello, professional managerial class, Harvard, Rage Against the Machine. So... To me, it's that 10% that we have to go after. And the thing that I'm utterly convinced of, and then I'll let you go with one final question, but the thing that I'm just utterly convinced of is that litmus test that you mentioned earlier vis-a-vis -vis Mark Green. What is wrong with saying to people like Mark Green, who I have nothing but respect for, Nader's Raider, you know, uh, great public advocate for the city of New York, if you are worth more than X amount of money, you are suspect. You cannot be trusted. I want to see your, your, your income statements. I want to see your tax returns. If you're worth X amount of money, you are welcome to be a Democrat. You're just not going to be consulted on policy because you're not all in. You have to be all in on climate change. If you're worth, you know, but a couple think, million, think, uh, you're not all in on climate change. Aside, aside from, from really disagreeing strongly on your analysis of Mark Green, um, I the uh, having having worked with him, um, <clears throat> I can tell you it was it was quite an experience. But okay. I, I you know I am for confiscatory taxes. Um, and and think that we should basically, you know, we, we should be, we should be back at, at, at where we were in, in the, the, the 50s and the 60s. Um, and I do think that I, I, you know, the PMC is technically teachers, too, and is technically, you know, like, I mean, it is. I mean, it, as, as, as a term, as it was coined, the PMC is, is technically teachers. I mean, I think it's if you want to make it about wealth, make it about wealth and, and not so much about like sort of where. Um, but from a Marxist perspective, it makes maybe some sense as to, you know, where my son, are is, a in terms of, my son is a kindergarten teacher. He's not part he's, of the. He is part of the PMC on a technical. He's not making. He's not making. No, but that's it's a it's doesn't a, align himself with the richest 10 percent. It's a labor category as opposed to a wealth category. Okay. But 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 be that as it may. Um, I think that there is some value in those people insofar as from my perspective to get to, let's say, to genuine socialism. You need to weaken the the, the you need to to essentially draw down the wealth of, of, of certain industries and certain players in industries. And you need to figure out the, the way to do that. And I don't know that there is enough political power to do that overnight, as opposed to like, let's have um, robust antitrust and, um, you know, not allow, uh, a, you know, a, a company like Amazon or Apple or, you know, Google to amass this type of wealth and this type of power in our society and also uh you know telecommunications i mean chop them all up into tiny tiny pieces i would even get rid of like you know algorithms i would make most of the algorithms uh illegal and and i'm talking about like maybe you just don't get as efficient you watch what you like you know type of thing from netflix i, right. I, I, I to to diminish the 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 wealth and the power of people before you take the next step i i do i think the pmc is is problematic or do i think those people with the top 10 percent of wealth or top 20 percent of wealth is problematic in this country yes but how are you planning to get rid of them directly right. unless you take you know i mean that that's the thing like why i thought it was not helpful to disregard the stuff that uh, Elizabeth Warren was pushing. Was it, um, was it uh, sufficient? No, but was it necessary in my, in my sense? Like, you know, if you look at the sequencing, how do you cut down the power of these big players who are inhibiting things like, um, you know, like Medicare for all? I mean, it's a function of like, 
Well, I would break up, and I'm being serious, I would break up big Harvard, big Yale. I would take a look at the $50 billion endowment and say there are going to be 50 Harvards spread out across America. Like West Virginia would be a blue state if Harvard had a set up shop in, and Princeton had a set up shop. And I, all I, the I am down with that too. If you want a tax deduction, you just can't amass that kind of money. I, I, yeah, I agree with that. But I also would like to see like, you know, um, uh, uh, chopping up all these other companies. I would like to see stopping the concentration of, uh, of, of hospitals because it's, you know, it's the providers that are stopping, for instance, for right. Medicare for all. But, you know, how do you, how do you get there? You, you get there by, by, by f finding places and people who are going to take a step in the direction you want and then sewing that together with other people who are taking other steps that you want. I mean, that, that, you know, right. which is not to say that we shouldn't have uh, a hostility towards wealth. I'm, I'm, I am I, in total agreement there. I mean, I really do think that right. we should be taking 90 cents of every dollar after 3 million a year. And I just peg that to like 1960 or 50, I think it was like right. 470, you know, every, every dollar you would make over $470,000 in the year, I don't know, 10 or 15 years between fifties and sixties, every dollar, 90 cents of it would be taken in taxes. We should return to that type of uh, taxation and we should have the wealth tax. I just, oh, just take it. You don't, they don't right. need it. And it's, it is incredibly detrimental to our society and the world, I would say. It's have sick. People that wealthy. It, you have sick people. If you want more than a you know certain amount of money, you're mentally ill, you accrue all this power with that mental illness, and then you're dictating values. All the val when people wonder 100%. why why is everybody addicted to opiates? Why are people why is suicide on the, the rise? We are being dictated to the, the spiritual dictates come from the the people who are most well, the sickest I, I, and the most spiritually deprived. The best example for that is the billion plus dollars that bill gates decided to sink into education about 15 20 years ago it right. fundamentally altered all of our educational values they did an experiment that cost about three quarters of a billion dollars which and then there was a ton of other money they pumped in and it generated a ton of other money and other you know you know to have that type of like ballast just sort of jump into uh public education completely changed it made it about value added it made it about high stakes testing etc cetera, etc cetera. and then about three years ago never reported by anybody the rand corporation was hired to do a study of the bill gates foundation and their work and they came back and they said total mistake total mistake are bad and then they walked away from it i mean you have someone who has so much money that you know like i mean it, people should just like look at david feldman think about how arrogant he is how convinced he's right about anything if this guy had hundreds of billions of dollars how fucked up everything would be oh, because I, I, he would just say like you know what i think that's a problem and i'm gonna drop a billion dollars into it and it is all gone it's like it, it, it's completely formed by david feldman it's like like and, and for the them second, to i would hurt them. people i would I, the david feldman and melinda gates foundation because i would marry melinda french would be to hurt people the, to, to isolate people who I think are morally reprehensible, and I would plow sixty billion dollars into hurting people. It it is to have people with that kind of money, where it's like literally, I spent more time, you know, assessing, you know, how how I'm gonna uh, purchase this. Oh, you can't this thing, this little focus right thing to plug my, you know. I spend right. more time on this than Bill Gates does on the idea of like buying, I don't know, a $20 million right. house or something right. like that, you know, for, for him to, to sink, um, 750 billion, you know, million dollars into education is like, I, I don't, I don't, there it's, it, it, it's, it's Bloomberg. We have to wrap to it up. This, this is, we have to wrap. We should go. If, when you have time to come back, I, I know you don't like to get smoke blown up 
your vagina, but uh, uh, or whatever. You, uh, but uh, no time. Uh, this is great. But you know, Bloomberg, the entire Bloomberg radio network, television network, costs him f uh, five hundred million to set up, and it only has earned fifty million. In other words, he's worth so many billions. He can create the illusion of a Bloomberg television and radio and newspaper or website network that is that he's he's lost close to half a billion dollars on just for branding to look powerful. It's amazing. That's like that's like when I make like the big purchase. Like you know what I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get like a nice sweater because I deserve it. Yeah, I mean it's it, it is. Um, you just can't have people who don't live by the same laws of physics that we do and 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 to have that much money in this society that that's what happens and it's, it's just it's incredibly detrimental we have a question from and then this is the last thing and we're going to end dr david mammal he's not really a mammal he is a doctor but he's not really a mammal wants to know sam would you rather fight one david feldman sized duck or 100 duck sized David Feldman's. This is what one of the animals in our chat room wanted to know. Would you rather fight one David Feldman-sized duck or 100 duck-sized David Feldman's? Uh, the former. Because I just feel like, you know, you should be able to track your, right. your enemy. And 100, you'd be surrounded and it would be too difficult. Right. Great. Sam Cedar is the host of the Majority Report watch it every day monday through friday wherever you get podcasts subscribe to his show on youtube wherever you subscribe and you don't like to be complimented so i'll just say uh thank you for michael brooks oh well my pleasure uh david i know that you do like to be complimented and i will say just goodbye <laughs> Best to my wives. Yes, yes. Say say hello to everybody for me, and I will see them soon. Thank you, Sam Cedar. Everybody, it's always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, I, I I say this all the time that if I had a share screen time with Michael Brooks, I would not have been as generous as Sam was. I was Sam. Uh, Sam uh, I wouldn't know Michael if it weren't for Sam and everybody who shows up to our show is a big fan of Sam's as well as Michael's and we're very grateful. Let's go to the newsroom where our pretentious douchebag Dan Frankenberger is standing by. Hello, sir. That was great, right? That was fantastic. Sam's really yeah. Great. Yeah, Sam is a great. We we have we're we're keeping people waiting, right? What what what's our schedule? Um we have community billboard right now until 5:30. Oh, wait a second. I'm looking at the clock. I see five o'clock. Yeah, it's 507. We're in good shape. Oh, I had more time with Sam? No. Community oh, billboard. Okay. Yeah, we're good. We're going to run through community we billboard. Have, we have 20 minutes to kill. Yeah. Because I do. OK. All right. And then 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 uh, we have my clock is off and then it's five. Oh, we started an hour early. I that see. That's correct. Yep. Okay. So we have a uh, yeah Sergio coming up at five thirty. Oh, we're in good shape. Right. Okay. Let me just gather my. I was a little nervous having Sam on, to be honest with you. That's okay. Because yeah, I, I so I'm a little discombobulated. I you know, I wanted everybody to behave in the uh, chat room. Hey, office hours this Friday. I should get some water. Should we do this? Why don't I do this? Why don't I play uh, a song by Professor Mike Steinel, get some water, take my meds, and when we come back, we'll do community billboard, and maybe yeah, yeah. we'll talk to the chat room. Remember we did that? Do we have yes, anybody yes. watching us on YouTube? There's plenty There's of people plenty on YouTube. YouTube. We have people on YouTube. Remember we read the chat room? Yeah, we read the chat room, and we'll do it again today. Let's do that. 
I sent the pictures at 5.43 or uh, 4.43, so you can grab those while you're... Uh, okay, your we'll website. be back in three minutes. We're going to do our community billboard. And then Dan and I, I'm going to mute you, Dan. There you go. And then Dan and I will spend about 15 minutes talking to our chat room, either answering your questions or taking your calls. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. Friend me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter. We will be back, but first. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. He's talking politics and comedy too. He'll tell a dirty joke if you want him to. He's just a lefty from way back. He's a union man with an Emmy for writing. Someday he's mad and he feels like fighting. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. So get your ears on right, buckle in real tight. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way.
Thank you so much, Professor Mike Steinel. Absolute genius. I commissioned Pig for Love. Somebody once asked me, an old friend of mine who uh, I've known since uh, I was a child, she asked me, why do you do a six-hour podcast, seven-hour podcast, twice a week? It's because I'm a pig for love. And she started to laugh and said, that's the dumbest name for a song she's ever heard. <laughs> You're a pig for love. And, I, and my professor, Mike Steinel, went off and created yet another masterpiece, Pig for Love. Let's go to the newsroom. I have an idea, Dan. Why don't yes, we sir. take some calls? We'll, we'll hold off on community billboard. We'll take some calls from our community. Mila from California. Hey, I've got some great news. I thought you'd like to know. Okay. Yesterday, Professor Ben Burgess. Never heard of him. I never heard of Professor Ben Burgess. Comedian Andrea Rovensky. Oh. The hatchet after five, six long months of kind of sort of feuding. And they have agreed to uh, have an, a conversation. And we should tell our listeners, Professor Ben Burgess, who I've never heard of, he'll be on at 6.30. I'm going to be meeting Professor Ben Burgess. <laughs> no, he's going to be on the show at so, 6.30. And Andrea Ravensky, a, an activist and podcaster. They and were comedian, very and funny. Comedian, were arguing about January 6th for the entire year. They've buried the hatchet and they're going to debate. Well, they're going to have a conversation. Uh, they're in conversation right now about what that conversation will be about. But uh, I'm thinking it would be really lovely to have that conversation on the mop up. Let's do it on the show. I would be I would be honored. Thank you, Myla. Yeah, so I'm I'm really happy about it. It made my day. I, I've been that, trying that to just my you made my day. Seriously, I would love yeah. to host a conversation between Professor Ben Burgess and Andrea, that would be fantastic. Great, thank you. Great, thank you, Myla, once again, that's great. Warren G, WG, what's on your mind, sir? You're listening to The David Feldman Show. Please subscribe to this show as a podcast and like it and spread it around. We're a tiny little podcast for even tinier minds. Well, More. I'm looking for I'm looking forward to tomorrow night, David. So um, the office hours, I have the eleven o'clock slot. And oh, what are you going to be doing? Um, betraying my class. No, talking about economics. So, Great. Um, but I want my question is somewhat somewhat well, related. Before you do that, let me just hang on for one second, Dan. Why don't you plug office hours? Tell everybody about office hours so they can sign up. Well, Office Hours is every Friday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, and you can go to davidfeldmanshow.com, and in the uh, menu bar up at the top, you just click on Office Hours, and you can register, and you come show up. We hang out. There's a, a schedule of events of people um, laying out some presentations, and there's some free time to just uh, be social, and it's a good time. All right. We do it every Friday night at 8 8- p.m. Eastern. I host the first hour where I take your questions and insults, and then we go from there. And you're going to be, Warren G., you're going to be talking about economics at what time? 11 o'clock. I'm looking forward to that. And I think we're going to screen an episode of The Twilight Zone as well. I'll ask Professor John. So my question is, or is more a statement, did you hear about the grad, um, the grad students at Columbia are on strike? Yeah, their fourteen point four billion dollar endowment. Yes, they are scumbags extraordinaire. Excuse yeah, the adjunct professors are sleeping in cars, and uh, and the Columbia students. I think the Har- did the Harvard students, uh, the Harvard adjunct professors, did they yes. settle? The, the, I don't know, but right. yeah, I think in solidarity. You should. I don't know. Are you, are you with them in solidarity? I was going to have, I don't like to talk about Columbia. I, I think it's a reprehensible place and I've uh, excised it from my memory. I, I, uh, but 
Good for you. Yeah, it gave us Barry Weiss. Yes, it did. And Meghan so. McCain. And you. Well, but I don't talk about that. No, that was I'm a, sorry that was a youthful it indiscretion. It's that, 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 that's 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 wrong with me. I'm sorry. It, it, that was a, not only a youthful indiscretion, but a character flaw. Where I thought, you know, maybe women will like me if I drive a, you know, a Mercedes, you know. Uh, well, I'm looking forward to your uh, your lecture no tomorrow. Worries. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. And is Dr. David Mammel? I think you're on. Are you on the show today, Dr. Mammel? Uh, I am not. OK, I am not. you're not really. What is it? You're not really a mammal or you're not really a doctor. I'm, I'm not like a traditional doctor. And you're not a mammal either, right? I, I'm a mammal as far as I know. But OK. I, that's, that's what my mother told me. Okay. What's on your mind, sir? I, I just want to bring to everyone's attention. There's a very big election happening uh, this Sunday uh, in uh, Chile. They have their presidential elections coming up. Um, uh, and you're covering that for us. A, a, am I? I don't have a confirmation on that yet. Well, you are. That, that's <laughs> Hannah told me you're. It's not. It's the twenty second, right? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I can talk to you guys about that on the twenty second. Uh, just confirm uh, a time for me, and uh, I'll. I have uh, three great people to talk to. Uh, I thought you were confirmed. Kind of it. <laughs> but yeah, no. There's this huge election happening. There's a a, a big left coalition uh, in the country that's making a lot of waves. Uh, a lot of the leaders of this uh, left coalition kind of coming out of the student protest movement in Chile. And uh, this really has the opportunity to uh, uh, deal the death blow to neoliberalism in Chile, the place where neoliberalism kind of started. So, yeah. so Henry this is, is it's going to be a real, there's a documentary on the BBC with Henry Kissinger. He refuses to admit that he was responsible for the assassination of Allende, but he did say it was a good thing, that he was happy that Allende, I was happy they followed my orders. But uh, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure, it, it, I'm it, sure it, he was. Yeah. If yeah, you no, want to say that good about the world, Google Henry Kissinger and see what he looks like <laughs> last night. Like, this, this is, it's, last, it's, I saw a picture of him last night and God is saying, no, 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 we're going to keep you alive just like this. It's like when your cat catches a mouse and keeps the mouse alive to torture him. That's what God is doing to Henry Kissinger, just keeping him alive just to choke on his own acid reflux forever. Go ahead. What, what was your next question? I was going to say this is uh, it's just really interesting because this 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 could be the start of a new pink tide in Latin America, uh, yeah. especially with the the Brazilian elections coming out soon. There's and a lot of momentum nice. building up with a lot of the social movements and stuff. It's absolutely incredible to see. And I'm very excited for Sunday night. OK, I will happens. see. Well, wait a second. So you'll do the postmortem on Tuesday show from. Monday. Yeah, we're going to we're we'll do kind of a like an election wrap up. Right. November 22nd, it's interesting, November 22nd is when Kennedy got assassinated and September 11th was when Allende got assassinated, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, kind of that's right. Switched. That, wouldn't that be interesting? Kind of switch. <laughs> as, as, a QAnon, as a QAnon leader, I'm going to point that out. Yeah, I thought Kennedy was back. I thought he never really died. Well, that's the son. Oh, that's the son. That's uh, okay. JFK Jr. Okay. I gotcha. That's kind of interesting that on November 22nd, 2021, the end of neoliberalism and September 11th, 2000. Interesting. It, 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 it could be the end of neoliberalism. The, 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 the right wing coalition is leading slightly in the polls. Uh, so there's going to be some interesting stuff to get into there. Right. And Allende was killed on September 11th. September 11th. Yeah. To, uh, bombed, bombed by his own bomb. Uh, I forget the exact date. It was so uh, 73, Anley says, but uh, yeah, if no, bombed by it. his own Air Force. Okay. 
Thank you, Dr. David Mammel. Uh, Professor Annalee is here, I, but she will not be on the show today. I'm not bringing up my abandonment issues, Dan, but... Uh, That's an you know. interesting thing about Dr. Mammel because uh, someone just reported to me that they saw him yesterday. Yes. Oh, he was sitting around on the merry-go-round squeezing a shampoo bottle all afternoon. <laughs> Should we, uh, I think we've taken all the calls, right? Let's, you want to read some uh, questions from the chat room? We have t uh, six minutes. You're going to go to YouTube? I'm afraid to go to you. Let's see what's over at YouTube. Scared. Uh, let's go to YouTube. Oh, by the way, we have a YouTube channel. We have about 6,000 subscribers. And uh, we've been taking, if you'd like to see this show, to see, <laughs> here, here we go, hang on. It's, okay, if you would like to see uh, what we look like, uh, go to YouTube and subscribe to our channel. We do, we simulcast this show on YouTube. Please subscribe and give us, a, a thumbs up. Uh, so what are some of the questions in the chat room? I see one here from Peter Griffin. Is there a capitalist in the world who isn't a grifter, though? I don't know. I think that, you know, I think Sam Cedar and I pretty much agree that if these imaginary mythical guardrails that Elizabeth Warren talks about, if they were placed on capitalism, Maybe, maybe small business owners could thrive in capitalism. We could finally give capitalism a try, which we've never done here in the United States. This country was founded on slavery, free labor. That's not what Adam Smith was talking about. We've never had capitalism in this country. And if we enforce the antitrust laws that are already on the book, People would be much happier. Like breaking up Amazon is a good thing for everybody except Jeff Bezos. If you own stock in Amazon and the Justice Department breaks it up, that means instead of having one share of Amazon, you would have like 20 shares of 20 separate companies. That would be better. GE, for example, which has been failing for the past 20 years, they've self destructed they didn't need the they're, they're not they're no longer successful the justice department didn't have to break up general electric they're breaking themselves up because the parts are worth more than the whole that's the case in every company that's traded on the new york stock exchange for the the the, the, the s p 500 if you were to break up microsoft which they almost did if you own one share of Microsoft, if you're like Josh Gottheimer, Congressman Josh Gottheimer, who has traded close to $5 million worth of Microsoft stock over the summer, it would be in Josh Gottheimer's best interest to break up Microsoft so that his one share of Microsoft got turned into 10 different stocks. You know, the, the cloud Azure company part of Microsoft, the, the gaming part of Microsoft, they would all be separate companies and they would all do better individually. The only people who are terrified of breaking up Amazon or Apple, for example, Tim Cook, because he would lose his power. The board of directors would lose their, their salaries doing nothing. But the stockholders, would do phenomenally well if you broke up Apple. It's the terminology. It, it really should be called freeing Apple stock, freeing Amazon. You're, when you break these companies up, when the Justice Department broke up AT&T and anybody who owned one share of AT&T got what were called baby bells and they all made a fortune. Uh, the people, you know, the, the government broke up Standard Oil. The people who owned stock in Standard Oil made a fortune. Unfortunately, Standard Oil and AT&T, they were broken up by the Justice Department, and now they're back together again, and it's not good. It, it, it's kind of like when, 
I, w I was going to make fun of REO Speedwagon getting back together again, but you know, it's never as good as it was. Take uh, it on the first run? Time. Huh? Does that take it on the run? Yes. What's we, we have to, we have one minute left. W let's attend to our viewers on YouTube and thank you for watching us on YouTube. What is the next question? Um, from Chris Olson, he asks, good morning from Osaka, Mr. Feldman. Ever been here? Japan. Have you ever been to Japan? I've never been to Japan, no. I'm from Invisible Ninja. We have boxers. Oh, is that the question? If, whether or not I've been to Japan? Yeah. I've, I've never been to Japan. My father uh, was there, but it was not a pleasant experience for him. Invisible asked boxers or thongs. Huh? Boxers, boxers or thongs. I go commando. Whoa. Yeah, I'm commando today. If you want to send anything to the community billboard, send it to dentfeldman at gmail.com. We're a few shows behind, but I'm collecting them, so we'll get it yeah. in. And um, our next guest, uh, Sergio Acabia, is here. Great. And and what is your schedule like, Dan, for uh, reviewing the rest of our community? I'm open. I'm good. I'm busy, I'm busy at work, but I, I'm pretty free. If you have a specific time, I can make it happen. I'm, I'm kind of flying by the seat of my pants. And it's painful because I'm going commando today. Whoa. I would like to discuss our community with you later. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you, Dan Frankenberger in the newsroom, you pretentious looking D bag. When we come back, we're going to go to Hawaii. We'll be right back. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. He's talking politics and comedy too He'll tell a dirty joke if you want him to He's just a lefty from way back He's a union man with an Emmy for writing Someday he's mad and he feels like fighting It's time right now for the David Feldman Show To so get your ears on right, buckle in real tight He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way right now of the David Feldman show so get your ears on right and buckle in real tight he's got a lot to say and he's coming your way he's got a lot to say and he's coming your way he's got a lot to say and he's coming Loading up some snark here. You're, you're listening to The David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. Friend me on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and subscribe to my newsletter, and subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. Just loading up some snark here. And office hours every Friday night at 8 p.m., the first hour, I make myself available to all the listeners. If you have any suggestions on how to improve the show, I, as Prince Charles once said, I'm all ears. I will listen to you if you have any complaints. The first hour of office hours from eight till nine, I take your suggestions. And then after that, we just turn it over to our amazing community. And if you'd like to be a part of our community, go to my website and sign up hit the attend office hours, or if you'd like to sit in our virtual studio audience when we tape the show, 
hit the attend a live taping and we'll send you a link. And as long as you're left of center and you know how to behave, we won't throw you out of our Zoom room. Well, we're gonna go to Hawaii right now where I'm gonna get this right. I, I, Sergio, let me bring you in, Sergio. I am notorious for not pronouncing names properly. Welcome, Sergio. Hello, David. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much. Sergio is a candidate for U.S. House of Representatives, Hawaii 1. It's the first congressional district of Hawaii. He is endorsed by Howie Klein. So that's all you need to know. We're going to raise money right now for Sergio, and we're also going to I'm going to mispronounce his last name in a second, I promise you. But Sergio is endorsed by Howie Klein. He is our political moral compass of Howie Klein from Down With Tyranny, says Sergio has to go to Washington, then we get behind. Sergio, let's, should I try it? Yes, David, go ahead. Okay. Akubia. Almost there, Alcubilla. So for some reason, our family pronounces that one L, whereas a lot of people, you know, they don't, the, the two L's become a Y, but. Let me just, I, I, I want to, it's disrespectful not to get somebody's, pre and, and how he went over the pronunciation with me. I have a thing about mispronouncing. So, so it, it, how do we pronounce it again? Alcubilla. Alcu. Bill. Yeah. Alcubilia. Yes. Thank you. I'm the well, can candidate with the funny name. <laughs> it's not a funny name. You're, you, that, that's, uh, it's not a funny name. It's, it's a very it's sad true. name. It's not. Oh, that's a, yeah. So you're running for Congress and we'll give out your website and we're going to raise money for you right now. Thank yeah. Thank you for doing this. And let me ask you a couple of questions. What is your current job? So I've been a legal aid attorney for the last 10 years. Um, currently, uh, because I'm campaigning. You're, you're a lawyer. I am. Um, okay. I've been with the Legal Aid Society of Hawaii uh, for the last 10 years. I was the director of external relations there and then uh, served as a staff attorney for a short time. Uh, but because I'm running for Congress, uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing that full time at the moment. Right. I, ha I asked some tough questions, so uh, yes, this, I only have candidates on the show because once they get elected, they don't want to come back because oh, I, too, okay. So I'm gonna it sounds some, like such a fun show from just what I've seen so far. That's, right. You know, right. These are what I consider tough questions that, that, and I'm flattering myself by saying that. Do you support Medicare for all? I do. So that's something that's very much needed in our community. Um, you know, it's it's just, it's common sense. It doesn't make sense for us to be one of the wealthiest countries in uh, in the world, and for us not to be able to provide uh, universal health care or Medicare for all for our community. You had mentioned Japan earlier. Uh, my wife is originally from Japan, and she you know she mentions that um, you know in Japan she could she doesn't have to worry about health care. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, she, I asked her, why don't you become a U.S. citizen? And she said, no, I'm worried that if I ever get sick, I can always at least go back to Japan. So right. I mean, that's telling of where our state of affairs is regarding health care. Right. In order to have Medicare for all, it can't be incremental. Uh, so one of your uh, fellow Hawaiians, President Obama, kind of sold Obamacare to the left as the first step towards single payer, it was anything but, right? You, he's made it, Obamacare makes it almost impossible to get Medicare for all because it was a love letter to the insurance companies. In order, would you agree that in order to get Medicare for all, we have to demonize the health insurance companies and put them out of business? That the only way to have Medicare for all is to put Aetna Humana into the dust heap of history. Yeah, they've got to figure out their business model. I mean, that, uh, you know, I, they play too much uh, of a role in doctors determining the level of care that uh, they provide. Um, 
And for me, I come from a family of nurses. So, you know, there's something wrong with that when the doctor has to decide what type of insurance you're on to provide the type of treatment um, that they're going to provide. But for them, you know, it's time for them to adapt. Uh, they'll figure it out. Um, you know, when I look at it and, and I understand what President Obama was trying to do and I understand the, the uh, insurance companies, they went hard on lobbying. Um, but I feel like it's, it's, it's like a Band-Aid and you've got to just rip it off. It's going to hurt in the beginning, but in the end, it's a long, in the long run, you're going to be better for it. And, you know, these insurance companies will figure it out. All right. We're, we're talking to Sergio Alcobilla. Go to SergioForHawaii.com and give him money. That's Sergio, the number four, Hawaii.com. Go give him money. We'll talk about what he's up against. Let me circle back and ask you about Medicare for All again. I'm a, I'm a United States congressman, okay? And we're debating Medicare for All in the floor of the House. And I say, no, we have to get rid of, we have to put these companies out of business because the reason we can't get Medicare for all is Aetna, Humana, they have too much money, too much power. Unless we declare war on the health insurance companies and say, you're going out of business. There's going to be a five year transition for your rank and file, your office workers. We're going to pay for their transition to a job that's befitting a human being. If you work for these insurance companies, it's you're a murderer. That's what your job is. You murder people. If you work for an insurance company, my bill, my Medicare for all bill is to put these insurance companies out of business, which is kind of like what Pramila Jayapal and Bernie introduced. They kind of say in their Medicare for all version, the insurance companies have to be zeroed out. What would you say to that? Yeah, if that's if that's what it's going to take for us to get Medicare for all, these insurance companies, they've got to adapt. And if you don't adapt to the way things are changing. You're saying adapt. I'm saying we have to destroy them. Yeah, it's. And I agree with you. Uh, yes, I mean, we have to, if we have to put them out of business for us to be able to get Medicare for all, then I'm for it. Um, but at the same time, they've got, if if they can't figure out a way to stay in business, um, you know, by, by supporting Medicare for all, then that's on them. But uh, yes, I do agree with you. We've got to, if that's the only way that we can get Medicare for all and they're, and they're the ones that's been obstructing it for the longest time because of their political influence, then yes, I agree with you. We've got to take them down. Okay, let me think about your answer, because I do know that Medicare coexists with the insurance companies, but not in a good way. Maybe let me let me let me think about it. I'm not quite sure I agree with you, but uh, you would support Pramila Jayapal's Medicare for all bill. I would. I would. Um, you know, just this time, the incremental steps, we tried that in 2012. We tried that with President Obama, and we can see the power and the influence behind these insurance companies. Um, okay. We've got to take we've got to take bold moves. OK, I'm going to ask you now. This is like this is my second tough question that I ask all candidates. You ready? Go ahead. Go ahead, David. Did the Taliban, did the people of Afghanistan and the Taliban attack us on 9-11? No, uh, and that's, and I think that's something that's been lost within the last 20 years. You know, I was a college student my senior year when 9-11 happened. Um, and that was a, a turning point in, in terms of what I wanted to do and um, kind of my worldview. But no, that wasn't, um, and I think it's interesting that there's people now that were that read read about 9/11 only in the history books, and they weren't they don't experience they didn't experience it. They don't remember what we felt during that. But no, if you know if I remember my memories correctly, uh, it was Al Qaeda, Saudi Arabian nationals, Osama bin Laden, and those were those were original our original targets. Um, how we ended up in Afghanistan and against the Taliban and uh, amount of lives lost and the money spent uh, still behooves me. Thank you for that answer. Go to SergioForHawaii.com. 
Let me spell it out for you. S-E-R-G-I-O, the number four, Hawaii.com, and give money to Sergio Alcubilla. He is going to be the next congressman from Hawaii representing the first congressional district in Hawaii. He's endorsed by Howie Klein from Down With Tyranny and the Blue America PAC. That's all you need to know. And he just gave one of the best answers to that question. Thank you for that. I, I can't tell you the number of candidates who I support on this show and raise money for who aren't willing to say that the people of Afghanistan and the Taliban had nothing to do with 9-11. So uh, the, the, the following question, the conversation I want to ask you is, how do we have a, a, a conversation with the American people, especially the soldiers, and say to them, how do we make it settled law in America that Saddam Hussein didn't attack us on 9-11. Mullah Umar and, and the Taliban did not attack us on 9-11. How do we tell not just the people of America, but the soldiers who served, the families of the soldiers who made the ultimate sacrifice? How do we say to them, the truth is this entire war was a lie, which it was. The war in Afghanistan and the war in Iraq was a lie. How do we convince people that that is the most patriotic thing any American could say? Well, that's a tough that's question. A tough question. Yeah. You no, know, my uh, my father was in the in the military in the Philippines. Uh, my grandfather was a World War II veteran, also in the military. Uh, you know, so I know just that heart of service, that heart of patriotism uh, that our military members have. And so what, 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 and I say in return, my patriotism, my, I honor the troops, my love of country stems from my telling the American people that the soldiers who gave up their lives in Afghanistan and Iraq did so based on a lie. They were lied to. And until we can say that, we will never, ever have Medicare for all. We will never be able to solve all the problems facing this country because we are a war economy and our economy is based on a lie. And there will be more lies, more wars, more homeless veterans, more widows, more children without parents because we never ever made it settled law that this 20 year war was a lie, which it was. And yet I'm the bad guy for saying that. I'm rude. I lack civility for saying that. Yeah, let, me, let me just say this, David. I mean, I, if I could look. Am I wrong? Am I wrong? I know you can't say that, but am I wrong? No, I, I would say their service is not a lie. Their patriotism is not a lie. You know, they were betrayed. They were betrayed, betrayed by the elected leaders that they trust, you know, that, that are putting them in harm's way, that are putting them in these wars. You know, they are counting on them to make sure they do their, their due diligence to make sure that, you know, they have the best interest of these soldiers when they put them in harm's way. You know, that's who I put fault at. That's who I who I am upset about and I blame because I think of the kid that's growing up without a father, you know, I'm, I'm without a parent because of uh, what our elected leaders uh, decided to do. It's a it's a responsibility. It's a big responsibility right. to, to put someone in harm's way and say, hey, go risk your life for our country. And it's on our elected leaders. And it, for them to make it right, we've got to treat our veterans right. You know, we've got to treat them better. Uh, we've got to make sure they have the resources that they need because they're coming back from these wars. They're coming back messed up. I mean, imagine seeing your friend getting blown away. Imagine, you know, seeing uh, friends getting uh, getting killed left and right. Um, those are the things that I worry about is the emotional toll, the human toll on war. Um, and that's on our elected leaders to be better leaders because those are our soldiers. At the end of the day, those are who our soldiers um, are under their command. Right. This, by the way, this is why when you get elected, you won't come back on my show. I wouldn't expect oh, you to. I, 
Hey, I pro let me say this. If I if I when I get elected, I will be back on your show. Oh, we'll see. Hold, hold me accountable to that. <laughs> hold me accountable. They don't they don't come back. Uh hold yeah, me. I mean I, it, it to me the most patriotic thing and then I'll move on the most patriotic thing you can tell the American people is it was a 20 year lie. We wasted the lives of close to 10,000 Amer beautiful American men and women based on a lie. And we spent more than seven trillion. We wasted seven trillion dollars and transferred seven trillion dollars of taxpayer money. We transferred that to the richest one percent. That is what created the income inequality in this country, is that $7 trillion transfer of wealth from the Treasury Department to the military industrial complex. And that includes Jeff Bezos with his military contracts and Bill Gates with Microsoft's military contracts. Uh, when, anyway, it informs the it, it starts with the military industrial complex and just flows into every aspect of our uh, our lives. It's a war economy. The dreamers. We're torturing dreamers, right? What do we do about the dreamers? There's, there's got to be a path to, to citizenship for them. I'm, I, I came here as an immigrant to this country at seven years old after my father was killed by a, a communist hit squad in the Philippines. Um, I know, you know what the promise of this country represents. Uh, I know what the hope of this country represents and we've got to find a better way uh, to make sure that we provide a path to citizenship for them. It doesn't make any sense for someone to, to live here, grow up here their whole life. And this is the only country that they know for us to send them back to a country that they have no connection with. Um, right, so how do we do that? I would support the DREAM Act. Uh, you know, I know that's something that's that's hit a snag in Congress, but I would support, support that. that and I would, fight, I would fight for that. Right. Do you take any corporate money? Nope. And that's nope. why and this that's campaign why is going to be different. Uh, you know, I, this is going to be a people powered, people centered campaign. I'm not uh, I've made a pledge not to take corporate money um, and I'm going to rely on everyone on this show, uh, you know, to help and, and support. Are there any super PACs that we don't know about that are supporting you? Super PACs? No, I don't. I don't know of, uh, of any. The only way, um, I don't know if they're a super PAC, but um, we've reached out to Justice Democrats, uh, you know, to few a few of the other more progressive um, organizations. And the Blue America PAC, and yeah. yeah, getting money out of politics. How how important is it to get money out of politics? I mean, for me, it's important. I mean, as a someone that's coming from outside the political establishment. And just seeing the barriers for someone like me that's you know been a nonprofit leader uh legal aid attorney to to now run for office you can just see the big money behind politics uh you know that our current incumbent uh he gets most most of his support from uh, you know corporations and the and PAC money and their PAC money but just the influence uh, and i'm going to bring it back to hawaii a little bit it's just he's been one of the obstructionists when it comes to the build back better agenda and it just it just drives me crazy to wonder why i mean that that type of agenda would help so many people here in hawaii and it just drives me crazy to think why he would be against it um and and it goes back to money and politics right right so my friend jeff blackwood he's a uh, far left political consultant and that's not his real name he's he runs candidates uh on the far left and he comes on this show under a nom de guerre which is this made up name, Jeff Blackwood. And he turned me on to capitaltrades.com, which I suggest everybody go to. It keeps track of our Congress people, our senators who are trading stocks while they're doing the people's business. Josh Gottheimer trading something like $7 million worth of Microsoft, trading construction stocks in the lead up to the infrastructure bill. This is a Democrat, Ro Khanna, who ran Bernie's campaign. We like Ro Khanna. He represents Silicon Valley. He's a Democrat. I would vote for Ro Khanna. In the past year, he purchased $25 million worth of stock. 
$25 million worth of stocks that Ro Khanna and his wife are trading. Is that, should that be legal? No, I believe that's, that's a conflict of interest. Um, you know, we don't send people to Washington to trade stocks. We don't send people to Washington to, to get richer. Uh, and for me, that's an issue. I mean, that's a, that's a conflict of interest and you, know, you should have the decency to at least tease yourself from making decisions on these bills where you own stock in these companies. If I were elected to Congress, uh, I would start every day as a Democrat, every day, by telling the American people on the floor of the House that in the past year, Nancy Pelosi personally, the Speaker of the House, personally traded $19 million worth of stock in the past year. The Democratic Speaker of the House is worth close to $200 million. Her husband, Paul, is off the charts trading in NVIDIA. Why isn't that why is Paul Gosar being censured for that anime video where he's killing AOC and that he should be censured for that? But why isn't Nancy Pelosi being censured for trading close to $20 million worth of stock last year? She was supposed to be doing the people's business. And I think, sadly, just the American people don't know what's going on in Congress. I mean, they, they send people to Congress and maybe they never hear back from them again. Um, right. And, and I, but and what do you think is worse they, they, in terms of what do you think the American people care more about? This this disgusting human being, Paul Gosar, who participated in the January 6 insurrection, his whole family hates him. He put up a video, an anime video, that was violent towards AOC. He should be censured. He's a disgrace. But politically speaking, what do you think most Americans care more about? That or the fact that Nancy Pelosi has spent the past year trading $20 million worth of stocks, while her husband has been trading far more? What do you think the Democratic voter should care more about? I would say that with Nancy Pelosi. I mean, that's a big that's that's big money. Um, and I, I think, you know, for people, they, they they care about fairness. If it sounds fishy, if it doesn't look right. I mean, there's something to be said about that. But that's not what gets in the news. Right. I mean, I know when the pandemic first started, we were hearing of senators that were buying stock or selling stock that were going to because they had news that the pandemic was going to hit. Um, and that's an issue. Uh, you know, it's right. not fair for the American people to be put in that type of position while, you know, politicians or right. elected leaders are getting rich. What is the biggest concern facing the people of Hawaii? Are there people who are, uh, are there indigenous first peoples from Hawaii who want to stay part of the United States? Has it worked out for the first peoples? of Hawaii. Hawaii became a state, what, in 1959, 1960? Yes. Yes. So first, yeah, let me, you know, take the time to take the time to honor and respect our native Hawaiian community. Uh, you know, they were, uh, so I know a lot of people will say, you know, just because you're from Hawaii, you know, they may call you Hawaiian, but that's something that's specifically reserved, uh, you know, to uh, our native Hawaiian uh, population. Um, but it's hard. It's hard for them to to continue to live here. Uh, you know, I've heard from a friend that uh, there's more Native Hawaiians that live on the continent there than there are that live here in Hawaii, uh, mm -hmm. and that's an issue. Uh, you know, they're losing their lands. They're losing that connection to uh, to their culture, um, and that's an issue. From the military complex, uh, you know, that's, that's that's a big part of the economy here in Hawaii to just affordable uh, affordability in living here, finding decent housing, uh, you know, solving some of those issues. So, you know, my heart goes out to to the, our native Hawaiian community because it's at the end of the day, this is their land. Right. Right. Well, uh, we have limited time. I guess I wanted to ask you about Kyle Rittenhouse and guns. We're uh, waiting to hear the verdict. The AR-15s, he, he was walking around with an AR-15, a 
troubled home. I think this guy was homeless. Uh, he feared that his gun was going to be taken away from him, so he shot the guy four times. There's the uh, other trial that's going on where the white man stopped the jogger, and the jogger, he claims, tried to wrestle the gun away from him, and so he had to shoot him. Trayvon Martin, George Zimmerman claims that uh, he was following Trayvon Martin. Then Trayvon Martin got his hands on the gun that Zimmerman was using, and Zimmerman feared for his life. So he shot Trayvon Martin. Seems to me all these cases involve uh, a white guy with a gun looking for trouble. Uh, in Rittenhouse's case, it wasn't, he wasn't stalking a black man. But these are three white men with guns looking for trouble and then end up killing because the gun has been wrestled away from them and they fear for their own safety because they feel that the gun is going to be used on them. Do guns keep people safe? Is this AR-15? Do these, does owning a gun in the end keep you safe? It doesn't. Um, you know, and it, it, it depends on, of course, who, you know, who holds the gun. Are they fit to hold the gun? For me, it goes back to this issue of implicit bias. You know, there's something with our criminal justice system that needs to be to, to change. You know, as as uh, I'm going to say, uh, as a brown person growing up in the South, uh, I know what it means to be pulled over for the most random stops, for the most. What do you mean in the South? I thought you grew up in Hawaii. I uh, I actually grew up in Florida, so in the middle of a small oh, town, Florida. I'm so, I'm so, my, yeah. my my condolences. <laughs> Yeah, so I understand the craziness, craziness of it all. Um, but, you know, there's something to be said when uh, we're seeing these type of stuff in the news, when people are going to get off, when there's a sense that that person, you know, was wrong and just that sense of unfairness. I mean, that's something that hits home to me. I know I have family and friends and uh, people that I know that, uh, you know, suffer from this. Uh, were you ever pulled over by a police officer? Yeah, I've been pulled over a lot. Um, you know, and sometimes they'll give me an excuse why I was pulled over. Uh, I've had a uh, police officer come up to the car with a gun already drawn. I've had, uh, you know, police dogs come and search the car and police officers say that they found drugs when, of course, I you know there's nothing in the car. Uh, so for me, the, these these issues hit home. But bringing it back to Hawaii, I mean, we're not immune to it. You know, uh, some people here in Hawaii think that because we're so uh, far away from the continent that we're immune to these. But mm -hmm. we're not. That implicit bias is something that we've got to work on. Um, and it just goes back to how we treat people. Yeah, but the guns. Oh, yes. Sorry. It's yes. the guns. I, wouldn't it be easier to get rid of guns than it would be to get people to tolerate one another? Yeah. You know, we, we, they've never really solved racism here in the United States. It's kind, of one, into our, it's kind of baked into the DNA of this country. Wouldn't it be a better idea to make sure nobody can act on this racism by taking away the guns? Yeah. Well, for one, we don't need AR-15s on the street. Uh, we don't need machine guns on the street. Uh, I, I mean, right now it is protected by the Second Amendment. So unless we, we repeal that, um, that's still in our Constitution. But the type of guns that are on the street, we don't need these type of guns on the street. Um, and that's where I would start is banning these type of assault rifles and banning these type of, of machine guns. I mean, speech is also protected by the First Amendment, but we rein in speech. We rein in speech more readily than we rein in gun ownership. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, it give, and that's, it gives us a reason to be able to do it. And that's what's yeah. great about uh, our Constitution is, we, you know, we do have that, that mechanism um, to rein yeah. it in and we can control yeah. it. Yeah, just reading about the Rittenhouse, it, the you know uh, the only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. And if you look at the events leading up to Rittenhouse shooting dead two guys and injuring somebody else, you nobody knew who the good guy was with the gun. Even if you were to say Rittenhouse was a good guy with a gun, he was. In the, in the chaos, in the fog of war, the police drove right past 
him with his hands up. They didn't know he was the active shooter. People went after Rittenhouse because he was the active shooter. Then there was another, the third guy who testified, the medic with the, the gun, pulled a gun on Rittenhouse. So it was a face-off and nobody knew who the good guy was taking out the bad guy with the gun. It depends what your politics are. When, when Grosshaus, the, the witness, pointed a gun at Rittenhouse, half this country believes Rittenhouse was the good guy with the gun. The other half thinks Gruten, I can't pronounce his last name, was, I mean, the, the insanity of thinking that guns will dial down a, a violent situation, it's just insanity. It's just insanity. Well, I hope you come back and I hope you win and that uh, you need to go to Congress. Sergio for Hawaii dot com. Sergio, S-E-R-G-I-O, the number four, Hawaii dot com. Send him money right now. If you're an American citizen or if you have a green card, I believe you can donate money to Sergio. Sergio, <laughs> I look down to pronounce your last name. And while I'm doing that, I mispronounce Sergio. Sergio Al Kabilia is running for Hawaii's first congressional district, and he's endorsed by Howie Klein and me. If you're a fan of this show and a fan of Howie Klein, you will give money by going to SergioForHawaii.com. Thank you so much. Please come back, and I, I hope you win. When, when are the primaries? The primaries are primary. 13. 13. Oh, I'm oh. sorry, you broke up. What? Uh, the primary is on August 13, 2022. It's not that far away. Oh, nine, months. nine months. Nine months. Nine months. Right. How's the weather tonight in Hawaii? Today's great. Uh, you know, it's. I, I know people on the East Coast are starting to get snow, but for us, it's it's a nice, bright, sunny day. Thank you. Well, you made this a sunny day. Thank you so much, Sergio. Please come back. I will and, be back in. Uh, yeah, if I win, uh, that's the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to email you back and say, hey, when, when I, can I be back on your show, David? Well, I can't wait to make your life miserable as a United States congressperson. I really mean that. I, I hope you come back and I can uh, ask you some tough questions. You're great. Thank you so much. Uh, let me plug your website again. Sergio for Hawaii. Give him money right now. Go to Sergio for Hawaii. Dot com. Give him money. Give him one dollar. Give him five dollars. I think you can only give. What's the most you can give? Twenty nine hundred is the max. Twenty nine hundred is the max. OK, so give him twenty nine hundred dollars. I don't ask for much. Give him money. You need he needs money. Are you a millionaire? No, it wouldn't happen uh, as a legal aid attorney. You're a legal aid attorney. There's you don't you're not self-funding this campaign off that legal aid attorney money i can't <laughs> there's not really? that much you're, not, <laughs> you're, you're not like on a merit trade all day swapping microsoft futures oh my gosh nope <laughs> really <laughs> yeah huh. we're not doing the work okay there thank you, you thank you sergio for hawaii.com well Moving on, it is now 6.08. Sorry to keep everybody waiting. This is a great show. I think Alex, I'm going to put Alex up on the board here. Hello, Alex. I, I Sorry to keep you waiting. And I believe Ricky is back. Look at Ricky. <laughs> it's been a while. It's been a while, David. It's been a while. You look great. Ricky <laughs> Hutchinson it runs Weekly Marks. He teaches capital one and two and he does it on twitter with professor adnan hussein and he also has a study group i believe it's done through office hours right yeah pretty much we uh we meet on sundays and uh also we've got a a, a midweek marks group uh with uh, sarah bush and professor pamela and um kelly running it so uh Right. We're growing. Yes. And uh, my daughter goes to it sometimes. I'm trying to get my son. Uh, 
he's read one and two. Anyway, you're a very valuable member of the community, and it's good to see you again. I know you were doing some stuff, and we couldn't have you on the show for a while. You come to us from London. Who is your guest? Uh, today, I'm really uh, quite excited. We've got um, someone who I think has written one of the one of the books everyone in our community should have read or have a copy of. So I've got uh, Professor Alex Vitale from um, uh, Brooklyn College. Uh, he's written some just some amazing work on uh, on the police system in the Western world, in the capitalist world, and um, you know, I've sort of been following Alex's work over the last year, and it's just amazing. It's one of these um, documents which actually not only spells out what kind of a system we have and why we have it, but also highlights the key points of the policing system and how to actually deal with it. So it's a, it's a how-to book, which is absolutely fantastic, and it's all based on research, which is... Um, so important. So, Alex, uh, welcome to the show. Um, Thanks, Rodriguez. Uh, nice introduction. I should just let you keep talking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Don't let me. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to be yeah. here. Well, we're, we're really um, over the moon to have you here, but unfortunately, our time is short. So, it's for us, I no, mean, no, I, 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 just so you know, just I, I we're going to do the full half hour. We're just going to be ten minutes behind. Okay, as long as so, the professor wants to stay. That's great. Me. Yeah, sorry to keep you waiting. Sometimes I can't keep my oh, mouth. No. So, <laughs> well, I mean, I think that's um, David's way of saying, Alex, that uh, one. You got the full half an hour, but we'd love to have you here every month because I think your work is uh, something that's um, that's vital for us to share with uh, with the world. And um, I'll give you a bit of a, a background into our little community that uh, David's built. Um, we're, we're actually a very um, we we have quite a solid uh, Marxist group, which I'm part of, I guess. But actually, the majority of the people who will be listening to you on the podcast or on YouTube will probably be what you would classify as a as a classic liberal uh, well-meaning sort of uh, group so I think your work is really targeted to that person to actually explain who and what our um, our carceral system is whether whether you're in Britain or in the US and also our policing system and I think you know what I I read uh, the new edition which you're releasing shortly with uh, Verso Books, I believe. And it was just fantastic. It was great to reread the book. But what it, what it did is it, it made me ask, well, inside half an hour, what would I like our audience to actually understand about what you've written? And what I realized was there's no point us trying to tell them everything that you've written in these 300 odd pages. It's actually just important to really give them a taste of why they need to have it and to get them excited about um, getting the, getting that book into their e-library or, or a hard copy. So I, th I thought rather than try and ask you everything that I want to ask you, I wanted you to sort of give that sort of summation of the work that you've done and why you started doing it and actually what um, your average good American liberal can learn from the work that you've done. So I'm going to let you start and where you finish is up to you. Great. Okay. I'll, I'll leave time for a little bit of a follow-up then. So again, thanks. Thanks for having me. And, you know, I, I also work in the UK. I, I have a visiting professorship at London South Bank University and, and uh, have been uh, involved in a lot of stuff in the UK as well, though the book is primarily U.S. focused. I think it, it has a lot of analogies that are applicable around the world. And the book's now been uh, published in Spanish, Portuguese, Mandarin, Korean. Uh, so it's obviously struck a nerve around the world. Uh, okay. So the, you know, after the police killing of Mike Brown and Eric Garner and Tamir Rice back about seven years ago, we were told that policing was going to get fixed. They were going to reform policing. 
Obama created this task force on 21st century policing filled with all these professional re police reformers and police leaders. And they said, well, if we just give the police more money for training, more money for body cameras, we will become a more professional, less biased, more procedurally proper institution, and that'll fix the problem. Well, the officers involved in the killing of George Floyd had implicit bias training, de-escalation training, mindfulness training, were wearing body cameras, were operating under a new, more restrictive use of force policy, were operating on a bystander policy that said that officers had to in intervene if they saw misconduct by a fellow officer, a new early warning system for, I mean, they had all the training all the technology, all the new oversight procedures, all the new policies, and it just made no difference. And this is because th those reforms just radically misunderstand the nature of the problem. They imagine that if we just make police more professional, that they will enforce the law in a proper manner and everyone will be so happy about letting the police do what the police do. But the deeper problem is, is that the police are enforcing a legal order that doesn't actually benefit everyone equally. And the most obvious example of this is the war on drugs. We've been waging this war on drugs for 40, 50 years. No lives have been saved. No one has been prevented from getting drugs. No advancements in public health have been made. And that's because the war on drugs had nothing to do with public health or public safety. It was all a rancid politics of race designed to appeal to historically white voters in the, Republic, in the Democratic Party and get them to switch over to the Republicans. This was Nixon's you know, Southern strategy. And his own advisors were like, well, we're for legalization, we're for harm reduction and have since come forward and said they were in the meetings in the White House where Nixon said, this is all about how do we go after black people without appearing to go after black people so that people will abandon the Democrats who signed you know, civil rights legislation. So the solution to, to these horrible racial disparities in the war on drugs is not to give narcotics units implicit bias training. This is ridiculous. We need to end the war on drugs. Simple as that. Voters in Oregon last November took a big step in that direction. They voted to decriminalize low level amounts of all drugs, heroin, cocaine, everything, and turn it over to public health authorities. They're following the lead of Portugal and some other places that have decided police don't have a productive role to play in managing this problem. And it turns out the same thing is true for sex work, we don't need police in our schools. We should not be sending police on mental health calls. We should not be using the police to manage what are social and economic problems created by a political class that is trying to paper over, paper over their economic failures by the mobilization of policing and mass incarceration. And for each of these problems, we have concrete interventions that we could rely on instead of policing. We could bring back counselors and high quality extracurricular programs to schools. We can create community-based anti-violence initiatives. We can create non-police mental health crisis response teams. We can rebuild some kind of community-based mental health structure, et cetera. So the punchline of the book is we don't need nicer, more professional police. We need alternatives to policing. Yeah, I, I, I found that something quite amazing in your um, border force, border policing part. I, I was shocked. $23 billion spent on border police. You, you have more border police than any other type of federal police in the country, in your country. I mean, I live in another country, of course, but... I'm just shocked. I'm thinking, you know, $23 billion, you could do a lot to helping people get across the border, be, you know, taken into well-paying jobs and, and be self-sufficient. You know, the, your immigrants. We could, also, more we could also help rebuild their home countries so that they don't feel the need yeah. to come here because most people want to stay where they are. They're fleeing 
really desperate circumstances that our own government generally has helped create. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's so many, so many facets to to the way that that industrial process of policing is formed and, and structured. Um, and then the other the other side of it too is that there's a, a liberal conception that the police are here to defend um, the well-being of um, of the citizenry. When actually your work, which the, the great thing about it is, many people question you know what Tucker Carlson says or what what some other talking head says which is a you know it's a talking point that's given by a certain bias group. group but actually but actually but your your key um, messaging is all based on very solid research it's got that historical materialist background which is the core thing um, and I I would love you just to explain the the, the I think it's an American audience, so the American existence, whether it's from Charlotte or yeah, uh, Charleston, New Orleans yeah. or oh, Charleston, sorry. Yeah, I, I should just add that I I read volume two with David Harvey and nice. volume three with Stanley Aronowitz. So I had some good uh, good instructors on on uh, the on the. You, you, you might be getting them invited to come and do a, a guest lecture at uh, Weekly Mark, so Alex, <laughs> careful. <laughs> okay, so the history of policing. So we, we should first keep in mind that policing is a fairly new institution. The vast majority of police forces are less than 200 years old, most more like 150 years old. Uh, the oldest are only about 200 years old. And we have this kind of liberal myth making that policing was created to enforce the law in a way that would create this kind of level playing field that would benefit everyone equally. And this is a classic liberal erasure of the ways in which these legal institutions and legal frameworks are actually created to enable and facilitate regimes of profound exploitation. So policing, which is created in the late 18th and early 19th century, is created in direct relationship to the three primary systems of economic exploitation that were present during that period. And those are colonialism, slavery, and mass industrialization. And so when we look at the origins of American policing, we see them in direct relationship to these three forms of exploitation. In the US South, police forces develop modern, uniformed, professional law enforcement institutions are developed to manage slavery. Not so much this idea of slave patrols in the rural countryside, but actually in the big cities where slaves work outside the home of their owners. They travel across the city to work on wharves, in warehouses, et cetera, earning wages that are returned to their owners. So in the big urban cities like Charleston, Savannah, New Orleans, there are generally more mobile slaves moving around the, the city than there are white people. And policing is created to manage that mobile slave population for fear of uprisings, revolts, violence, but also to prevent them from congregating from forming underground reading groups and things like that, which of course slaves did try to do and they did try to stage uprisings. And so police in the South are enforcing the law, but it's the law of slavery. It's a fundamentally unjust law. In the Southwest, policing emerges in relationship to colonialism the extermination and forced removal first of indigenous populations by groups like the Texas Rangers, and then the removal and suppression of the historic Mexican and Spanish landholders to make way for white settlement. So they had literally pushed these homeowners across the border back into Mexico through raids and, and false arrests and threats of violence 
And in places like South Texas, there was a system of Juan Crow, very much like Jim Crow, up until the 1960s and 70s, where Latinos were denied the right to register to vote or to vote, could not go to uh, desegregated schools. There were separate bathrooms and everything else. And groups like the Texas Rangers were responsible for enforcing that. In the North, policing emerges to manage the influx of European immigrants joining the industrial economy. In this way, very similar to the creation of police in London who are managing the influx of rural British populations who are dispossessed by the enclosures movement that privatizes their public land holdings that they survived on. So police in New York, Boston, Chicago, et cetera, they're tasked with turning this massive immigrant population into a stable functional working class by suppressing unionization, suppressing riots, but also micromanaging the public behavior of these groups to mold them into a stable working class. So all kinds of restrictions on public drunkenness, even restrictions on what kind of clothing people could wear. And we see this kind of culminate in the prohibition movement against alcohol, which was an effort to suppress the political development of this new immigrant working class. Uh, so again, enforcing laws that have nothing to do with real public safety, that don't benefit the people who are subjected to them, and yet the police are enforcing the law. Yeah, and, and you know, one of, that's, it's really interesting because the creation of laws to, um, to create those, those segregations and misogyny, uh, misogyny and, and all that type of thing, it, it, it goes to the basics of the war on drugs, you know, I saw one of the interviews you did, and you talked about amphetamines and uh, marijuana and heroin, and the the racialization of each of those at various times. You know, from the Chinese opium in the 1880s through to uh, marijuana in the in the one uh, the one um, crow type era. You know, it's just. It's phenomenal how much of these things are actually integrated into the structure of policing as an oppressive force as opposed to a protective force. Um, and then one thing that I, I really think is really important from a liberal perspective is to understand the types of um, negative uh, impacts that it has, particularly when you're talking about criminalizing homelessness, homelessness. and, and and the, and the and the and the your your failures of uh, policing sex work because that's something which creates underclasses and actually forces people to go underground and be unsafe as well, you know physically unsafe and um, you know in a health respect be unsafe. So um, tell us a little bit about that. I mean, sure. once again, this is about giving you as much opportunity to speak. So go to town. Yeah, so we've imagined that sex work can be controlled by turning it over to the police and that somehow this will magically make the lives of women better. And so what we're caught up in right now is what we often refer to as a kind of carceral feminism. So the idea that the way we improve the lives of women is by mobilizing the criminal legal system to protect them. But that system was actually created to subjugate women in many important ways. And it has never really served that function. The, the suppression of prostitution in practice and other kinds of sex work is about moral crusades, moral panics, and the micromanagement of the poorest, most vulnerable populations in our society. So there's never any enforcement against really high-end sex work. There are widespread utilization of sex workers on Wall Street. There are no raids happening there. You know, everyone understands, oh, that's not harming you. But poor people trying to make money to survive on street corners are the targets of this. And 
the problem, the, the overwhelming problem with criminalization is that just like with prohibition is that it creates an underground criminal control black market in which people are more likely to be victimized either financially or through violence or sexual assaults because they have no recourse. And so the movements of sex workers in general across the world have called for various forms of decriminalization that would allow sex work to come out of the shadows combined with broader efforts to raise the conditions of women as workers and in particular teenagers because some of the most vulnerable folks to violence and exploitation are teenagers who've been forced out of their homes by abuse, by rejection of their sexuality or gender appearance, and they find themselves homeless, penniless, and thus often vulnerable to be involved in sex work in ways that are harmful to them. And so if we're serious about improving the conditions for women workers, we need to radically increase the minimum wage. We need to create real infrastructures to support young people who age out of foster care, who are teenage runaways, et cetera. And the moral crusaders who wanna criminalize prostitution and other forms of sex work are always absent when it comes to these discussions of real distributive policies that would dramatically increase the living standards of women more broadly. And I'll just end by saying, you know, we, there was a study done in upstate New York among sex workers that found they had all had other kinds of jobs. They had worked in diners and manufacturing and hotels, and they found that work to be sexually degrading, filled with sexual assaults and harassment, and dramatically lower paying than sex work. And so they preferred sex work, which allowed them more flexibility and higher pay than other kinds of wage work. Do you mind if I yeah. ask a question, Rorikey? Of course, go for it, David. First, we're talking with Professor Vitali. Am I pronouncing your last name? Yeah, Vitali. Vitali. And please buy his book. It's published by Verso. It's called The End of Policing. If it's published by Verso, you know you need to buy it. The End of Policing. Seriously. <laughs> the, new, the new edition will be out, like, I think, December 7th, but you can right. pre-order it now. It's a great gift. The holidays are upon us. I can't think of a better gift than The End of Policing by Professor Alex Vitali. And I do hope you'll come back uh, and thank you, Ricky Hutchinson from London. You are a national treasure here in the United States. You make me <laughs> proud uh, to be an American. I don't know. Uh, so uh, we're waiting on Professor Ben Burgess, who I don't know if you know Professor Ben Burgess. Uh, you should be on his show. So he's this is his slot. So I'll book you. Uh, okay show because you you would enjoy being on this show while we're waiting for professor ben burgess to me and i think you would probably agree that the the police are an extension of the military industrial complex they're funded by fear just ginning up non-existent threats to american people as long as we're scared we're going to pay a trillion dollars each year to the military industrial complex and we're not going to defund the police even after last year uh, we're reluctant to defund the police when when it became incontrovertible last summer that we have a problem with the police and need to rethink the police in this country when even the crypto fascists on the right were saying, yes, this looks bad. We, we need to reevaluate. I said, watch the crime statistics. Suddenly, murder is going to go up. Crime is going to go up. And sure enough, the same way the sun comes up in the morning, the crime rate went up in New York City. And all I read about are people being pushed into the subways and how dangerous it is out there. 
did it get more dangerous? Well, let's let's separate the Excuse actual me, amount. I, of I hate to interrupt you, but one second. Uh, Professor Ben Burgess is the host of Give Them an Argument. And I just wanted to introduce Professor Alex Vitale and Ricky Hutchinson to Professor Ben Burgess, the host of Give Them an Argument. And I, th I think I have your next guest on Give Them an Argument, <laughs> Professor Burgess. He's the author. Alex Vitale is the author of The End of Policing, published by Verso. So I think we have your next guest. Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay. Bye, Professor Burgess. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Burgess is a columnist for Jacobin, and he is. And, and yes, I'm familiar with some of his work there. Uh, yes. I am a subscriber uh, yeah. and an occasional contributor to, to Jacobin as well. I've written a few pieces over right. the years. Okay, so look, we need to separate so out. Crime, did crime? Here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to have you come back. I'd like you to go on Professor Ben Burgess's show. I'd like my listeners to go by the end of policing right now it's published by verso verso books let me just quick quick answer to my question yep. we're told that crime has gone up in the past year it looks very suspicious to me that that uh, is happening while people are talking about defunding the police are yep. are yep. those statistics can they be trusted well, so we need to separate out the actual amount of crime and the discourse around crime. So the discourse around crime exploded in exactly the way you described. The amount of crime actually decreased. However, there was and has been an important increase in homicides. But interestingly, no other crime, all other crime has fallen. But homicides did go up, and in some places, quite a bit. And homicides are very reliable crime statistic, as crime statistics go. So we have a problem. It's not surprising. The pandemic was an incredible stressor on people, and I'm sure is a direct contributor to this. And now that the pandemic has waned, the numbers are coming back down, which is great news. So it's not a secular increase in homicide. It's tied to people being on top of one another. And losing their jobs and being afraid of eviction and the, all the many stresses that people are, have been under and the loss of loved ones and, and all the rest, these are contributing to that, yes. Right. And of course, the solution is not to flood the cities with more police, it's to create economic security for people, which we could do, you know, with, with eviction moratoriums and income supports and all the rest, but also by investing in community-based anti-violence initiatives, which are showing tremendous positive results across the country where they're being tried. All right. I'm going to, uh, Ricky, I love you, Ricky. My mother <laughs> and sister love you, Ricky. We've missed you. I'm serious. My mother and sister have been asking where have you where have you been? So it's great to see you, and uh, thank you for introducing us to Professor Vitali. And I I'm glad I was able to introduce you. Let me ask Professor Burgess and Professor Vitali about the New York City subways. When you get on a New York City subway, are you afraid you're going to push somebody into an oncoming? <laughs> Sorry. The Sorry. cities, the subways have become much safer as people have returned to the subway. The new statistics right. look really positive. So this has all been orchestrated, you know, politically, all this, this breathless coverage about crime. And, and the New York Times has done a bit of a mea culpa. They, they have had to fall on their sword a little bit because they published some terrible trash about crime and stuff. And they've, they've been taking some steps to correct it, not to let them off the hook, but just to say that the criticism of them has been so withering that they've had to take some corrective action. In the New York Times defense, they exposed how piggish New York City cops were during the entire George yes. Floyd BLM. I mean, they just had a, a tsunami of videos of police. And this was after they had all had de-escalation training and, and implicit bias training and all that. You know, it just shows how useless that stuff is. Right. The New York Times is still 
you know, what their, their editorial page is a disgrace. All their columnists, every single one of their columnists are disgraceful, including Paul Krugman. But their reporting is still the best, as is the Washington Post and the Los Angeles Times. It's their editorial pages that are the problem. Thank you, Professor Alex Vitale. Thank you, Rorikki Hutchinson. Thank, really, thank you so much. This is just turning out to be a great show. And the best way to thank the people who put this show together right now is to go online, Verso Books, go to Verso Books and pick up The End of Policing. Go buy The End of Policing right now because if you buy the book, Professor Vitale and Rorikki will come back on the show. <laughs> they're not coming on because they want to hear me talk. They've, they've, so thank you both. Thanks so much, time. David. And thanks, Rorikki, for having me on. I hope we get to chat again soon. Thank you. And I hope, book sales, thanks, guys. I hope book sales are good enough for you to come back. Go <laughs> by the end of policing right now, Verso Books. Thank you. Thank you, Ricky. Thank Let you. us now go to uh, Michigan or Georgia. It depends on Georgia. Let's go down to Georgia, where Professor Ben Burgess is standing by. He is a columnist for Jacobin. There are two great stories, two great columns he wrote for Jacobin that I want to discuss with him. He is also a professor at Rutgers at Perimeter College in Georgia and a columnist for Jacobin, host of Give Them an Argument. That's also a book he's written. He's also written Canceling Comedians While the World Burns. Let's start with your first piece, the most recent piece. I maintain that anybody who is in the public eye is an ignoramus because it requires eight hours a day to study. You have to read for eight hours a day. So whenever I see a politician out on the town going to the Met Gala, I think ignoramus. Henry Kissinger, for example, yeah. at the height of his power, he was dating some of the most beautiful women in the world. He was socializing at night while he was triangulating China and Russia. And I, I look back and I go, this guy can't be too smart. He's meeting all day with Nixon, planning the assassination of Allende. He, that means he's not spending eight hours studying and then he's out at night going to parties. He's an ignoramus, Henry Kissinger. Well, and in Jacobin, you, yeah, yeah. you point out that Henry Kissinger, besides being the spawn of Satan, also happens to be an ignoramus. Uh, yeah, he certainly wasn't uh, very bright about his investment decisions. So Elizabeth um, Holmes, uh, the uh, the founder and, and CEO and chairwoman of, uh, she, she had a lot of jobs there, of uh, Theranos, uh, claimed that, uh, that she had this amazing blood testing machine that, that would take one uh, prick of blood uh, and uh, you could use it from your your you know your home when it was ready. You know, like you could just you know pick one of these up at Walgreens. You know, have it at home. Take one prick of blood. It would automatically test you for a thousand different blood testing codes uh, for all sorts of things that uh, that might be wrong. It would revolutionize everything. And uh, the thing that I can't get over about Elizabeth Holmes is that, as far as I could tell, she knows about as much about biochemistry and medical science as I do, right? Because because yeah. because her explanation of how this worked, uh, you know, when, when somebody actually got around to asking her exactly how does the machine work, this is an exact quote. A chemistry is performed so that a chemical reaction occurs. Following so far? A chemistry yes. is performed so a chemical reaction occurs. I, 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 I didn't know chemistry was a verb. 
words or a noun? It, it, a noun, a, a chemistry. Apparently, they uh, apparently it's a unit. You know that you can have a chemistry or two chemistries. Right. A chemistry is performed so the chemical reaction occurs and generates a signal from the chemical interaction with the sample, which is translated into a result, which is then reviewed by certified laboratory personnel. Uh, so this is the amazing thing. Uh, Henry Kissinger himself is, you know, I mean, he's obscenely wealthy compared to a normal person, but I mean, he's not wealthy compared to, you know, a Walton or, or a, uh, you know, Jeff Bezos, you know, Elon Musk, you know, like the real masters of the world. Uh, the estimates I could find of his net worth vary anywhere from $10 million to $50 million. Uh, but however much that is, you know, he, he invested uh, $3 million of his own money into uh into theranos uh he and more importantly than that uh he and the uh estate lawyer that he brought in you know to uh to to look at it for him uh that guy invested several million and more importantly than that uh the two of them uh you know whispered in the ears of a bunch of their actually extremely wealthy friends uh people like uh the walton family for example and the sort of network of Kissinger, his estate lawyer, uh, the Waltons, about three other families. The uh, Devos. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, all of these people who found out about it from Kissinger and his lawyer uh, ended up between them. They uh, they contributed, uh, they invested, um, you know, they didn't think they were making a contribution. They thought they were making an investment. They invested $370 million dollars into uh uh yeah uh sorry um uh, yeah million into theranos uh so that's more than half of the money that Holmes you would had. think you would think blood suckers would know something about blood letting <laughs> wouldn't you well, apparently not um it's, it's it's just amazing uh and and apparently some of the argument going on at the holmes trial is about whether um you know whether the all of these investors were sophisticated enough that they knew what they were getting into they knew there was a good risk that it might not work and uh so the prosecution is trying to establish by interviewing people like kissinger's lawyer uh that no no no, they were actually they 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 were not sophisticated enough to know this that you know that they really thought it was going to work and and i just imagine like I, I like to imagine that could actually get to the point where one of these people could be on the stand and you know they could say no 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 of course, I'm not sophisticated enough to understand this. Can't you tell I'm a rube? You know that, like that, that I would just believe anything. Um, it's it's astonishing, and of course, Holmes was uh, Holmes and, and her partner, uh, her partner, I should say, uh, was at least as ignorant of the actual science as she was. Uh, but she went to Stanford. Yeah, well, uh, the uh, apparently uh, her her business partner. Uh, Sonny, he he would do uh, his staffers would do this thing where they would sneak in made up scientific terms into his his remarks to see like what he would repeat on stage and you know he always he always repeated it but the two of them you know were you know were living pretty large on it uh, they they had um, you know she would travel around with this big you know flanks of security guards uh, who would refer to her as uh, on the walkie talkies as Eagle One. She had mm. an office that was modeled on uh, the uh, the Oval Office. Uh, she had, uh, she would actually travel um, in a $6.5 million uh, Gulfstream G150 by herself, you know, just, just when she, you know, when she, when she went on trips. So uh, I- you went to Stanford. <laughs> So you can see why all these people well, very briefly understand, but uh, but yeah, uh, you can uh, you can see why all these people um, are are upset about it. But I, I basically have two thoughts in the article. One is, you know, the slightly more serious one, which is that um, there is a underappreciated underappreciated connection here between uh, the level of economic inequality that we have in our society and stuff like Theranos happening, because if Elizabeth Holmes had, had gotten all of her money from, you know, research grants from state institutions or even loans from regular private banks, 
there would have been all these layers of approval bureaucracy, you know, to go through paperwork to file. And over the course of that, I hope at least a couple of people would have actually known something about how all this worked and asked some obvious follow-up questions that she would not have been able to answer. Whereas if you can be sufficiently spellbinding one-on-one to an extremely rich individual, they can just cut a check. They don't, they don't need to get it approved by anybody if they don't want no to. No red tape. No. no red tape, exactly. And it, and it got put into CVS, which is closing 900 stores, right? You, you, wasn't it, wasn't this? Yeah, well, there was, well, there were, they were all there. They were all ready to put it in, in C, like CVS and Walgreens, I think, like had like space reserved for it in the store. They actually put it in there. They were actually, they, have they, a, they were so, fudging the tests. She, well, was, there, yeah. she, she was, you could go to CVS and use her product, but it would get shipped back to Silicon Valley and they would test the blood the old fashioned way, not the way she claimed they could. Yeah, so apparently they had. Uh, <laughs> but here's the other. Uh, so, 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 so I, I was just gonna say, right? Um, the um, uh, so apparently, uh, you know, they said that this could test for up to a thousand codes instantaneously. Uh, right. They never got higher than twelve, uh, right. and even for those twelve, it didn't work more often that it did work. Part of how they got away with it for as long as they did uh, is is that um, uh, is that they, you know, like she ran the workplace in such a way that like, you know, everybody was afraid to talk to each other. You know, the engineers and the chemists, you know, didn't talk to each other. There was all steps kept strictly separate. Everybody assumed that the real work was going on. Uh, somewhere else, um, I think. I think as far as the CVS Walgreens thing, I think. I think. It, I think they'd really rolled it out in a limited way, like at some yeah. stores. Uh, but the they um, weren't. They weren't testing. The idea was you would get the test instantaneously, and she was shipped. The tests were shipped back to Silicon Valley, and they were. Yeah, being and, and, and most of the time they used they used uh, their competitors' products to do the actual right. testing, right. and they right. had a. And uh, and my understanding is that they. Um, you know, on those occasions for demonstration, whatever, where they actually did use their own, you know, they would really terrify people, you know, because because they would tell them falsely that they had these rare, you know, blood diseases and all that right. stuff. Uh, but this is the second point, you know, I, I think, I think, uh, uh, you know, I think Philip might have, have something to say, but, uh, but the second point real quick is to, uh, is to say, Uh, Just this that, you know, so that's the more serious thought about the connection between this kind of fraud and runaway economic inequality. The uh, but the second thought of the one I end with is just this, that um, when I think about the fact that, you know, 370 million of the um, of the 700 million came from uh, the network of Kissinger and his lawyer and their friends. And I think about Kissinger's, you know, all this stuff, you know, I read, um, you know, just wrote this book about Christopher Hitchens. Of course, I read his stuff about Kissinger, uh, all of, you know, and everything's documented, you know, meticulously in that book, you know, that Kissinger, uh, you know, was involved in, you know, in planning the coup against Salvador Allende and in Chile uh, that uh, that he, uh, you know, that he personally oversaw you know, the bombing of, of Cambodia as Secretary of State, you know, passed on the instructions he discussed with Nixon, you know, anything that flies and anything that moves was involved in, you know, plotting to assassinate, disappear, you know, journalists, you know, priests, you know, people in various countries were inconvenient uh, to U.S. interests. I think all that stuff's like, I don't know. I mean, obviously, uh, she was a fraud and a monster and really hurt a lot of people, but Man, there is a part of me that wishes that this had uh, this had been exposed until she milked like maybe a few hundred more dollars out of all these ghouls. Right now, is Kissinger? We know he's morally bankrupt. Is he personally, financially bankrupt now? Uh, I wish. Uh, you know, I think even going with the, the extreme low end estimate of his his income, you know, what he invested in Theranos was probably only about thirty percent. Of, right. of what he had so so he's not all the way bankrupt sadly but uh, but i'm sure he's missing the three million right and by the way it was a guy bremer from kissinger and associates who was the viceroy of iraq who came yeah. up with the genius idea of dismissing the elite republican guard yeah, 
Yeah, the debathification was a Kissinger and Associates idea. It's not just Kissinger, though. But, but David, David, could I yes. break in for a second? Yeah, let I, me introduce you first, Dr. Uh, Philip Hergenfeld. Uh, I thought the whole world like, knows me. Okay. I don't feel bad about this because Professor Burgess stole some of my time last week. Yes. I, just, I just want to say that these people, in fact, were total rubes and babes in the wood, because when greed enters the picture, your brains go out the window. So, you know, they just saw more billions coming their way, so they stopped thinking. This is how people work, no matter how many billions they have. Yeah, I should, I should say too that um, one of my favorite details from everything I read about this is that Elizabeth Holmes would insist that the temperature at the Theranos office be kept down in the 60s. And the reason she insisted on it is that otherwise she'd be overheated in her daily uniform of a black turtleneck and you know, jacket, which she wore because it was an imitation of Steve Jobs. And you know, combined right. with the fact that she had a very intense voice, she didn't blink very much. All of this stuff worked its magic on all of these wealthy investors who of course didn't know anything more about chemistry than she did and didn't ask a lot of follow-up questions because as Dr. Hirschfeld says, she, uh, they, um, you know, they were just afraid of missing the next you know, revolutionary big new thing in Silicon Valley. Well, let me do one thing, because let me uh, ask Dr. Hirschfeld and you a question mm -hmm. about the relationship between what, what greed does to intelligence. And, mm -hmm. and so she also hoodwinked General Mattis, Mad Dog <laughs> Mattis, who was our Secretary of Defense under Trump, uh, never married. They, they said that he would travel with 10,000 books whenever he went into war. General Mattis mm. would travel with his books and he, he he's a life, a bachelor, he's well read. He what did he, said, what did he what do with those books? books? Yeah. <laughs> he wasn't reading them and and the the you know he was well read general mattis and he sat on the board of directors of theranos george schultz who was a competitor of henry kissinger's in the nixon administration i believe he was treasury secretary i think uh under reagan he was uh the budget Czar, like OMB, uh, he ran Bechtel. He sat on the board of Theranos. He got his grandson a job at Theranos. And the grandson kept saying, Grandpa, I don't think this is legitimate. And George Schultz, who I think is a Stanford man, no, 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 trust me, she tested, she's one of us. She, the, the stupidity knows no bounds. And, it, and stupidity, as Dr. Hirschenfeld says, greed makes you stupid or which comes first, the greed or the stupidity? I think the greed comes first. <clears throat> and as the professor says, I shed no tears over this 350 billion, I wish it were a thousand billion. Right, it's a million that that they lost. Yeah, sadly, it would be even better if it was 370 right. billion, but yes. <laughs> it's just a repeat of the Madoff story. A yeah. lot of smart people went down with him. I knew of one person who was, you know, that Madoff people came to him and he said, this sounds too good to be true which means it's too good to be true. Right. And he said, no, thank you. <laughs> but it bleeds into every walk of life. The idea that I, I'm i Henry Kissinger, I'm General Mattis, I'm George Schultz. I will tell you who should live and die. I'll press one button and we'll destroy a dike in Cambodia and flood these people. And I'm General Mattis and we're, we'll kill 5,000 ISIS members. And, you know, yes, there'll be some family members killed, but I'm smart, I, I know enough. You know, I'm George Schultz. I know how to tweak 
the the money supply so just you know yes some people will die from starvation in america but we won't have inflation there the arrogance the the self-confidence where does that come from what what, what is how do you describe somebody like henry kissinger what is let the pathology me, of let somebody me coin like, a phrase that you've never heard before <clears throat> power corrupts absolute power corrupts absolutely right this is really true before uh professor ben burgess goes uh, uh you have another piece that i think is kind of interesting uh, you you touched on this in your debate with charlie kirk uh, mm -hmm. from turning points usa everybody should watch this man's debate with charlie kirk it's, it's a master's class in uh debate who won <laughs> Although Charlie Kirk doesn't know it. You talked about the yardsticks because they talk, the, the, the right likes to talk about freedom and the measurements of freedom. How do we measure freedom? How do we define freedom? Yeah, yeah right. So, uh, so I, I think usually when people like this use the phrase economic freedom, what they really mean is like the freedom of business owners to do whatever they want, you know, uh, without uh, pesky, you know, interference from you know, the government or unions, which is bad right. enough to begin with. But it's actually worse if you look at these like very fancy sounding statistics that they always appeal to. You know, it's like, oh, look at the, um, you know, the Fraser Institute's, you know, ranking of, you know, economic freedom of, you know, all the countries in the world ranked by their economic freedom. You know, that sounds objective. Uh, and, you know, or the Cato Institute, you know, Heritage, whatever, you know, they, they've all, you know, several of these, these people have versions of this. Uh, the one I focused on in the article, just because like some libertarians that I was looking at made a big deal about it, uh, was the Fraser Institute's economic freedom rankings. And if you actually start poking at the methodology a little bit, it's actually even worse than what I just said would suggest, because like, uh, basically what these numbers supposedly show is that greater economic freedom in their sense, correlates with all the good things, uh, you know, more people going to school, longer life expectancy, more, you know, democracy, whatever, right, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's inversely correlated with all the bad things. Uh, but then you actually start looking at the methodology and even, in, even by their own standards, they're stacking the deck in a crazy, ridiculous way. Uh, so uh, they, the most, um, you know, so like one of the categories that they use to, uh, you know, that they use is like property rights. Like, okay, that makes sense. I can understand that. And one of them is government spending. It's like, okay, we're drifting a little bit further out because like there's a big difference between government spending on different kinds of things. But like, I can kind of understand that. But one of them is sound money. And if you look into what they mean by that, I quote what they say, you know, if you go on their website, uh, they're saying that, well, if there's a lot of inflation, they, they dock points uh, for economic freedom for that. So it's just worth pausing a second on this, because uh, what that means is that it's actually getting the usual right wing argument backwards. Right. The usual right wing argument is, oh, if you do these horrible socialist policies, there'll be lots of inflation. It'll be terrible like Venezuela. Right. That's the usual thing. But here, they're not even saying that this stuff leads to inflation. They're saying that inflation per se makes a country less economically free or less capitalist or whatever. And so, uh, and so they, they dock points in economic freedom for having lots of inflation. Uh, they also have a, the property rights category. It isn't actually a property rights category. It's a legal system and property rights category. Uh, and it's like, oh, that's weird, legal system and property rights. You know, why, why are those together? What, what does legal system mean? And they literally have categories like military interference in the judicial system and elections. Uh, and, and it's like, okay, it's, you know, corruption. And it's like, all right. So if what you're telling me is that countries with high rates of inflation, lots of uh, judicial corruption and frequent military coups, have more bad things and fewer good things than countries that don't have that stuff, then, okay, that sounds pretty plausible to me. What on earth this is this supposed to have to do with anything people are arguing about when they're arguing about capitalism and socialism and all that stuff is beyond me. And especially if you, if you look, uh, they've got, you can go to their website and they've got this nice little interactive map 
where you can uh, look at different countries and quickly compare different countries to see how economically free they are. Uh, and, and I did that. And um, so Norway and Sweden tie for 37th place in the entire world for economic freedom. You said, hmm, that's odd, right? You know, huge welfare states, lots of taxes. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't think that that would be what they would think of as economic freedom. Haiti is 118th place. And say, so, wait a second, does Haiti have a bigger welfare state than Norway? Uh, does 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 uh, Norway have weaker labor unions than Haiti? Does you know, right. uh, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Like anything that people are actually arguing about when they're having arguments about capitalism and socialism and social democracy and all that, it's complete. It's so it's sublimely irrelevant. In fact, it's so irrelevant, and I didn't even uh, quote this part in the article because I couldn't find the original data that this part was based on. Uh, and it was such an insane claim. I thought that maybe I was misinterpreting it somehow. But a couple of weeks ago, I asked a room full of libertarians and, and nobody had a better interpretation of what this meant. One of those papers that was quoted in the article that uh, that was using the Fraser Index to talk about how wonderful it is when countries become more capitalist, uh, they, they gave five examples of countries that had become less capitalist between 1980 and 2005. Uh, that was the time period they were looking at. And, you know, one of them was Venezuela. And, you know, I think, I think there were a couple of African countries, but uh, one of them was the Ukraine and thought, hold up, 1980 to 2005. So you're telling me that the Soviet Socialist Republic of the Ukraine as part of the USSR in the 1980s was more capitalist than the Ukraine is now? That doesn't sound right. But again, if you're just predefining more economic freedom or more capitalism or whatever as meaning good things happen in this country, you know, the more good things happen, you know, the more capitalism points you get, then it's very, very easy to come to the conclusion that capitalism is correlated with all the good stuff. Right. Great job. Read these two pieces over at Jacobin right now. Professor Ben Burgess is the host of Give Them an Argument and author of Give Them an Argument, as well as Canceling Comedians While the World Burns. And his new book on Christopher Hitchens that he's about to hold up is entitled Christopher Hitchens by Ben Burgess. Is, it, is that the, co the cooking book, Christopher Hitchens in the Kitchens? Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kitchens in the kitchen. Yes. I love that. Yeah, it's yeah, fantastic. It's, it's mo most most of the recipes are just like, uh, you know, pour some flour and sugar into a bowl, mix it up, dump it into the sink, drink a drink whiskey, and order in. Yeah. Kitchens like in the that. kitchens. Can I um? Can I make a correction? By the way, normally yeah. people. Um, professor, you, you called it the Ukraine, and that's actually very insulting to people from there's no the in it. It's, it's yeah, Ukraine. And yeah. as, a, as, as someone whose family, thankfully, got the hell out of there five generations ago. <laughs> this is I welcome you to ins insult them all you want, that shithole. Yeah, this, this, is, this is what I always tell people, that they should have been nicer to my family if they wanted me to drop the, day, the definite article. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Professor Burgers. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Sabinian. Thanks. We by the way, I, by... I'm sorry. I, I want to retract. I called it a shithole. It's not a shithole. It's just, you know, they had they had a rough stretch there for a while. Yeah. Uh, joining us is Dr. Philip Hershenfeld. He is a Freudian psychoanalyst. And Ethan Hershenfeld, <laughs> his comedy special, Thug Thug Jew, is on YouTube right now. Go stream it. He is also starring in the number one. Let me let me tell you, you may not have heard, but Red Notice is the most popular movie in the history of Netflix, and Ethan Hershenfeld is one of the stars. <laughs> And I'm in it, David. I am in it. Let's just yeah. let me just say if I did happy for other people, you might be one of the people I would be happy for. Let me ask I'm touched. I'm touched. a couple of things. Thanksgiving, it turns out, falls on a Thursday again. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> it's not against you. 
It's a plot. And, and last year we had one of our most popular shows and we did a thanks. So I'm, I'm not going to put you on the spot, but I just want you to know that we are doing a show on Thanksgiving. So I'm just, but you don't have to give me an answer. Um, I will be there, even if you're not. I'm just, oh, okay. I'm going to be here. Just, yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll have to talk to my agent and we'll get back to you. <laughs> By the way, you look like you're ready for Passover, Dad. You're really reclining there. What, you're, yeah. I had wow. a long day. I had a Are long your feet day. up? Not quite. You should put them up. I like that look. That's a good look. Okay. Well, I was going to ask Dr. Philip Hershenfeld a question, but first I have to ask Ethan, Thanksgiving or Passover? Um, Thanksgiving for the food, Passover for the suffering. <laughs> Thanksgiving, just eat. There's, you, you, don't, you don't have to work for the food. Passover, you, you, they make you work for every, for every bite. Yeah, they make you work. Yeah, and what a, what a what a selection of bites they are! It looks like a crime scene on a round plate. Yes, there's shank bones. There's yeah. Doctor Hershenfeld, yeah. a year ago, let's see. Well, the election. Well, yeah, the election had not been settled. It was kind of settled. So let's say a year and two months ago, you said that you were nervous for the country. You said you were worried that Trump was going to get reelected, that then it was just going to be a complete downward spiral into fascism and authoritarianism. This is I have a serious question. I have noticed that I am suffering from a generalized anxiety. A lot of people I know are anxious and nervous. They do not feel protected from the deluge from next year's midterms and what will then ensue they don't feel that biden who is at an you know as unpopular as trump uh almost as unpopular as his vice president they are not presenting well to the american people and it's almost unless somebody I literally read, I think it was in the New York Times. I saw the same thing. Unless there's a 9-11. Yeah, that line jumped out. <laughs> the only thing that could save us now, Mohammed Atta. Where is that guy? Repeat, explain what you've read. I, I'm so glad you had the same reaction. The that same I line jumped out. I'm there scrolling. I'm, I'm on my back. I'm reading article after article, absorbing very little. And then it, it was just an article about the, the abject pessimism and uh, the, 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 the poor chances as they look now for any good electoral outcome for the Democrats in 2022 and 2024. And uh, one strategist said, yeah, I think the one thing that could really do <laughs> pull, you know, Pull victory out of the joke. Yeah, yeah. We, exactly. But he was being serious. He wasn't. He was. The problem is, I've noticed. I mean, I, I live in New York when I'm not up here, and I've noticed there's only one tower now. Yeah. So that you couldn't get the same media bang for your buck. With, I don't know how. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's just not going to play as well when they repeat it and repeat it. Because the thing about that day, if you remember, there was the shock and the horror of that first one falling. And then you're like, oh, okay, there's that one. And then that one. So now it would just be, it's not, it's more of like a one act play. It's not like, yeah. Right. If and the it, third act was the Pentagon. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the Pennsylvania was the denouement. Yeah, and act four or five was a 20 year war in Afghanistan. Yeah. So anyway. Back my, so back to my question. Dr. Philip Hershenfeld. And I'm being, this is a serious question. I will treat it seriously. Okay. So I was talking to somebody I care very deeply about. I feel like he's smirking already. I can see the doctor smirking. He said he's going to take this seriously, but there's a smirk. But go ahead. Sorry. This person was, I, I, I don't feel safe. I don't feel that Biden and Harris are going to keep us safe from the Republicans. Used to be, you know, safe from the Russians or safe from yeah, Al Qaeda. Yeah. Now it's keeping us safe from Donald Trump. That 
And, and I said, well, something else is bothering you. And this person said, no, nothing else is bothering me. This is really making me anxious. What would a psychiatrist, what, I mean, at this point, when, when, when a patient says, I have this generalized, well, it wouldn't be generalized anxiety. It would be a specific anxiety about Biden and Pelosi and Schumer not keeping us safe from the deluge. What do you say? Uh, I say it's a complicated question. I say that the best cure for pessimism is to get active in yes. some way or another and to try to take charge of the situation. I would say that I share in that um, concern. Am I allowed to mention the New York Times on this yeah. left program? Yeah. Okay. So I listen to the daily every morning while I'm working out. And there was, I think it was the last two days, a, a program on what's going on in school boards all across America, where people are, are fighting to the death with each other over masks, over closing, over opening, over COVID, or is it real, is it not? And when I'm listening critical to Critical race theory, don't forget critical race theory. Yeah, they, they throw that in. I'm thinking, is this what America was like in 1858, let's say, right before the Civil War? I think it might have been. I think there's a lot of stuff to be worried about. One of the things I worry about is how many armed people, including people with legitimate arms and in, in, in services of various sorts, how many of them would join a revolution? I don't know. Maybe that's a bit of hysteria, but it has happened in countries before. Um, I think there's a lot to be concerned about. I also think that we have been through a lot of terrible things in these in this country, which we tend to uh, forget about over time, like Father Coughlin, like um, John Birch, like um, Joe McCarthy. Right. Wolfman Jack. <laughs> <laughs> Wolfman. We survived Wolfman Jack. Yeah, yeah. Is... So, it, it's, you know, I try, I try not to be too pessimistic and I remind myself of some of the more optimistic things. And I, I try to remind myself and whoever else is listening about the idea of doing something, not just sitting in a corner and worrying. Right. Uh, this borders on paranoia, seeing things that don't exist. But let me ask Ethan this question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Harvard hates mm -hmm. Yale, correct? I, I, I wouldn't know. Right. There's a rivalry. In other words, uh, Harvard has an endowment of 60 billion and they'd, they'd be perfectly happy if Yale's endowment were 59 billion and they hate Stanford and they, that what we have in America are tribal warlords who hate one another, thankfully, so that Bezos going to Bill Gates's yacht to celebrate Gates's 65th or 66th birthday two weeks ago. That was kind of like Joseph Stalin and FDR meeting on a, in Yalta or Malta, Yalta. carving up the world. And so is it, do you think it's fair to say that there's, if we hate each other, not you and me, but if Americans 
hate each other. Is it fair to say that Stephen Schwartzman, who runs Blackstone, hates, you know, uh, Rupert Murdoch, and they build political coalitions and manipulate, and the, that there wouldn't be any but any single person taking over. In the end, cooler heads will prevail. I, I'm I'm so lost. There were so many elements to that question. I apologize, and I also took a Benadryl because I was sneezing a lot. So between that, I I, I can't formulate a coherent uh, answer. To that I'm sorry. But there may be. Let, 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 let me reassure you, Ethan, that his his question made no sense. <laughs> somebody without Benadryl. Oh, without Benadryl. All right. Good. I'm relieved. You know because... what? That's the great thing about my show. You don't need Benadryl. <laughs> Half the people have already fallen. Can I? Can yes, I just pause? Just to this. This might seem less than central to what we're discussing, but the doctor said hysteria. I say hysteria. Right. They they like to say hysteria. With right. like it rhymes with wisteria. It, I think it's because it, it sounds a lot nicer. It sounds like an exotic plant. It's hysteria. It's hysterical. No. It's not hysterical. It's not and then you said. Bezos, I think it's Bezos. So you got hysteria and Bezos. I would say hysteria and Bezos. That's that's just me. This is what you get for sending your kid to Harvard. I told you not to. Constantly. I told you it would ruin. Nitpicking. Nitpicking. Is it a hyst hysterectomy or a? Why why is it called a hysterectomy? And didn't. Freud call people hysterical. Didn't he say Dora was hysterical? Was Dora that funny? It was the wandering womb theory. The yeah, wandering womb. Which started two, three thousand years ago. The, the theory was that only women were hysterical because they had a wandering womb. That is absolutely correct. What does that mean? If you have, if like, if you have uh, insomnia and you wander. I'm sorry, what? It's like if you have insomnia in a, at, at the Hilton and you wander from womb to womb. <laughs> Barbara Walters came out of retirement for that show. Uh, no, seriously, what is a wandering? What, what is what is it? What does hysterectomy come from? This came. This was from back in the day when medicine was was a less skilled profession than than than. Than, than making sandals. Like they knew nothing. So if they had to explain something, they would just make something up. They, they would just so like if someone had a, 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 like a crick in their neck, they'd say, oh, it's your womb. Your womb just went up into your neck. That was literally, that was medicine. So what is, so what is the origin of, of the term hysterectomy? From, oh. from the, the Greek word for uterus. Yeah, the uterus is the his. Yeah. But is it? But so so is it related to hysterical? Yes, because hysterical is thought to be in the olden days related to the womb. Men, it turns out, can be just as hysterical as women can. Ethan is hysterical. <laughs> I always everybody says Ethan's hysterical. Dora. Yeah. The was Explorer. Hysterical. Freud used to bring Dora in, one of his first patients, and he and he said she was just, so he would treat her by laughing at her because she was so. Is that how Dora worked? I'm going to open this Dora into my womb. Then we will suck. Um, I, I've. You know, uh, Dora was actually. Uh, her, 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 that was her stage name, basically. Like, that was her fake name that Freud gave her. But then it came out, it came out, oh no, that was Anna, Anna O, who was Bertha Pappenheim. It turned out we had a neighbor in the Bronx in the 80s who, who, uh, who was the, the niece of this Bertha Pappenheim. She was from Vienna. Her great aunt was this uh, Anna O, the first case so of her, Freud. Her neuroses was like lax, right? right? Wasn't there the woman? Who lacks whose cancer has been reproduced over generations, and she's the family is suing. Well, I don't know. Your, your friend in the Bronx, her neuroses. What does hmm? that have to do with Dora? Well, he's saying that you knew somebody in the Bronx yeah, who did. had 
who who could trace her neuroses back. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, she was just actually related. I don't think. Well, maybe she was a little kooky also. I don't know. Yeah, they considered her a kooky aunt, but she turned out to be an extremely yeah, accomplished really woman, woman, feminist, social worker, all types of. I mean, she she was quite this a is, person. This is Anna O. Anna O. That is correct. Huh. Who, who yeah. was one of Freud's patients in Vienna? She wasn't exactly Freud's patient. She was Freud's partner's patient. And um, he and Freud would, you know, collaborate on this. And um, the, Dr. Joseph Breuer, who was the first one who came up with this method of treating hysteria. And... Um, they did not know th about this phenomenon of transference. So at some point, this young lady tells Dr. Breuer, I'm in love with you. He panics, takes his wife <laughs> and goes on vacation and drops the whole enterprise. So uh, it was left in Dr. Freud's lap. Sort of, so to speak. Anna O, it, it, it stood for Anna O.G., the original gangster, right? Anna O.G. <laughs> she was the, the... So with the transference, let me ask your colleague, uh, uh, Ethan Hershenfeld, uh, does that, does the transference prey on the... Explain what transference is, and then, and then does it prey on the psychiatrist's ego? Does... Does the psychiatrist, like, did your father come home from work and say, you know, I got, it's not, I have a patient who's not in love with me. It's not, I don't know what's wrong with me. I, I never, no, we didn't get that kind of shop talk at home, but I did once have a therapist myself who was, it was so annoying because she just couldn't, just anything you said, it was just, oh, that's about how you feel about me. That's how you feel about me. And that's about how you feel about me. And that's it. Like, yeah, come on, get over yourself. It, it gets, I mean, that can get really... Psychiatrist. Yeah, that can get really... That can get tiresome. Uh, um, That's so funny. That yeah. is so funny. Transference, I mean, it, originally it was... Funny. That's such a funny idea for a sketch where the, <laughs> the, the psychiatrist who just everything that well that's that's transference you're in love with me that yeah is. yeah everything that was everything was was about her it was really it was I think anyway um, did, but also, did you fall in love with her I, I did not in fact she once fell asleep uh, while I was talking and <laughs> she just nodded off and then I um. I remember well, what I, happens I, if, if the if transference doesn't take place. Well, then you got to get off at 86th and Central Park West and walk across. If they don't accept. <laughs> Dr. Hershenfeld, in all seriousness, what happens if the patient, if, if you don't undergo transference? David. It's, it's like it's like a cup. It's like a. It's like a, a cappuccino without the foam. You can still drink it. It's still fine, but it's. It's not now, the full experience, right? Transference is ubiquitous. It happens in all relationships. In other words, you, you hear that I'm a doctor, so you have transference. You think I know what I'm talking about. You don't check the diploma. Right. <laughs> Same thing. The same thing with the Theranos lady. People had transfers. She wore a black sweater. She was sexy. She went to Stanford. Everybody said, oh, this girl must know what she's talking about. And she's going to make me millions of dollars. Well, woman, be true. Woman, so, dad, woman, woman. Sorry, here's my, my editor here. But <laughs> transference takes place in every single relationship. The only difference in well-handled psychotherapy is that it is examined. It's looked at to see what you can understand about it and from it. Right. That's all. 
but right. it's, it's it's always in the atmosphere. Right. right. It's like the difference between like popping your own zit or having a dermatologist do it and then send it off for tests to see what's in it. Other, anyone can pop a zit. Pop a zit. That was that's the pizzeria around the corner from me. Pop a zit. You tried the best. <laughs> try Papa Zitz. <laughs> what are we reading now before we wrap this? <laughs> you make me laugh so hard. You are <laughs> I, I, I read something that really turned me on. I'm I'm reading it for the second time and I'm really enjoying it because I'm going slower. It's Murakami's I think second to last book. It's called uh, First Person Singular. There's one of those snow monkeys on the cover. It's short stories. And in one of the short stories which is called With the Beatles. I really recommend this. Within that story, he talks about an experience when he's a kid reading a book of Japanese short stories in high school. So I just got that book. I ordered that book of those short stories by this guy. And I think that that author is the guy who wrote Rashomon, the story that the film is based on. Anyhow, anything by Murakami I love, but that latest book of short stories, first person singular, it's unbelievable. Dr. Hershenfeld, what are you reading? I'm not going to tell you. That's transference. That's transference. Not You're not going to tell me. I have to say, Red Notice is a lot of fun. Isn't it? it it's it's really fun. Really? And, and there's a lot of work. I, like, I don't watch those kind of movies yeah. often. And I went, my God, there's a, there, that is, the comedy writing involved yeah. there's a lot of great jokes the, the stunts i mean that is there's a lot of artisans that's exactly and, right that's what i was saying that to someone the other day i just love being plugged into one of those things for a few weeks or a few days you're, you're suddenly part of like this giant ant colony everyone working hard and doing their one specific thing right. to get this product it's incredible incredibly labor intensive and they did that during the pandemic before the the vaccine so everyone was getting tested every few days and everyone had masks on until the cameras rolled. It was it was very impressive. Yeah, I, I watched the movie, Dr. Hershefel. I'm going, what's wrong with me? I'm having fun. Right, Even right. though Ethan's in this, I should not be happy. This should be eating me alive. Yeah. You, you were going to say something, Dr. Hershefel? Ethan keeps emphasizing his part was small. It was I didn't say that. You said small. I never said the word small. Ah, that now that's transference. That's projection. But go on. It's not the size. It was brilliant. I simply I simply said I'm not the star. I said I'm in it. Okay. There's an old expression, Doctor Hershenfeld, among gynecologists. They say it's not the size of your part. It's the quality of your part. That's what we say. That's what we say is okay. I thought I'd end on. Why not? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so I might see the two of you for Thanksgiving. Very Maybe. Well. I will be here for sure. The doctor will will check in with his people. And if you have turkey, though, he won't be here. Me, no, no, I don't want turkey. No, 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 I won't. We're gonna have a vegan feast over here. You are, the two of you, I, I cannot tell you the number of people who say it's, they just, it's great. You, you, um, uh, a, a pre-Thanksgiving thank you for- Thank you. Time. Thank you. God thank bless. You, Dr. Philip Hershenfeld, Ethan Hershenfeld, go I'm right running, I'm running for Congress, I want to tell everybody. So I sent my check already. Okay. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye. Thank you, doctor. You go right now to YouTube and watch Thug Thug Jew. Thank you. He's even funnier on Thug Thug Jew than he is here. And of course, Red Notice, the number one movie in the history of humans, Netflix. in the history of humans. No, it, it's and, and, and deservedly so. It's fun mm. and deservedly so. Thank you, David. Thank you, sir. Come back. Ah. Come back Monday. Thank you. All Bring right. Renan. Bring Renan. Let's do it with Renan. Well, it's time now to go to California, where Emil Guillermo is standing by. He is the host of the PETA podcast, People for the Ethical Treatment 
of animals. He's also a columnist for ALDEF, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. And I have been rude to you. I've been rude to you. No, you haven't, David. I've been, I've been, you're, you're my, of all the guests, you and John Ross yeah. are my oldest friends on this show. Yeah. We go back to the 80s. And I've noticed that John and I get a little contentious and you come on and I take liberties with you. Well, I'm just a nicer guy, I think. You know, it's good that you come out of this, uh, you do this psych psychiatric thing here with the Hershenfelds and I was thinking like I don't I just skip psychiatry I went straight to the drugs and and that didn't work <laughs> and I uh I you know I have developed a sense I've I have found meditation where I have a sense of self compassion and self love so you can't hurt me David I won't let you you what can yell at like? me what is that like what is it like to, to be uh, it's sort of like it's sort of like a passive narcissism in a way kind of, you know, you love yourself, but, you know, in a good way, in a positive way so that so you meditate today. I, I meditate sometimes hourly. I mean, really, I mean, if you do formal meditation instead of, say, 10 to 20 minutes, I've done it a couple of times a day and and I do short hits of um say three minutes or less just because uh, um, to meditate is really just to pause to be in the present totally aware without judgment and you know so like i said uh, while you're out there love yourself and then when you love yourself you know no matter what you do david i you can't hurt me right but don't I, you think people i, I want to talk about the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund joining in the redistricting fight in Texas because we're coming up on the midterms and this redistricting is terrifying. It is. The, the, the Democrats at a severe disadvantage going into next year's midterms. But first, let's get back to self-love. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Isn't that the problem with most people? Well, I mean... They love themselves too much? Or, or if you talk to the, uh, you know, the, those who have studied and can pass out legal drugs and that kind of thing, they'll say it's the absence of self-love. It's the absence of worth. It's, it's your, you know, a, a sense of worthlessness that, that sort of. Okay, there were, people. there were, yesterday I went for my walk. I go to Starbucks, three people in their 20s are sitting around talking about nonsense. Of course. And I walked up, I didn't walk up to, I wanted to walk up to them. Yeah. And say, you sh three of you should hate yourselves as much as I hate you. I hate you. I hate what you represent. I hate what you're talking about. I hate what you're doing. I hate what you're not doing. I hate that you're self-satisfied and smug. I don't know what you do for a living, but I hate everybody you work with. I hate your parents. At least you were honest, David. That's good. That's very you good. Hate your, you should hate yourself. Okay. By the way, I have a podcast. I hope you listen to it. <laughs> At least. Look, all right. I would have done the same except without the judgment. Without the judgment. That 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 would have been the difference between a meditator like myself and and you. I I would have, I would have, and and I would also see. Here's the other thing, because when you start meditating, you think, well, only the meditators are the good ones, and then what are we going to do with the non meditators? When the fact is, when you meditate without judgment and you're in the present, you realize that we, as they say, are all in the same boat. David, that was master. I'm going to ask you a rude question. Sure. <laughs> Masturbation. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It, I'll just me, tell you what I what I know. What 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 I've heard. It seems to me masturbation mm -hmm. without cheating yeah. using your imagination. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, the kids today juice with the porn. Ah. Uh, I'm talking they're, about they're, you know, they're, they're using hamburger helper kind of thing. I'm saying, you know, you're juicing it. You know, if you have to look at if you're on the Internet, that's juicing. But good old fashioned 
masturbation. Yeah. Where you use your imagination. And I hate to be rude here. Yeah. Like isn't, my God, that like, better, isn't that better than meditation? Like, because, because with meditation, it's self-love. Masturbation, where you're, as long as you're not juicing, is <laughs> loving outside of yourself, fantasizing <laughs> about somebody else. Isn't that better than meditation? I think I won no, this. Party. I would never. I would never I, compare I, I, meditation I, and masturbation. Uh, what? Dick. I would never compare meditation and masturbation. I think masturbation done properly, without juicing, without cheating, mm. is better than meditation. Uh, you know, actually, I I would beg to differ. Uh, now, you know, when you're married and you, know, you have a... Beg, beg. But well, wait, when you have a healthy uh, sex you life... you beg to differ, go ahead and beg. No, no, no. That's just a... That's just oh. one of those rhetorical phrases, oh. you know, like like the Gosar debate, just a rhetorical thing, okay. you know. I, I no, I I just think that uh, meditation is uh, now. Seeing now, David, you, you you made me lose my thought. I, think I, I just meditation is a sin, and I think masturbation done properly without juicing, using your imagination. I think God wants you to masturbate and not meditate because it's a sin. To, it is a sin. Hang on, for oh, one David. Hang on, hang on. I think, I think, I think meditation is a gutter tradition. I think it's going into yourself, mm. and it makes you makes you narcissistic and self serving, oh. and you're oh. cutting out. It's you cut off the world. David, David, meditation just means you are here. You are present, whether you're doing it to yourself or not. You, you are. Masturbation is hopeful. You're thinking it's positive. Masturbation is the future. Hmm. It's kind of messy it's too. Thinking it's, masturbation is forward thinking. As I long as you're doing it, excuse me, let me just say this. This is very important to me. Yeah, yeah. As long as you're not juicing, as long as you're not cheating and using <laughs> juicing. electronic equipment or magazines, as oh. long as you're using your mind. I thought juicing meant using extra lube or something, but I guess that that's not what you mean. That's that I'd expect that from somebody, a <laughs> meditator. You're you're a meditator. I, I am. A, look, David. I'm telling you, don't knock it. Gutter. It's, don't it's knock wrong. it. Meditation, I think, has saved my life. It has saved well, my you know life. What? It may not be a life worth saving. <laughs> I, I think you need to switch to masturbation done properly without electronic equipment. I'll take that on under advice. I, I am utterly convinced, and then we'll move on to yeah. more important things. Yeah. I think people who meditate. Yeah. Go ahead. Are inferior to people who masturbate. I think it's, well, you know, actually I found out that you can meditate. You don't have to sit on a couch to, to meditate. You can stand up and meditate. So I'm a stand up meditator. You can have your eyes open. So you can do that with masturbating. Okay, let's see. Well, let's do a can't side by side comparison. Eyes open. Can't masturbate with your eyes open. Uh, that's why I'm not allowed in Milwaukee. <laughs> they got you in milwaukee huh okay they, won't let, they got me in milwaukee for masturbating <laughs> with my eyes open but closing your eyes and masturbating i think is more spiritually correct is superior to meditation all right i'll try that without judgment next time i meditate we have a split screen here yeah we'll, we'll try right now why don't we both close our eyes <laughs> Okay. And we will have a competition between a meditator and a masturbator. And <laughs> <laughs> okay, oh, David, look, like, I'm serious about this meditation stuff. This oh, loving kind. This I think you're immoral, and I think I think you're teaching people the wrong thing. I think it's so loving strange. kindness masturbation. Oh, I said loving kindness meditation has really saved my my life, and and in fact. The, medit the the psychotherapists have discovered they've discovered mindful uh, self compassion. They've discovered that a guy named Christopher Germer. What is, the, well, I, mean, I can't think of anything more self compassionate than masturbation. Well, all right. Uh, I mean, we're talking about uh, I'm talking about formal meditation. I mean, I guess but, I guess in in you know settings, you can. I, have uh, you know what? I guess we could agree. 
I, I guess we can disagree to agree. I, I guess. disagree to agree and move on. All tell, right. me about the, tell me about uh, ALDEF, Asian <laughs> Legal Defense and Education Fund. Look, this I is. I did win that argument. I, I did. It's not an argument, David. It's, won. It's, it's not. No, come on. I'm morally it's, superior to you. Well, I mean, look, I, I, let's, let's put it this way. Um, when you're a meditator, you learn that, that, that you have to love your love love everyone it's it's like you get to the point where you can love even the people you disagree with and and that's one of the things that's why I, you know my columns used to be called emil amok and now i'm emil amok uh you know post meditation now i'm 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 more i'm i'm more controlled i i think about things uh a, a slightly more and I, I just I find myself my I find my life is so much better now that I've discovered meditation and you know that I, when I was at when I went to school my freshman roommate was in a TM transcendental meditation which I thought was absolute crock and I didn't believe it and now here it is more than forty years later and I'm I'm arguing with you uh, the uh, you know on the superiority of meditation to masturbation went back in freshman year in college clearly masturbation was superior. okay okay anyway aldef they're joining forces with latinx with uh african americans they're fighting this thing in oh my God, gone, gone. They're, they're fighting um you're gone uh my small gong my big gong remains my yeah. small gong is his past but uh they're they're joining the forces. for us pardon me will you hit your gong for us uh, this is a gong that I just hang and I just like rub nicely. Mm. Pass it, my guy. Hey, uh, so anyway, at, at Aldef, they've joined forces in Texas because all the gains in the last election that showed Asian Americans rising, uh, they've just gerrymandered the heck out of all the districts now, so that they've they've taken a, a district like in uh, parts of Houston. There's an area called Sugarland. Uh, rising asian population there they've connected it they've you know into these districts uh with a rural district about 100 miles away so that it negates any kind of uh any kind of uh, you know positive gain from the elections and so what, what we have is the systematic disenfranchise of asians there plus the disenfranchise uh, disenfranchisement of uh, latinx african americans all through these uh, gerrymandering um attempts uh by the by by the texas legislators but you know you can gerrymander by 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 party what you can't do is gerrymander by race and they have and, and this is why you have the voting rights act this and is why and luckily republicans and democrats have the same are on the same page when it comes to race well <laughs> you know the thing is uh the, the the importance of texas is that's going to be a big battleground and what's happening is aldiff went down there to argue and now the the court battle will begin uh the the current uh, maps that they have now that are just you know just a joke uh probably will be allowed to take you know to take hold for the next for the next for the midterms they're trying to to to, to block it that's sort of the next battle um we'll see if, if they could block it but if they don't it could take uh, years before the the lines are are uh, contested successfully and redrawn but that's what's at stake in texas and of course you know every every place in america uh the the redistricting battle uh continues uh in new york there's some uh some battles in california that they've got uh jackie spear who said she's going to not run and she's going to retire her, her her district is now um includes uh, parts of san francisco parts of chinatown goes all the way down to the peninsula and uh you know everyone wherever you live i i found out about this great website called uh it's called oh god i forget i i had it down here but it's it's soft in the brain from all that meditation it's it must be representable.org go to right. representable.org and and you can uh it's a tool that you can use and to engage in the uh 
uh, the, the redistricting battle wherever you are. Because, you know, you may not live in Texas, but rest assured, there is some kind of redistricting battle going on. We have, so what, I mean, by, by, for those of us, including me, who don't understand this stuff, every 10 years we do a census, and the result of the census is a redistricting where some states, there are 435 congressional seats that have to be split out yeah. over 50 states. And Washington, I guess the Census Bureau, working with the Commerce Department, allocates, they look at the, the census and they say, okay, we're gonna split the 435 seats. Uh, I think New York is losing a seat. Texas yes. is gaining. California is going to gain. California is losing. California is going to lose a seat. Yeah. 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 But, and, uh, and what about having more Congress people? What about getting rid of the Senate? Some people, I don't believe the Constitution dictates the number of Congress people. I think yeah. we've I just. Don't, I don't know, but that's, that's always been an issue about, you know, how can a senator from Delaware have uh, the the equal you know vote to say no, i'm uh, talking about more congress people oh, more can, congress people how can jackie spear yeah. do a good job representing five hundred thirty-five thousand people what about breaking it down making it smaller and like every twenty-five thousand people every twenty-five thousand citizens gets it's a, a representative you know we'd have to remodel the house of representatives yeah, you'd have to like um, maybe put in, um, you know, like a like a bonus room, bonus room right. down, or a kids room or something, and then. But no, I you know th these kind of reforms are good, but you know the best the best ideas come up from the bottom up, from the people, from that's why tools like the the one that I was uh, you know talking about repre representable dot org you know, are, are good tools to have. And then you can play with the maps and then you can make a case before your, uh, before right. the different committees. Uh, there's one up here in California that I was going to go to. I, you know, but. Well, let's move on because we have, we have yeah. limited time and you, yeah. you, you wanted to talk about Paul, go Paul, Congressman Paul Gosar, yeah. one of the most reprehensible human beings on the face. Tru truly, of truly. Planet. You know, I had his no family, idea how his family hates him. Am I, did I read right that you're not so sure that the censure, I kind of agree with you that maybe the censure, I kind of think. So what, that the censure is what? Uh, that it's not going to do what it's supposed to do, that it's not strong. He reposted enough. the video. Yeah. But I know. He, he, he reposted the video and. He's summing his nose everything. Who cares if he's kicked off the committee? More time for him to go off and to be uh, more racist and, you know, appeal to the base and, and you and know, more time to raise money. It's quid pro quo or, or, you know, they will get even yeah. when they when they lose the House next year. Kevin McCarthy has said, we're going to do the same thing that you've done to Marjorie Taylor Greene yeah. and uh, Paul Gosar. See, this and is Steve King. Steve King. Uh, they they stripped the Republic, but they're going to start stripping. Uh, they said Maxine Waters. Who yeah, they they would strip her of her committee assignments because she said we need to get more confrontational. It's almost like um, you know, like in court when you get rid of a when 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 lawyers get rid of. A, potential jurors they use these peremptory challenges then maybe you can challenge people on committee and like if, if if the republicans ever get control they can they can challenge people off and they can you know they can negate the seniority aspect of congress because that that's always been the key and why you want to keep your old guy in there because the old guy will rise to chair a chairperson and that's where the power is but now you get rid of the old guys and everyone is sort of like you know freshman sophomore junior types uh it's more of a free-for-all if you use, start using peremptory challenges to uh, to make it interesting, not interesting, but just it's actually more chaotic. It's it's certainly the post-Trump kind of politics, and that's why I really think that the what the Gosar 
uh, debate shows is how we just have, we really don't have debate. We have a kind of humorless kind of lying that we that we put out in public. I mean, to, to hear what the ghosts are, people are saying, oh, he's just joking. Oh, there are other things to talk about. I mean, it's just like so disingenuous. It was like, we cannot tell, We can, you know, that should have been like a 400 to zero vote to get rid of Gosar, right? Instead, it was like 230 to 210 or something well, like that. It should be a, a 435 to zero vote to pass a, a social safety net bill that comes in at $3.5 trillion and doesn't provide a $240 billion tax cut to the richest 10% in this country. I mean, it was really a distraction. The ghosts are censorship. While they're trying to cut... They're, they have time to censure Paul Gosar, who should be... He should you know, be censored. He, he but, should be censored. But, you know, if, you know... But it should have just taken... Less of a threat. He'd be less of a threat if the Democrats passed Build Back Better at yeah. $3.5 or $6 I, billion. Look, dollars. I, I agree with you. I, I just think that it should have been not like a two-hour type of knockdown dragout type thing that exposed you know the divisions in congress it should have just been um like a 20 minute god we all agree that paul, paul gosar is more than just a creep paul gosar is you know to to uh, is you know condone uh, or to say that he's just joking when he's really condoning violence against a, a fellow member of congress against a sitting president of the united states that's look if if you or I did it, we we'd be they we'd have a knock on the door from the FBI, right? I mean, this should be Congress. We're getting to the point where our rhetoric uh, has to be very earnest and very straightforward. You know, you're a humorist. I like to say some jokes sometimes, but we we cannot have the double entendre in politics. We just it's this single entendre time. Tell us what you mean. There's no joking. You want to kill Acacio Cortez? You want to kill her? It's not a joke. You're not like a have an anime head or your head on an it anime. It's a form of intimidation, as Pelosi pointed it's out. Violence, especially directed towards women, is a real thing. Jokes. It's intimidation. It right. is intimidating. Women and minorities. I mean, this is the thing. Right. When I, I I talk to my Asian American audience, I say, look, uh, you think it's just a joke if you're conservative and want to want to support Gosar? Well, just look at the look at the hate crime stats of the last year against Asian Americans, up seventy nine percent. Look at that stop API hate uh, you know survey, nine thousand instances, and in, you know during the pandemic uh, of transgressions against you know, Asian Americans. And so, you know, we can't, we're beyond jokes. You know, we, and you know, it affects everyone uh, in like comedians and you know, look, you can joke all you want in a comedy club because those guys are not passing policy. They're not political leaders. I'm all for comedians having their say to, to joke around. Politicians, serious people, judges on uh, key cases like the Kyle Rittenhouse trial. I mean, this is what I was saying. Serious people shouldn't aren't allowed to joke anymore. Serious right. people should not joke. And and we always we know serious people want to be funny. Serious, serious people, they want to crack wise. Hey, look, I'm, I'm, you know, no, you're serious. You're a congressman. You're a leader of uh, your party. You're, uh, you know, talk show host. So you can crack wise if you're a talk show host. Yeah, you, you know, if you're podcast guy you can crack some jokes but you know if you're if you're passing policy we're in this era of earnestness no joking no no double entendres all single entendre time you know say what you mean that's the the kind of political rhetoric era we're in yeah yeah well tiger king is back yeah tiger king I, too I, I, tiger king too the Tiger King is behind bars, I thought. He is. He's still behind bars, but he could still apparently uh, write a book. Uh, Simon Schuster's publishing it next week, I think. He can still go on, like, all the dating sites, and they can still, like, uh, have contests to see who, who wants to marry the Tiger King. I mean, this really? is what's, yeah, this is what's happening now. And uh, so he, the Tiger King 2 thing came out. I talked to the PETA lawyer today, and I and I said, can can he... 
can he make uh, any profit off of his crime? Because he's he's off for you know conspiracy to commit murder or hiring a hitman essentially, and that's why he's serving uh, the, the the major amount of his time. But he's also in there for violations of the Endangered Species Act, which is because of PETA. P PETA's uh, I don't want to say creative use of the law, but they did look at the law and they looked at a way that they can enforce it and that's really why joe exotic is behind bars that and and the you know that that murder thing but if if you watch if you watch uh, tiger king and have any sympathy what for, is behind bars for plotting the murder of bear what's your name is uh, it carol baskin carol ba baskin yeah plotting and, and the they, murder they had of carol yeah, baskin carol right. baskin and carol baskin uh, they had they had the hitman on on tape, right? And, and, and hitman saying, "Yeah, I got you know Joe gave me this. We're going to kill her, and they, they were going to." Uh, uh, but she's still alive. Yeah, she's still alive. So it's just but attempted. Her husband, died, but she had a husband who died oh, under mysterious circumstances. They they are making a big deal in episodes two and three of Tiger King that maybe Carol Baskin had something, I don't know, has had something to do with her husband's disappearance. I think that's a red herring. Uh, I think that the... And where does Peter stand on red herrings? Uh, well, we're vegan, you know, we're vegan. You know, you know why it's called a red herring? Oh, why is it called a red herring? It's yeah. used to, dis red herrings are used to distract dogs. Oh, of course, of course. That. That's why you mentioned it just about as a... I was going to make another point about you know the 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 great thing the great thing about the Endangered Species Act it's never been used quite the same way and because of it more than uh, 350 animals were saved from these guys and essentially the roadside zoo business that Joe Exotic and all his cronies who are in this uh, in in the film Tim Stark uh, Jeff Lowe they've all been taken down. Uh, and they owe hundreds of thousands of dollars to PETA in terms of uh, 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 court costs. So, uh, you know, it was an it was an effective thing for the animals. Watch it for the entertainment. Don't get any sympathy for Joe Exotic. I don't think I've spoiled it for anybody. But uh, I mean, but people people for some reason love J the Joe Exotic story. And a good thing for PETA because when. Uh, PETA mentions anything in a press release or or does something a lot of people glom onto it and will listen pay attention to it because because of celebrity the way celebrity right. works in America so in in some really strange perverted way it's been good for the animals Joe Exotic hey you know new, we have been, a new song we have to wrap it up yeah. we have a new song from that I want to play for you from Professor Mike Steinell entitled pig for love pig for but, love yes i i want to apologize to pigs i've been calling certain people pigs and that's unfair to pigs isn't it well it, it is david and uh, you know i i do not eat pigs but you know you know that i'm slightly older than you and yet you do the side by side and you say how can the meal do that well i don't eat pig meat but i eat pig mint that's that's what I you do. eat pig mint pig mint yes, pig yes. Mint. Uh, but we don't eat pigs are beautiful creatures hey pigs are beautiful loving. creatures yes they're loving creatures and i i they i, I, great, I love pigs. They, they make great pets and they know they're about to be slaughtered yes that that is it's it's terrible i I live next to some pig farms. It's terrible. It's terrible. I pig pig farms, dairy farms. I hate them. Hate them. Yeah. Hey, hey, David. I know we got to go, but but Bacon. I saw after I saw Tiger King on Netflix. After I saw Tiger King, I saw Love Hard with Jimmy O Yang, and I just want to say that for us normal Asian guys, Jimmy O Yang, he's the Simone Liu. Uh, for normal Asian guys, I mean, you know, Simon Liu. Should I gonna, watch Love Hard? Uh, I think he he should because number one, the love interest in Love Hard is a very uh, fetching um, a woman from, I think she's from Belarus, uh, but she has that kind of like you know Russian Jewish kind of look to her, 
and uh, sort of like my first wife and uh, no and uh very attractive and uh and she does not fall for this asian guy at first but she does ultimately well no i'm not going to spoil it i'm not going to spoil it for people jimmy o yang has to, you know he's got to he's got to work it but he's a funny guy do you know him have you seen his, his uh, He's he's a funny he's a funny I like look I like rom coms I'd rather watch a rom com than a Marvel a Marvel uh, character right right well I I'm gonna watch it I've been watching the first twenty minutes of movies on Netflix oh you give twenty I give it ten I only give it ten you give it twenty that's good well, I time it because the fir- it's the first the first twenty minutes is the first act of the movie where everything is set up. So if you see the first 20 minutes, you pretty much know what the third, how they're going to resolve the third act. And that the second act is just going to be a lot of punching and car crashes and people (laughs) screaming at one another. But if you see the first act of every movie, you pretty much know. You know where it's going. It's, yeah. And it's it's always going to end up the opposite. Like if people are, are sad at the beginning, they'll usually end up happy at the end. Right. Oh, they're, they're happy. Yeah, they're, they're, there's the arcs that it's, but that's not to take anything away from screenwriting. Those are that's yeah. that's it's how just, buildings are built. Those hey, are it's, just, it's just, Aristotle's poetics for goodness sakes. Exactly. It's it's just the poetics. Is a great man falling from heights. That that you can't have a tragedy. You can't have a, a play unless there's some kind of emotional movement. Heights. And, you're not talking about the Lin Manuel Miranda failure, right? No, but if you if you watch any any TV drama, yeah, every scene is a negative to a positive or a positive. So you watch the character; they're either in a negative or positive emotional state, and when the scene is over, the charge will change from either negative to positive or positive to negative. Yeah, you can do it mechanically. It's impermanence. It's another thing that I learned from meditation. When you when you watch TV tonight, yes. whatever you're watching, watch the character, the beginning of the scene. Yeah. The character will either be happy or sad, which may, if they're happy, that means the scene ends. They're either nervous or, you know, whatever. They even even out. when they, even if it's like an Asian thing. I guess I guess it doesn't matter the race. Hey, even in porn, even no, in porn, even in porn. Yeah, yeah, I thought so. Except, I, I do a lot of. Uh, you have to, you watch porn with a stopwatch. I knew you did. I, you're the guy who watches porn with a stopwatch. I make. Uh, they're, going. They're, they're going. I make Christian snuff videos. <laughs> Christians. Fun for the whole family. <laughs> Emil, <laughs> follow Emil Guillermo on what was the joke I did? I used to do the jo- the joke. Was I the reverence here? Produce family friendly snuff videos, no cursing. Okay. You know, the, the, the Reverend Barry Lynn, who sat on the Mies Commission. He's like, with a good church. I, I love those. Uh, church of God, right? Right, right Barry? He's a God he's of a, church. He, He's an ordained minister, an ordained minister in the United Church, United of, Christ. Church of Christ. Oh, it's Church not, of Christ. Oh, well, not he's God. It's, it's not the God. Church of Christ. The Church of Christ is the most conservative <laughs> denomination throughout the South. Oh, I used it? to testify, and yeah. there'd be somebody from Alabama there would go, uh, this United Church of Christ, this doesn't sound like uh, the Church of Christ where I live. <laughs> So wait, what is uh, you? What is? Do you know my friend Madison Shockley? Of course, he's of course. a he's a he's a a buddy of mine. Yeah. Oh, is he? Well, say is hello. He heir to the transistor fortune, the Shockley, the guy who did the. No, <laughs> no. no, he's not. I can assure you that he's not, and I don't know him. You he's know what? Just, I just realized. As well as Emil does. Hang on for one second. I just had a flashback. I used to answer phones in the newsroom at KRON in San Francisco, where I met Emil. And one of the callers was Shockley, who invented the transistor. And he was, he is, I think he's gone. He was an inveterate racist, right? I I think you're right. He used to call the station to complain about the mixing of the races on the Uh, show. You know, 
And this is now this is the truth. I'm being serious. I'm, I'm being, being serious. serious too. During that era, I used to get hate mail. I know, it, I wrote it. It, oh, it was you. Well, I it was printed. I, I no, it, it, I used to get these postcards from people's just saying these nasty things about Filipinos and this is in in very liberal San Francisco in the 80s. Anyway, I'm just right. saying this confession to my uh, my pastor here. His name was William Bradford Shockley Jr., graduate of Stanford. He lived in the Bay Area. He got a Nobel Prize in Physics in 1956. And he was a professor of electrical engineering at Stanford, right? So he knows about that uh, thing about the positive, negative uh, character. Well, hang on for a second. So, you know, KRON San Francisco, it covered the Bay Area. Stanford was part of the Bay Area. And it, when he was calling into the station to complain about you of and course. some other people, he was one of the chief proponents of eu eugenics. Yeah. He was a big eugenics guy and uh, taught at Stanford. And he used to call the news the newsroom and I would talk to him. And did you say, well, what did you tell him? Did you say, well, we'll get rid of that Filipino guy? I, I'm, I'm not making this up. I swear to you, he used to call and complain. He had, a, he, some, somebody gave him the hotline number for the newsroom. And I used to, it's an honor to speak to you, Professor Shockley. Thank you for the transistor, which is slightly larger than your brain, Professor Shockley. I'm not making that up. I talked to let, Professor Shockley about eugenics. Let me discuss, let, let me reflect for a second about Madison Shockley, who is not a eugenic supporter. Right. Not very, connected. very progressive African-American pastor. But we flew him to Washington to do a show that you, you can possibly still find this on videotape called Everything You Always Wanted to Know about separation of church and state, but was afraid to ask, of course, the play on the book in the Woody Allen movie. And uh, he, he was talking about um, counseling, about choice, about women's reproductive freedom. And uh, it was, he was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And uh, that was, uh, I haven't watched that for a long time, but it, uh, Peter Coyote, of course, uh, who's an actor well-known actor and a wonderful voiceover person uh, emceed the thing. And we had wonderful collections of people. Kevin Bacon and his brother played, said a few words, and uh, it, was, it, it was marvelous. It was a very, very polished night. But uh, yeah. Madison went, was terrific, and uh, I've always respected his work for progressive causes. Yeah, we he... We were classmates. Really? Yeah. And uh, he was on the football team that uh, I wasn't good enough to make. But he, he was, yeah. <laughs> he, he, uh, he's, he's a good guy. And we just recently connected again within the last, uh, within the, during the pandemic. Yeah. During the pandemic, sure. we connected again. Anyway. By the yeah. way, James Watson, who with Crick discovered or invented, I'm not a, biologist did he did, they, did watson and crick invent dna or discover it what? watson and crick won the nobel for their invention of dna i believe they didn't invent it <laughs> i mean my <laughs> wife's not DNA. here but i mean she she'd probably never come back if she thought <laughs> you thought that people invented <laughs> dioxynucleic Acid or I'm, pretty, it I'm pretty sure the double <laughs> helix did not exist until Watson and Crick invented no. DNA. No. I'm pretty sure. Uh, I think it's Watson who turned out, he's not as bad as Shockley, but pretty racist. Kind of lovable, and not because of the racist, kind of like he's just twisted. And Watson turned out to, you know, started studying the intelligence of people's races and believed it was tied to their DNA. He went off the, the deep end, but he's, uh, 
I think it's Watson and not Crick, the two men who got the uh, the, no, the no. Nobel Prize. It's, it's pronounced the Nobel Nobel Prize, the Nobel Prize, right? The Nobel Prize for inventing DNA. Can we get your uh, wife, the doctor, to come back? <laughs> yeah. Um, All right. Yeah, she. Um... Uh, she, she got a lot of approval from her appearance last week. She was great. She was great. Yeah, that's what people told me. And right. I agreed with her. But yeah, I've been a lot longer. Yes. And, I, um, but I even, <laughs> yeah. But let's, let's say goodbye to Emil. Okay. Bye, See you guys. Bye, Emil bye Barry. Emil is the bye. host of, hang on, let me get the, Emil is the host of PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. They drop a new podcast every Wednesday, I believe. He's also a columnist for ALDEF, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. Follow him on Twitter at Emil Amuk. And I watch your live stream on, on Twitter. On Yeah, at Emil Amuk. Also on amok.com. Thank you for doing that. Thank you. Thank you for doing it. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, yes. Also I, on I, my YouTube channel. Yeah, this was this was great. I once again disrespected you, uh, but this time I think you were wrong about meditation. No, meditation's good. Medi no, meditation, bad, bad. I, I want <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Joining us in Washington D. Are you in Washington D.C. Yes, or are you in time with the grandchildren? Yes, climate change has gotten so bad that. This water you see outside is literally in my backyard. I thought religion had gotten so lucrative that you were coming to us. <laughs> that I moved. That you moved to Malibu. <laughs> let, no, me give I, you proper, uh, let me give you a proper introduction. Please. Oh, we didn't play Pig for Love. Oh, no. For our PETA people. We'll play it later. Uh, Professor Mike Steinel wrote Pig for Love for me. Well, uh, the Reverend Barry W. Lynn is a member of the Supreme Court Bar. He's a, an attorney. He's dedicated his life to both religion and separating church and state. And uh, for 25 years, he ran Americans United for Separation Church and State. And he is also an attorney. And his wife is better than he is. And we wish his wife were here instead. She was great. She really was. Uh, we talked about. You know about what she that. is doing right now instead of being here? What? It, it, she and a bunch of other progressive women in healthcare knit. Yes. They knit for an hour and a half. They, we call it clicking needles. They call it, you might call it clicking needles, but they actually make stuff. See, some people just like they make noise, they click stuff. And I, I click imagine needles. that's as far. Could you knit if you had to? Could you sew? No, but I can shoot heroin. That's where I got the term from. <laughs> I wouldn't right. know. I could not you don't knit. know anything. That's okay. But knitting hey. is very good for. It's good for the mind. Yeah, I, I'm sure it is. Yeah, it's it's good. Yeah. And where did you celebrate your fiftieth wedding anniversary? At a Black Lives Matter protest here in Washington. Yeah. So let's talk about uh, the Black Lives Matter protests. Uh, there was a protest in Kenosha last year after a police officer in Kenosha uh, shot, I believe his last name was Blake, an African-American, shot uh, Jacob Blake, I think his name was. Jacob Blake. Shot him seven times, uh, three times in the side, four times in the back, because Jacob Blake was carrying a knife and getting into his car. And he's now paralyzed, although he may be walking uh, next year, they say. He had several warrants out, I believe, uh, for perhaps domestic abuse. And so the right wing has portrayed him worthy of seven shots. Let, let's, before we get to the 
protests that ensued after he was shot seven times. Let's just review. A police officer shows up, a white police officer shows up, shoots somebody seven times, and is exonerated, feared for his life. What's wrong with that? Um, um, police officers do have a right to use deadly force, that is to kill somebody under certain circumstances. Those are not any circumstances that related to this murder. This was murder. Uh, the fact well, that he, someone, he didn't die. He didn't die. Well, no, he, he, he attempted. He attempted. You fire to seven shots, right? When, when you shoot somebody seven times, you couldn't care less if the person lives or dies. But you don't have the right to take an action. You don't even have the chance to do the first shot. If all you know, and it's not even clear these police officers knew anything about the warrants for his arrest, they might have. It doesn't matter what they're for. It doesn't matter if it's domestic violence or marijuana position. You don't have a right on the basis of no effort on his part to come after you with a weapon of any kind to shoot somebody. You have a right to say, stop. If the person doesn't stop, that doesn't give you the right to shoot that person, even if you're a police officer, not in any jurisdiction, and certainly not there. Unless you wanted him dead. In, in other words, Unless if you, you wanted him dead, him. or you didn't care. You didn't care, I mean, you felt his life was not worth the was bullet. Was not worth living, yeah, not yeah. worth retaining. Yeah. yeah. So it was despicable. And um, and, and he paid no, the the... the officer is still on duty i think he is yeah i think he mm -hmm. is yeah right and of course this is what led to the protests in kenosha that i know you right we'll get to that in a second yeah. you and i have okay. we have a little time here and jacob blake the victim in the shooting was vilified by the right wing bad guy they immediately did to him what they did to george floyd bad guy bad guy, bad guy. deserved to die Right? Yep, that's, yep. that's, that's, that's their, their whole, whole modus operandi. And it's it's endemic and it's it goes on to this day. Whenever there's any kind of uh, police misconduct, you never hear the people in QAnon or even on the Fox News channel blaming police officers for much of anything. Like you and Emil were talking about, if you if you can't get more than two and a half, there's one guy, one Republican voted present at the Paul Gosar vote last night. I mean, if you, if you can't say the threats made directly against specific people, even if they're in the form of a cartoon, that that's not so reprehensible that at a minimum it deserves censure, you know how bad things really are. And of course, the two people uh, who did vote uh, to censure him, Kitzinger and uh, and uh, and Cheney. I mean, uh, I get the Cheneys all mixed up. What's it, who, what's what's Cheney's first? I I couldn't care less. It's either uh, uh, it's either Mary or no, it's what? Not. wait. Anyway. The Cheney Kitzinger people, it didn't even take their two votes to censure. And so when people were getting all excited last night on Twitter and Facebook about these great noble Republicans, all I could say was, you know, you don't get to be characterized as a hero or a heroine if you only do an occasional thing that's right. Maybe that's that doesn't make you as reprehensible as the all the other Republicans, but it certainly doesn't put you into the next, you know, edition of Profiles and Courage. But that's one of the things we're going to face. And one of the things before we end up, I want to talk about just briefly um, how CNN is almost guaranteeing that the Senate will flip yeah. to the Republicans next time. But let, well, let's, well, let's Yeah, let, let's talk about Kyle Rittenhouse, who, by the way, Florida Republican Congressman Matt Gates. Yeah. Did you hear about this? Yes. Said he would give Kyle Rittenhouse. He would give Kyle Rittenhouse. 
you make a great because Matt Gates admires anybody who can sneak a uh, 15 across state lines. Uh, all right. Tomorrow is 17. Hmm? The woman he trafficked was 17, not 15. Right, but Gates is impressed that of course. Kyle yeah. got a 15 across state line. Actually, he already had the uh, AR-15 at his friends in Kenosha. So let's... You know, we're all overwhelmed by all this information. Briefly tell me what uh, what happened. I Was it the third night of protests in Kenosha? What did Kyle Rittenhouse do? Well, uh, Kyle Rittenhouse, who uh, lived in Illinois, actually, um, did come in. He drove in. There's a, a mistaken assumption that his mother drove him, which turns out not to be true, although most people think They've heard in enough times that it must be true. Um, and he, his, his claim is all he was trying to do was be a protector of, of property and of possibly a protector of lives because he had watched the videos for the previous two nights and seen places were burned, uh, including a car dealership that was really ravaged. And he went to the car dealership, talked to the guy, and he said, I'm here to protect your property again. What's, what's left of it? And this is where everything spun out of control. And this is where, if you believe the defense, all he was doing was trying to protect property. And he didn't intend to shoot anyone. He didn't intend to kill anyone. It just happened because he was trying to defend himself from the attacks of the two people that he did in fact kill. The right. other people, other people say, no, 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 the prosecution, and I hate to even speak well of prosecutors because normally I don't do that. But I mean, the prosecutors in this case said, this is so clear, he provoked whatever happened. And now the endless debate, and, and speaking of red herrings, I mean, there's so many red herrings in this case. There's a 36 page set of, instructions from that kind of crazy judge, judge from hell, uh, Bruce Schroeder. And the, the jury is being allowed to take the instruction sheets home with them tonight. They're not sequestered. They're not sequestered? No, no, they're going home tonight. Are they allowed to watch the news? No, he told them you can't talk about it. You can't talk about this to anybody in your family. What usually you can't carry it with you. In a high-profile case like this, amazing. Is it unusual Most for the? Something we hang on, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry about that. Is it unusual for a jury to not be sequestered in a hotel and monitored to make sure they're not watching the news? This is pretty unusual, but it it, it, it comes on the heels of vast numbers of other unusual things and decisions made by this judge. And uh, I think it's safe to say that he has been very, very friendly to the defense. And, and he's a, at best, he's quirky. At worst, he's just a racist. And you can kind of prove the latter as least as well, easy. Let me ask you, let me, let me push back on that. Sure. Uh, he's a Democrat. He was Regist appointed by a Democrat. And I think he might have run for office as a Democrat. He's run something like every six years. He was appointed in 1983. He was then had to run for re-election in 1984. He won. But as a Democrat. As a Democrat, he's won every time. He rarely even has a, an opponent. I'm sure he's won okay. this time. You are a member of the Supreme Court bar. Yep. You're an attorney. Yep. When he instructed the prosecutors and the defense attorneys that that you could not call the two people Rittenhouse murdered. You couldn't refer to them as victims. You could call them possible looters, possible rioters, but you couldn't call them victims in defense of the judge in a self-defense trial. Isn't that uh, 
isn't that what judges order that you can't refer to the dead as victims in a self-defense trial which this is well he he, he claims that he always gives this instruction and there are other judges who do that. That alone doesn't speak to his racial animus. But a lot okay, of- Okay, so hang on for one second. I, look, look, just, just, just because I loathe Kyle Rittenhouse, and, you know, and I loathe what happened. I loathe AR-15s, I loathe guns, I loathe the people who, the, the, the Proud Boys he partied with, that guy Pierce, who raised money and then kept it for Kyle. I, I loathe the politicization of Kyle, I, everything about it. But I read the New York Post and I read the right wing and I just want to clear up some, I, I want to make sure that we're not guilty of getting things wrong because we're so right on this. So it's not unusual in a self-defense trial for the judge to say you can't refer to the dead as victims that's not unusual well, and i think it is unusual it's just not this is not the only judge who has ever said okay. that yeah okay uh he did not smuggle he did not transport an ar-15 across state lines correct it is I, there's a little ambiguity about that. He he clearly did not purchase it himself. His but he friend, already he had the AR-15 well, at a, in Kenosha at a friend's house where he lived part-time because his father lived in Kenosha. Yeah, but the so-called friend of his almost certainly did purchase it and then gave it to him. That's called a straw buy, and that's illegal. You're not supposed to be purchasing weapons of any kind, handguns, long guns, okay. uh, for someone who is not themselves eligible to obtain it. So you can't be a felon. You can't be someone who is underage as he was. He was only 17 at the time of these uh, shootings, these murders. Okay. And, uh, is yeah. it fair to say, because on this show, I keep talking about how last summer the, the Black Lives Matter protests were peaceful. The BLM people were peaceful. There were some, uh, maybe Antifa, maybe some agent provocateurs working for the police who were setting fire to things. But is it fair to say, I, I believe that, well, anyway, it's not what I, is it fair to say that there was a, a auto dealership where a hundred cars had been set on fire and that, yes, that, that is true. That, right. And I, I don't I don't think BLM had anything to do with that. I, I, I it wouldn't be unusual for the owner of the auto dealership to set fire to those cars uh, and uh, collecting the insurance, especially since car sales were significantly down because of covid. Right. Yeah, the but, price of cars, though, was dramatically higher, and it continues to this day. So I'm not sure that there was okay. much of an incentive to burn it down yourself. I don't, I've okay. not seen any evidence of that. But he was identified as somebody who was protecting property. The police, the, the people who owned the auto dealership, he was known as somebody who was on the side of law and order and property. Is that a fair statement? That's certainly a fair statement. So that when the police drove past him after the shootings, he had his hands up. They didn't think of him as an active shooter, even though he was one. He was identified as on the side. He was like a, a self-deputized auxiliary police officer, a police cadet. They kind of knew, they knew him. Well, certainly some of the police knew him. And uh, what they, one police officer they actually did him. testify. And they thanked him. What? Well, no, they didn't. Well, they didn't thank not, him. But not, not after the shooting, but they did. No. They shared water with him. They, right? Sure. Well, the, the, the officer that testified the other day said, look, we, there were so many people with guns 
And because you can open carry in the state of Wisconsin, I mean, we saw him, he had his hands up, so did a lot of other people. Of course, people quite properly when confronted by police uh, say, I'm, I didn't do anything, don't, don't shoot me. After a shooting, so if, if you see somebody with an AR-15 strapped around their neck and there's yeah. just been a shooting, you're going to raise your hands like Kyle Rittenhouse did and other people to, to say, hey, you know, don't shoot me. I'm, I'm not, you know, he wasn't necessarily turning himself in to the police when he raised his hands. No, the defense wants you to believe that he was willing to turn himself in. That's... That, that's their argument that he was willing this is all to prove what a wonderful guy he is if you weren't right. convinced by his razzy uh, eligible uh, performance in crying uh, not about what he had done but just about the fact that things are not looking good for him at the trial at the moment um he, he there are more arguments being made about this and it's coupled with the things that are just not really being talked about. People get so into the weeds on this. The 36 pages of jury instructions are almost incomprehensible even to those of us who attended law school and are members of the bar. It's so complicated. And this is what the, the prosecution was trying to avoid by just having Initially, they had seven charges, two relatively simple ones, the one curfew violation and the possession of this illegal gun. But the other, the five that are, those two were both dumped, but the, the other five that are left are very, very complicated. And it takes 36 pages to do it, particularly if you're a judge who's not very good at explaining instructions. And if you listened, if anybody listened to some of the his efforts to explain this verbally over the last few days, he can't, he was not even sure himself what he was instructing the jurors to consider. This is why he decides, I'm going to put it in down in paper. I'm going to tell them they can take it home with them. And um, this is why, you know, we end up with this at the 36 pages. I, I think it would be very unlikely. I, as you know, I'm not a huge fan of juries. I think they rarely understand what they're being told and that possibly we should think, but we don't think this big in this country, to move to a system where instead of random selection of juries, we should have professional jurors, people who's, who know enough about the law and who know enough about the process of the law to be able to make judgments. I may, I, disagree. I, I may disagree with you, but yeah. I, I think if you can't make the case, Albert Einstein said, if you can't explain your theory to a five-year-old, you don't have a, a theory. Then again, go explain yes. E equals MC squared to a 50-year-old, let exactly. alone a five-year-old. But I think if somebody, I think, uh, the specialization of criminal law with professional juries is a bad path. We should simplify the law, not make it more about experts interpreting it. So, but you know more than I do. No, I mean, so, I'm, I'm talk not, to I'm me not about. I'm to this. I'm just saying that juries, I, I just want to give an, an example. Here in Washington, unlike most other parts of the country, if you're a lawyer, you don't get on juries, not even civil juries. But there's so damn many of us here in this area that you can't exclude everybody who's an attorney or there wouldn't be enough people to serve on juries. So I was on a jury in what should have been a very, very simple case a few years ago involving a beverage truck that may or may not have injured a woman who was crossing the street. The, the process went on for two days because the lawyers were extremely interested in hearing themselves talk. The one jury instruction that was given by the judge in this a civil case, you cannot inquire or consider whether the beverage truck company had insurance, right? That's the big no-no, because the, uh, the thought is, if you know that somebody's going to get 
not have to pay it himself, going to be covered by insurance, then you're more likely to say, well, he did the wrong thing. So you get into the jury room. I didn't even disclose that I was an attorney. I wasn't, I didn't want to be the foreman. I didn't want to use any of the knowledge I had other than what was presented. The very first question asked by the pool of jurors was, I wonder if that beverage company had insurance. The very first question. And finally, you know, I said, and that one other piece, you know, the judge told us we can't consider that. But this is the one thing, the one instruction given by the judge. And people couldn't remember for 10 minutes that they weren't supposed to inquire on that very important question. So this is why my, my sense of juries is, shall we say, limited. And after my well, experience okay. being on one, it's worse. Okay, it's so I, worse. I don't, I, listen, uh, you are much more accomplished than I am, but uh, the, the problem is not with the jurors. The problem is with the judges, the prosecutors, and the defense attorneys. The, the solution isn't more attorneys. It's, it's fewer attorneys and more justice. So I would expect, yep. I understand you're an attorney, and you think your profession, which created the problem, can also solve it. What I'm saying is we need few, it, it, law, I think we can save the legal system with fewer lawyers, not more. I'm not gonna deny that, but, right. but, so, but, but, the, but remember, we're talking about one sentence instruction. Do not I, inquire about whether there is insurance coverage on this guy's truck company. One sentence. This is right. not complicated. And that is because lawyers, your profession, <laughs> one of your professions, yep. you are sent to law school to learn how to convince people that what the law says isn't what it means. <laughs> you you are you spend three years at law school learning to to create confusion. My my answer to the problem with juries is get rid of the lawyers. It's the lawyers who create that confusion. I, I think everything should be done by uh, people um, who are resigning from fast food restaurants uh, because they don't get paid enough. And maybe they should make the decisions. Whoa, <laughs> from, the, from the minister. Yeah. What would, yeah. No, the minister, <laughs> no ministers shouldn't do that. If Madison Shockley, who we talked about in the last segment with Emil, and I and uh, William Barber and a couple other ministers, if we took the time and the effort and were permitted to make decisions about these kinds of cases, there would be what you seek, and I seek, and I'm sure all of our listeners seek, justice would prevail. I am going to challenge you, Reverend. <laughs> to read Professor Catherine Liu's book, Virtue Hoarders. Professor Adnan Hussein, who isn't with us tonight, but he turned me on to Professor Catherine Liu. She wrote a book called Virtue Hoarders. And you just stumbled into my latest obsession because of her book. And that is something you're a part of. And that is the professional managerial class. And you, with all due respect, you are part of the professional managerial class mm -hmm. and you're hoarding virtue and <laughs> thinking that you're more equipped to mete out justice than an ordinary human being. And uh, I disagree. Okay. Yeah, well, I, I don't know how virtuous I am, but... Um... Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting theory. I haven't read that book. I've heard about it. I'm going okay, to pick it up. It's great. It, it's a polemic. It, it's it's yeah. a short read. Yeah. She, okay. she is. Uh, and anybody who has and who's accomplished anything like you and your wife have, you're, you're part of the professional managerial class. Uh, 
you're credentialed and in this country there's something i'm not trying to again i'm not trying to be respectful but there's something problematic about the credentialed people because they I, I get in all seriousness i'm not because i make no. jokes and i don't want to be disrespectful i just think it's an interesting conversation that you think jurors should be replaced by professional jurors and i i just think that's another credentialed class uh, no. are you going to tell wait a minute you. i don't want to get distracted much longer on this but are you going to tell me that what happened in the oj case was because of, of uh, what uh, the average juror made the right decision in that case? Where, where, like where do average juries in any kind of complex case necessarily come up with the right verdict? I mean, remember the average defendant, the average defendant is so far behind the eight ball because the power of prosecutors and the wealth and the power of prosecutors, the amount of money they spend just trumps, shall we say, any kind of legitimate defense being made by the average person who's charged with a crime. I'm okay, can I, can, I, can I answer that yeah. question? Yeah. Um, so, and again, I'm not trying to be disrespectful. In all seriousness, I would no, never. Because I, I do make jokes. Don't worry you know, about I, it. Just, but, uh, just okay. make your point here. Uh the O.J. Simpson trial was very important, more important than we uh, know. It took the invention of the iPhone or the discovery of the iPhone. I don't know. If, I know that I, we haven't established whether or not DNA was invented or discovered. Uh, I'm going to be open minded and say I don't know if the iPhone was invented or discovered, but it took let's say the invention of the iPhone, for us to discover why the jury in the O.J. Simpson trial decided what they did. And I think it behooves uh, all of us as Americans to look back at the O.J. Simpson trial and realize that the jury instructions meant nothing the same way the law means nothing. Anybody who's ever been uh, divorced or in a civil suit learns that the law means nothing. Donald Trump, the great thing about Donald Trump is he taught us all that the law means nothing. So these jury instructions mean as much as the law. Nothing. The law means nothing. It really does. If you've ever been, it's how much money you have, it's what your complexion is, it means nothing in this country. No, that's, that's totally wrong. Totally. I'm not trying to be disrespectful either. But when you, when you look, look at the D.C. jail here, the D.C. jail is, is a horrible, horrible place. It's so yes. horrible that one of the January 6th defendants has asked to get out of it because he wants to spend the rest of his time under house arrest because the conditions are so terrible. Right. And um, why are we discovering that now? That's this a is good point. Oh, I, I'll tell you why, because it's only in these high, high profile cases because of the average person in the D.C. jail who's in for a drug sale wrote a letter to the Washington Post and to the lawyer, a couple of lawyers, and, and would they cover that? Would they cover, if, if uh, there were hearings, John Brown- would, There were hearings, well, they held hearings last they week about they the did. conditions of the DC jails, which I don't think they were under a consent decree, but there have been complaints about the DC jails for decades, correct? Absolutely. Nobody did anything about it. Nobody cared until right. until the Republicans, the, the, the insurrectionists, started to get treated like a black man. Right? Well, yeah. But um, 
I don't believe that those hearings are going to result in any major change in the D.C. jail. Right. You're right. It's been going on for decades. Government white officials. White people are, got suddenly white people were being treated like black men. And yes. you had, you know, Matt Gates and Marjorie Taylor Greene yeah. and Louis yeah. Gohmert showing up outside yeah. that jail to complain about the, tr yes, the did. about did. the way the insurrectionists were all white were being treated. But the fact that these white people are being allegedly mistreated or mistreated in a way that's different than every African-American or Hispanic person that's in the DC jails doesn't mean there's gonna be any systemic change. I don't believe that this is how systemic change comes because there's so much racism in the District of Columbia by the people, people that run, run the run jails. jails. It, 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 you're not gonna change that even in the unlikely event that this one clown gets allowed to go home for Thanksgiving uh, right. under house arrest. So we should it, arrest more white people. We should arrest more. I, I'm serious. Of, well, no, we, but you look at how slow these prosecutions are going on January 6th. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's fascinating to watch all these Democratic members of Congress talk about how they're going to do this and they're going to do that. And we're, we're proceeding and we're going to file this and we're criminal right. contempt may occur for other people other than Steve Bannon. Steve Bannon is not anywhere except he, he's out. He's out on bail. He's out on bail and he's doing his daily radio show right. and he's able to promote this view. Well, you think the DC jail, you think the DC jail stinks now you put huh. Steve Bannon in. And then it's a super fun site. Let's go back to Kyle Rittenhouse, Let's Reverend. Yep. So he has an AR-15. Rosenbaum, or the, the one of the yeah. the twenty-six year old, uh, I think his name was Rosenbaum. Yeah, it was. Borderline homeless, borderline psychotic, attacks him. There is evidence that he, the drone footage shows that there was some kind of altercation between Rittenhouse and Rosenbaum, correct? Well, there was, but so what? An altercation, oh. unless it's dangerous and you perceive it correctly to be a threat to you, to your life or to your bodily integrity, it doesn't matter if you're confronted. If somebody comes up to you and goes, Feldman, you know, I, I, I was watching YouTube and I saw some of your old stand up and it really stunk. That's a confrontation. That doesn't give you the right to do anything. You can't I would punch say, him in mother, the mouth. mother, we can discuss <laughs> this at Thanksgiving. <laughs> no, but he, this is the, the whole decision in this case. And I am not optimistic about the prosecution well, I'm asking prevailed. about the law. So let yeah. me, let me, let's, because you are. Go so he felt that this Rosenbaum, I, I hope that's the name, but the guy he, the first it, guy he killed. Yeah, it's Joseph Rosenbaum. That this guy said, looked at Kyle Rittenhouse and, and pretty much said, where the hell do you get off pointing a gun? I'm going to take this gun from you. And Kyle Rittenhouse, just like George Zimmerman feared, and, and just like the uh, the other trial that's going on in Georgia, down in Georgia, that the gun was going to be taken away from him and used on him. That they brought th these three people who brought guns worried that their gun was going to be taken away from them and used on them. Is that a legitimate? Concerned that Rittenhouse, who brought the AR-15, was afraid that his AR-15 was now going to be taken away from him and then used on him. Is that a legitimate self-defense argument? I'm glad you asked that question because I wanted to read to you the instruction, the judge's instruction under Wisconsin law about this very point. And you can tell me I don't know if you're in the managerial class or not, but here's what it says. You tell me if this makes any sense. 
I even printed it out on that little okay. thing called the internet. Okay. Um, well, while you're looking, you know, yeah. in the Ahmed in the Ahmed Arbery case, yep. it's identical. This is an African American jogging, being harassed by an ex cop and his son, and there's a fight because they're pointing a gun at him. And I believe it was McMichael, either the son, one of them felt that his gun that he was pointing at uh, Ahmed Aubrey, uh, he, he was afraid that Aubrey was gonna take the gun away from him. The same way George Zimmerman was afraid that Trayvon Martin was gonna take the gun away from him and use him on him. I mean, this is, anyway, go ahead. No, but the Arbery case is, is very different. And I, I think the prosecution did such a, and again, it's embarrassing in some ways to speak as well of prosecutors, but they did a hell of a job over the last two days of absolutely destroying any semblance of a self-defense case uh, in the Arbery case. This one's more complicated, but listen okay, to ahead. this. Listen to this. This is the judge. This is the provocation, explanation of provocation. You should also consider whether the defendant provoked the attack. A person who engages in unlawful conduct of a type likely to provoke others to attack and who does provoke an attack is not allowed to use or threaten force in self-defense against that attack. However, if the attack which follows causes the person reasonably to believe that he is in imminent danger of death or great bodily harm, he may lawfully act in self-defense, but the person may not use or threaten force intended or likely to cause death unless he reasonably believes he has exhausted every other reasonable means to escape from or otherwise avoid death or great bodily harm. Now, that sounds like it's a double contradiction. It says right. you can't use a provocation defense if you were there, if you if you committed an, an act of a unlawful conduct, of a type likely to provoke attacks, unlawful conduct, the, the defense, one of the strongest points they could make is that, that Kyle Rittenhouse wasn't engaged in unlawful conduct. Because, why? Because the only unlawful conduct that, that could have been considered was that he was in unlawful possession of that AR-15. And that was a decision that the judge threw out. That count was thrown out. Uh, so earlier that's it. Weeks. So, the, yeah. so the judge, by throwing that count out, yep. skewed the jury instructions yep. to but, make. Yeah. But the the prosecutor knew that that statement was going to be made, that he was very likely to throw out that count. And under Wisconsin law, you actually can uh, you can say, judge, I think you're making a mistake and file an immediate appeal that the judge's understanding of the law was incorrect. And the, I think it probably was incorrect. It's not certain because the laws, you know, laws are written in such a way that they too are largely incomprehensible to, to not just to the average person, I mean, even to the people who write them. And, right. but, this, but this, this thing, but they should have well, appealed so, so, They should have okay. appealed it. Because this was the one thing. There's only a nine, I think it's a nine month maximum penalty if you're a minor in possession of an unlawful firearm. But right. it's something. And so when you have acquitted because of double jeopardy, prosecutors can't appeal the judge's ruling on that, correct? That or is they... correct. That is correct. It's Although, if, it, oh, if you're acquitted, oh. you're acquitted. But they could. But if he wasn't brought up on charges of illegal gun possession, they could try him again for that. Yes, they could. So but there could be an appeal to get him on. And yeah, if they could, him, but, but but remember, the prosecutors, the prosecutors have put all their eggs in these baskets of 
of uh, various degrees of homicide or reckless endangerment. And, and th those are very complicated, too, particularly in Wisconsin. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you yeah. are a lawyer, so you can help me with yeah, that. Thanks. If the judge dropped the illegal firearm possession charge, you're saying that the prosecutors, after he's acquitted, can come back and then try him for illegal possession without it being double jeopardy. That is correct, but they ain't going to do that because well, they lost I just wanted, this hang case. On, I, 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 hang on for one yeah. second. I just want to know what an aggressive prosecution could look like. If the judge then, if they, if, if that trial goes forward with a different judge on the illegal possession of a firearm, does that they can't bring charges again. Um, not on anything else. Not anything else, I no, see. No, and what is the federal else. government? Can the Justice Department step in? What what tools does well, the they, federal they could government? They can claim there's a civil rights violation, which uh, I, I think most reasonable people could make a case for that. But in this politicized the country with, with um, the difficulties of making these cases and taking these issues on in the first place, I don't believe you're gonna find the Justice Department in the event of a, an acquittal on these serious charges. Right. I don't think they're gonna go, well, let's reconsider this as a civil rights case. Because and now the civil courts, someone, the civil courts, you could sue Kyle Rittenhouse, the families yeah. can, when he gets acquitted. I'm gonna ask you about that in a second. Sure. They're free to put him on trial and bankrupt him. Get, get, get. Yeah, because he's such a wealthy guy now. Well, well they, can, mean, it, they can get a lean on future earnings. He's going to become, you know, he's going to get his own show on Fox. Well, after he becomes an intern for Matt Gates, yeah. Right. Um, right. But yes, um, yeah, you could, but, you know, the chances of him becoming a mega star in the media. I mean, he will make a lot of money and that's not to be dismissed because they, they will be able to, to seize those assets. But, um, you know, it's just, it's a thin read. I mean, w the parents of these deceased African-American people. Well, hang on, they, were, no, they were all white. He killed, he no, shot two. Yeah, no, well, yes, that's true, they, they were. Well, I, well I, I'm not sure about one person may have had some mixed race tendency. I don't know. You think Jew, the Jew Rosenbaum is, you're yeah, saying I think he's Jews probably mixed black. race? He's one of those guys that you see outside uh, claiming that the nation of Israel is all. Right. African okay. African no, all but right. I mean, but you, you could allege a civil rights violation, but it makes it more difficult because precisely because they aren't obviously African-American. And, and they do have other, both of them have had challenges, mental illness challenges. Yeah. One of them, Rosenbaum had recently, in fact, I think just that earlier that day, maybe, had gotten out of a psychiatric hospital and right. he was home. And they say, and the right wing maintains, just like Jacob Blake, there, that he deserved to be shot and killed because he may have been a child predator. So, they're, yeah. they're, they're demonizing Rittenhouse's victims, of saying you know, that we they, didn't lose anything. But, but, but and the, this is the thing, you know, lawyers and those of us in the managerial class, I mean, it, it, it bothers people to be pilloried even on Fox News, even by people we don't have any respect because once that starts, then what happened? You start getting calls in the middle of the night, people come and pick at your house, I mean, these are all the things, I mean, just my being a nice person, I mean, I didn't get as many, but I mean, people used to call my house when I'd be on Fox and they talk to my children and they'd say, you know, your father is going to hell. You know, your father is one of the worst people I ever met. And they yeah. never met me, but they saw me on television. The, these attacks are so brutal that it takes quite a person to be willing to go after you know, you and Emil were talking about the use of the Endangered Species Act in the, uh, the uh, Joe Exotic case. 
And you do have to be creative sometimes when you use the law. But this is not a Justice Department, frankly, that seems to be very interested in creativity. Right. Maybe they eventually get around to doing the right things, but we're running, really running out of time for them to do the right things in a meaningful way. And, right. and if, if they were to charge, uh, if they were to go through this scenario you posited a couple of minutes ago and file a civil rights charge and find a way to make this appear to be a civil rights violation and you imagine they'd be absolutely pilloried right. by all the right-wing media. And that's what counts because so many people get all of their news and all of their information from an increasingly right-wing media. Or, I mean... They're going to take it. Yeah, I mean, the analysis, the legal analysis that you've just done is so far superior to anything you're going to see on CNN or MSNBC. I mean, the depths of your knowledge and it and uh and thank you for that how do you how do you see this playing out how do you w w there's still not there's still no verdict in in no. kenosha what do you think is what are we going to look at and because the victims i think were were white what kind of reaction to a, a not guilty verdict are we looking at? The, the National Guard are on high alert. Schools are closed in Kenosha in anticipation of a, a bad reaction or maybe not so bad, or I mean, maybe. Well, yeah, I think um, in the Arbery case, I think there will be that will be a successful prosecution at a reasonably high level. But in this case, I think the best that's going to happen is a hung jury. And if there's a can hung take, jury, yep. can, what does that mean? You can be tried you again? Can, you can be tried again. Yep. That's and the, these, these prosecutors ought to do that. I don't think there's going to be a complete acquittal, not guilty of anything. I just don't see it. I don't see how these people, remember there's only one African-American juror who happened to get selected in that peculiar, not absolutely, didn't bother me as much as a lot of people in the social media of, of picking your jurors out of a, a raffle basket. Right. But but I- How unusual is it to hold the trial in a town? Was it held in Kenosha? I think so. Shouldn't it have been held in a in another city? Wouldn't that have been? Well, that I mean, the defense uh, talked about that possibility, but um, but I mean, they they clearly lucked on to a judge who to go back to my original criticism of him. If you're a judge, long long judge, I mean, he's been elected. He's been in office since 1983. Um, if you, if, if you think there's a possibility, this, this judge, by the way, is not viewed as always friendly to def the defense. I mean, there's a lot of reporting in the local newspapers about uh, headlines that said uh, things like this judge, you know, no, no defense counsel wants to have his case or her case heard by this judge. But that's different because so many people charged in Wisconsin with crimes in his court are people of color. So yeah, he's not gonna be sympathetic. How, this is a judge, remember, whose cell phone, it's very unusual for judges to keep their cell phones active right in the middle of trials. He did, and even, I think it was the first day of trial, his phone went off and the ringtone was that hideous uh, Lee Greenwood song, God Bless the USA, used, of course, as a primary way to introduce Donald Trump at all of his rallies. Do I think he just randomly decided this was a great song uh, that he thought it expressed perfectly Christian theology? No, I think he chose that he is very sympathetic to one Donald Trump. And so Did they find the Asian food joke about it. Yeah. Yeah, it's taking too long. I, is it? It might be coming off one of those boats in Long right. Beach. Yeah, is, is was that 
purposely hate speech. What was that joke? Well, I don't know if it was hate speech, but it was just it just shows how insensitive he is to issues of race. I mean, it, it's kind of like, uh, uh, let's see, who yesterday uh, during the debate over Gosar, um, no, it was not, it was uh, it, it, Kristen I mean, Cinema. Uh, hang on. Let, me, let, me, let, me, let me give you an okay, example of this. Kristen Cinema yesterday, you know, she posts something every day on Facebook about how great her work has been, how it's achieved so many great Yesterday, she, she had a posting, today is National Take-A-Hike Day. Who on the staff of a senator wouldn't say, uh, uh, by the way, you're going to get a lot of people who one way or another say, uh, yeah, and Kristen Cinema, why don't you take a hike? Which, of course, hundreds of people did. So if you're not sensitive to this, if you just blurt out anything you want to blurt out, it doesn't matter what your intention is. What matters is what people hear. And if they hear something as insensitive as what she was saying about taking a hike, or even worse, what he was saying about, I hope the Asian lunch isn't stuck on a ship in Los Angeles Harbor. Um, I, he, suppose he said, <laughs> you know, suppose he said, because I've heard people say, you know, we, we ordered Italian food. Where are they picking it up? Rome? Milan, you know, that's not a, I don't know. I don't know, but I, I, somebody told me, and I don't know that this is true, but somebody told me that he often jokes about lunch, you know, the, taking breaks for lunch. And, but but this, has, this has a special meaning. Everybody In knows- comedy writing is. room. Yeah. Well, he, he may have. Do you think he has a chance of, like if you were still doing stand-up, would you let him- you know, be the opening act. The judge? No, he's not that fun. Yeah, the judge. He's not, he's not that funny. He's not that funny. Um, uh, before you go, yep. uh, the Aubrey case, uh, what, what we have in Rittenhouse is a self-deputized vigilante who the police kind of okayed. With uh, the Aubrey case down in Georgia, you have ex-cops, right? No. I think there's an ex-cop uh, and his well, the, 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 One of the defendants, the guy who took the video that they keep showing, who right. is himself uh, accused of, uh, of committing a crime, uh, he might have been an ex-cop. But I don't think that Travis McMichael, who's the son, and his dad, who are also, uh, of course, charged with this, um, I don't think they, I don't think they have any background. I think one of, I think the father, I think, is an ex-cop, and uh, Weren't boy, they the depressing. People? It's really depressing. Yeah, because of course it is. It's a year after. Black Lives Matter, and it feels, well, Derek Chauvin is doing time. Uh, yeah, but, but no, one of the things, and somebody uh, in the chat just pointed out, that what they're using in the Aubrey case is that they were engaged in something called citizen's arrest. And citizen's right. arrest is a horrible idea. And in most places, including now in Wisconsin, it, it's been severely reduced as a useful claim. But, but, but they, they said, look, you know, we, we heard about this. That one of the things the prosecutor did so well today, she, she kept hammering on this idea. Did you ever, did you see him committing any crime? The guy keeps saying, Travis, who was on the stand, the son, says, uh, well, I assumed he was the same guy who may have been stealing some building materials from this partially constructed building, but you didn't see him do it. No, I didn't see him do it, but I assumed he was the same guy that did it. Right. Assumptions, this is why citizens' arrests are so terrible. 
bad as the police can be, either because they arrest the wrong people or because they fail to arrest the right people, is to let everybody become a vigilante. And one of the things we ought to have learned as a culture after this case, that, and of course, is a third racial uh, motivation case in Charlottesville. It's finally after it's, 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 it's running over uh, people and it happened, I think, in 2017 or in 2021, right. they're just getting to trial. Right. But, but that's, that's most this of those defendants trial. aren't even using lawyers. Right. It's they're a civil interview. Trial. Yeah, but they're just interviewing each other. And it's, it's, it's pretty embarrassingly stupid. And I think there will be some good verdicts out of that case. And I think right. in the Aubrey case, there will be too. But I, I think the best we can hope for in the Rittenhouse case is this hung jury so that they can get a new judge and try the case all over again. Yeah. The Rev great job, by the way. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, for this. The Reverend Barry W. Lynn is an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ. He has dedicated his life to separation of church and state. He, for nearly a quarter of a century, ran Americans United for separation of church and state. Follow him on Twitter at Barry W. Lynn and go to barrywlynn.com for a treasure trove of videos and debates against some of the most horrible people this country has ever seen. Phyllis Shafley, Bill Buckley, David Feldman. I've never debated you, though. No. Hey, if you want to, though, we could arrange that. I'll pick a fight with you, and uh, we'll talk about my religion. And by religion, I mean the religion you were going to set up for me. We'll talk about that next week. All right. Sounds good to me. Thanks. Stay out of trouble, Reverend. Only good trouble. Thank you. We will be back with the professors and Mary Ann I think, yeah, right after this. New music from Professor Mike Steinel, Pig for Love. I'm a porcine gourmand of the art of romance. I'm a maestro of the boudoir when I take off my pants. All of this is true, all of the above, I wouldn't lie to you, cause I'm a pig for love. He's a pig for love. He's a pig for love. My appetite's rapacious, but my capacity is dim. I seem so audacious, some call me Gentleman Jim. When all is said and done, and a push comes to shove, I'm a second to none, cause I'm a pig for love. They think I'm suspicious Please pardon me If I'm somewhat repetitious Like a hand in a glove I'm a pig for love
It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. He's talking politics and comedy too. He'll tell a dirty joke if you want him to. He's just a lefty from way back. He's a union man with an Emmy for writing. Someday he's mad and he feels like fighting. It's time right now for the David Feldman Show To get your ears on right, buckle in real tight He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way It's time right now for the David Feldman Show. So get your ears on right, buckle in real tight. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. Welcome back. We're just loading some snark here for the professors and Marianne. Coming up in a few seconds, Professor Jonathan Bick will be joining us along with Professor Marianne Cummings. We don't have Professor Ann Lee or Professor Adnan Hussein or Professor Ian Faluna, but I know that <clears throat> Professor Bick and Professor Cummings can. Uh, it's an honor to have them. Office hours, Friday nights at 8 p.m. Please join us. Meet better people. I mean that. You'll meet a better class of person by coming to office hours. Go to my website, sign up, hit attend office hours. And if you would like to sit in our virtual studio audience, please hit the attend a live taping and we'll send you a link. And here is Professor Marianne Cummings and Professor Jonathan Bick. Professor Jonathan Bick is a political scientist, one of the stars of Office Hours. And Professor Marianne Cummings is a physicist, an actual physicist, and she is an elected official. She has recently been reelected as Parks Commissioner of Aurora, Illinois. Welcome. Let's start with Professor Bick. What is on your mind, sir? Well, hi, David. Um, I, you had a number of interesting uh, guests tonight and, and some very good topics. Um, I wanted to, uh, to touch on the uh, Build Back Better Act. Uh, are they, the they going to vote on it tonight, supposedly? It, it looks like they are going to vote on it in the House tonight. Yes, that's the plan anyway. We've heard this a number of times, but I, it looks like it's going to happen. And I think one of the reasons it's going to happen is because included in it, the second most expensive provision within it is the SALT deduction provision, which is the state and local tax deduction for homeowners. Um, Can you explain that? Now, we've gone over this. I still, it goes in one ear and stays in the ear. It doesn't even, it just doesn't even pass through to the other. I, so what is this, the, the salt? Okay. All right, so for decades, uh, we've had this deduction and it has been an unlimited deduction. In 2017, the tax cut 
uh, pushed by Trump and the Republicans limited this deduction to ten thousand uh, dollars. And what what this what, what the SALT deduction is, is it allows people uh, who pay state and local tax, so that could mean uh, property tax, state income tax, local income tax, or uh, state and local sales tax. I believe you have to pick one or the other. You can't have, you can't deduct the sales tax and the property tax, you have to pick one or the other. But anyway, um, So it allows people to deduct that from their federal income tax, right? So and essentially you're not, you're not paying tax on money that you're using to pay other taxes. That's the idea behind it. Okay. Um, the issue with this is that, um, as I said, in 2017, Trump and the Republicans limited the deduction to $10,000, which for many people is uh, less than what they would pay in those state and local taxes. Uh, so they're, they're actually getting a tax increase. And the Republicans used this uh, savings to cut taxes for wealthy people in the form of a lower top marginal income tax rate, and also in the form of a lavish uh, tax cut on pass-through businesses. Oh, for example, and I'm sure this is just a coincidence, uh, real estate investment companies. So what, what is a pass-through business? So a pass-through business is a uh, business where the, uh, the revenue of the business passes through to your uh, personal income tax return. I, I apologize. I just, the chat room, I want to get to the Taco Bell franchise joke first. Go ahead. Sorry, but I, I don't. Yeah, Go ahead. so it, it, it's basically a business that is structured in a certain way um, that the Republicans and, and Trump wanted to give them a break. Uh, and, and it just so happens that, you know, his businesses uh, would qualify for, for this break. It was like a 20% deduction okay. uh, off the revenue, right off the top. Right. So it's quite a nice uh, deduction. So um, the Republicans also liked limiting the tax deduction, uh, the salt tax deduction, because they knew it would hurt blue states that tend to adequately fund their public schools. If property taxes are no longer deductible, the Republicans figure, then taxpayers in these blue states in particular would be less likely to support their public schools. Because those property taxes, which is the main way that uh, mm. schools are funded in this country, unfortunately, um, are part of those salt taxes. So wow. if you have high property taxes, you know, at least you could get that deduction on your federal tax return. Now, by limiting it to 10000 uh, that was a big hit to... Uh, particularly blue coastal states that have high property values and high property taxes. Uh, as it turns out, uh, this would be a $285 billion tax cut uh, that would largely benefit rich households. The way it's currently structured for the Build Back Better Act after corporate Democrats succeeded in slashing funding for a number of key progressive priorities within this act um, or removing programs entirely, like, for example, lowering the age of Medicare, uh, including dental coverage in Medicare. Uh, uh, they're, they are restricting the uh, child tax credit. They are restricting um, 
funds for taking care of elderly people in their homes in order to get this um, tax cut, which again would benefit the well-off. The, the richest 10%. The richest 10%, right. Um, this was supposed to be the social safety net infrastructure bill that benefits the least among us. That's correct, yeah. And, and the proposal, the last I heard, was that they were going to increase this uh, cap from 10000 to $80,000 through 2030 before reducing it back to 10000 in 2031. Um, the cap, which is currently set to disappear entirely, in other words, you can deduct all of these uh, state and local taxes, again, in 2025, um, would then uh, expire permanently under the, this new provision in, in the Build Back Better, expire permanently in 2032. All right, so that, let's, let, let's deal because we, we have supposedly this bill is going to be voted on in Congress, in the House, and then it gets moved back to the Senate. And through the magic of reconciliation, supposedly it will pass. It was supposed to be six trillion. It got brought down to one point five. Now we're seeing it at one point seven trillion. But it's really when you tack on the the tax cut, it's lower than 1.5, right? If it's a $260 million, billion, uh, $260 billion tax cut? Uh, two, $285 billion. So it's a $1.7 trillion bill that is basically 1.1. 1. 1. It's going to be less than the bipartisan infrastructure bill, basically. If you, because the tax cut means nothing to me in I terms of. Currently, it's a one point eight five trillion dollar bill. But yeah, but it includes. It uh, includes that two hundred eighty five billion. So if you took that off, um, math at this. Well, we don't need that. We don't need. Okay. And now it was supposed to be scored by the Congressional Budget Office, which had two weeks to and score. And they did. They released that tonight. Okay, explain what this means, because most of us, including me, don't really understand this. So the CBO is the Congressional Budget Office, and uh, they are tasked with scoring a bill to see how much it will add or, or not add to the deficit, how much it is actually going to cost in the end. And what they came back with today... Okay, uh, was that the Build Back Better Act, as it's currently constructed that in the House, is uh, will cost, I believe it's $160 billion over 10 years. So in other words, this bill is more than 90% paid for by tax increases and other changes that it makes to pay for uh, the spending that it's going to be doing. Right. So it's largely paid for, overwhelmingly paid for. Uh, unlike, say, the $750 billion military uh, a bill that's been proposed. Right. Now, do we, I'm, I'm being, making a joker, do we know if this was static or dynamic scoring, which is so deep into the weeds? And the, the re only reason I bring that up is dynamic versus static scoring that the CBO does is politicized. And all it means is the CBO doesn't have an effing clue as to what this stuff is. I mean, yeah, I, you know, all of this is an estimate, right? And it depends on a whole host of variables that they could not account for. Right. Um, they, can, they could give a range. Uh, but even so, you know, it's very hard to know what the economy is going to be doing, uh, how much, say, the uh, IRS 
you know, increasing funding for the IRS, how much that's going to bring in, although I think it would be substantial. Yeah. Uh, what, they, what Are they going to spend money on collecting taxes? Is this in? Uh, as of the last I, I knew, yes, it's still in there. Yeah. Right. So they would increase funding from the IRS so they could uh, go after principally, one would hope, uh, corporations and uh, the very wealthy. Right, right. Uh, inflation. Is it real? We're pumping trillions into the economy. The argument that Manchin gives, Professor Marianne, is let's see what this bipartisan infrastructure bill does to the price of things. The CARES Act, we've been pumping trillions of dollars, supposedly fiscal stimulus. Is, in, is inflation real or is it like the crime statistics? Yeah, and we're about to pump, you know, almost eight, nominally 800 billion. But really, when you take into account all the ancillary spending over a trillion into the uh, trillion dollar defense budget. So, you know, that never counts. <laughs> um, well, the thing about the defense budget is uh, that doesn't go into the hands of people who actually spend it. Yeah, it just kind of piles up someplace. Yeah, so there's so no I think the, uh, the, the, uh, if there is inflation, I think it's hardy, hard, it's, artificial. The inflation of the 1960s was somewhat real in the sense that there was there was a uh, increase in wages and for various reasons the demand was not being met by the supply at the time. It's the same thing here but the supply is just a matter of not the, the stuff is there it's just not getting to us. I, that was a uh, I don't know where I saw it, but I know Alan Minsky showed uh, someplace uh, a spectacular photo of just you know, like a hundred thousand one of these uh, shipping containers just being stacked up. I think on Long Beach, it's because they just don't have the logistics and the transportation personnel to just get it all loaded and and shipped out. Um, but. I don't know. I, I mean, inflation is, as you said, one of those gamed numbers because for things that matter to like ordinary people like health care and education and housing, we've had inflation all along. For the, some of the toys, I mean, your iPhones don't cost as much. You know, the Bose radios don't cost as much. Even the Mac, even the laptops have gone down in price. So, you know, the electronic gizmos, the technology, clothes, um, Halloween decorations. <laughs> that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's all been that all that has gone down. But the substance I'm still giving when people ask my opinion, I still give two cents. I'll give you my two cents. It hasn't gone up. Okay. to three That cents. hasn't gone up. No. <laughs> well, I, I think my, is, my laptop has uh, my, my laptop has gone down in price. But I don't know, Saul, do you use Macintoshes? Do you use Apple computers? Um, anyway, yeah, so I, I don't know this, it, as I said, as Mark Blythe would say, these numbers are highly gamed and it just seems that life gets more and more difficult for people at the bottom, even when we had zero or negative inflation. It didn't seem like the cost of housing was going down for them. Uh, taxes in my neighborhood, and I live in the freaking poor neighborhood, that they've gone up every year. I mean, it, it just seems that, you know, structurally, it just gets more expensive to be poor and less expensive to be wealthy. And right. you know, that's part of the wealth inequality that John was talking about. Another thing, you know, I wanted to answer John getting back to this Build Back Better Act, which may be passed tonight. The, si the first biggest chunk in that bill is the uh, child care proposals. And the child care proposals, I was uh, reading an article uh, by uh, Matt Brunig this evening in, in policy, <clears throat> in um, uh, People's Policy Project. And he's pointing out that this is gonna be set up as block grants to the states. In other words, um, 
this is a rather complex system of child care subsidies for parents, and it's going to be doled out to the states as block grants. Um, so that many of these Republican states can choose, like, you know, the expansion of the health care exchanges or the expansion of the Medicaid uh, uh, subsidies. They can just choose not to uh, participate because, because you know, it's you only know, it's going to their poor Democratic voters anyway. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and of course, just structurally in our country, you know, the... Uh, uh, ever since Reconstruction, I mean, the preponderance of poor people are in southern states. And that's who is going to prob the, the unequal distribution of this child care, the way they seem to be have set this up is going to be a very unequal distribution of that benefit to families in this country. So, um, you know, block grants, of course, you know, that's an easy way to get people on board because that's a chunk of money that the states can maybe claim that they're giving it to the families, but God knows the states are, are in charge of uh, distributing that money and it can go through any kind of bureaucratic nonsense they want to go on or they can just reject it altogether. So um, yeah, but it may not matter because if the uh, CBO has scored it that it caught that it's not deficit neutral exactly then uh, joe manchin may just not vote for it anyway no matter how much they pared it down for joe manchin and and joe manchin he's even said as much about uh about a week ago that he doesn't you know he, he feels under no obligation to even consider voting for this thing right so the cbo says it's going to add about 367 billion dollars to the deficit it's going to increase IRS enforcement. That, that's good. It would create a universal pre-K program nationwide. That's good. Is there stuff in there that we can be somewhat happy about? Oh, there's there are things in here that are good. Uh, I, and David, I, I'm... Reading the New York Times, uh, it was it was saying about half of that figure, about 160 billion, uh, that it would add to the deficit over 10 years. Oh, okay. Uh, not, my notes not, say not, not very much, considering the size of this bill and the size of our economy. Right. What my the quote I have from CNN is the Congressional Budget Office says it adds 367 billion to the deficit, but that score does not include revenue from tighter IRS enforcement. The CBO estimated earlier that it would raise $207 billion. So, uh, and Biden is saying it's, uh, it's gonna be completely paid for. He's a liar. And Joe Manchin says he's not on board. Uh, and well, earlier you know today, what? I read, oh, excuse me. Sorry. Without the SALT deduction, it would have been fully paid for. But, but Manchin had a bipartisan infrastructure bill that was almost completely paid for, wasn't it? Almost complete? What, what did they miss it by? Uh, just 50%. Oh, OK. That's yeah. close. Josh Gottheimer. Uh, let me bring up a conversation I had with Sam Cedar earlier today. When you look at what the Democrats are doing to build back better, allowing Manchin uh, to do what they do, and then you find out how the stock trades that people like Pelosi and Godheimer are making, like in Ro Khanna, like, you know, tens of millions of dollars in the stock market that they're trading. These are Democrats. Uh, Kevin McCarthy, zero stock trades. Uh, Gohmert, zero stock trades. Matt Gates, zero stock trades. Paul Gosar, zero stock trades. Marjorie Taylor Greene, $700,000 worth of stock trading. But what, what else is she going to do? 
it's not like she has anything. When you see the Democratic Party, their, their leadership tr trading these stocks. I mean, Josh Gottheimer is trading close to $10 million in Microsoft alone. Uh, I don't, it, it's so easy. It's, it's almost like, I'm embarrassed to say this. I would never, ever vote for the Republicans. But they, at, it's almost as though Pelosi is evil. <laughs> it's it's almost it's I, I hate to go down that path, but there's something really evil about identifying yourself as the ally of the middle class, the working class, the environment, single moms and families. A and I mean, at least Louis Gohmert. <sighs> Who does more damage to this country, Paul Gosar or Nancy Pelosi? Oh, the Republicans would do far more damage. But but who's more? Of a, well, we just censured Paul Gosar. Who's more of a threat to this country, Paul Gosar or Nancy Pelosi? Well, Nancy Honestly. Pelosi has more power. Who creates more damage? Who's created more damage? I would say that the Republicans in power create more damage than Republicans. But I will agree with you that uh, no one can beat the Democrats for hypocrisy. Right. However, I would also say that I would rather have hypocrites in power with somewhat better policies than non-hypocrites in power with terrible policies. Right. You know, well, just, that's interesting, Professor John, because, you know, I don't look at it quite that way. I think they're all on the same team and they're playing different roles. They're playing good cop, bad cop. The reason why Nancy Pelosi is in such a good mood these days and she because she doesn't care if the Democratic Party takes a back bet next time, she's going to be the minority leader or the majority leader, she's going to go to the same parties, raise the same amount of money. Her big threat, what threatened her and the rest of the Democratic leadership was a progressive takeover of the party. And she has successfully crushed the Democratic Party. Uh, you know, I, I really try to be, I mean, she's really crushed the progressive movement in the Democratic Party. I try to be I, I, I try to have some kind of optimism about it, but I'm sorry, uh, the actions of Bernie Sanders in particular has crushed the enthusiasm for the movement he started. I mean, there was real enthusiasm in 2016, at the beginning of 2016. There was real hope at the beginning of 2020. And that is gone. People are just exhausted. Now it's people just take a look, I mean, People see more action with direct action, with strikes, with things that are local. Right. I mean, they've, they've lost the momentum for any national push at the moment. Right. That could change with the next big disaster. But right now, Nancy Pelosi is beaming. The, the, I mean, AOC is now an asset of the corporate ring of the Democratic Party. Because, you know, she's going to be their PR outreach. Nancy Pelosi can go out, oh, we've got a big party. We've got, you know, the Bernie Sanders people and the quote moderates, but really we've only got uh, obedience to the donor class is what we really right. have when it comes to any action. Right. So there, I think there, that long term- I, I agree with all that. Okay. I, I, long still, term, I still say that the policies of the Democrats are better than the Republicans. Yeah, but they they see to it that it's Republican policies that end up getting implemented. I mean, I'm looking at not just the not not just the policies of the face or just on the face of it or the next election, but just long term what is happening. And long term, the Affordable Care Act was just basically a way to keep the insurance companies alive for at least 12 more years after the uh, financial meltdown because there was no way. The insurance companies were going to survive that. 
I mean, there was, if, if people are struggling just to make rent and you're young, you're, you're not going to pay your insurance premium. <laughs> it means, you know, getting evicted. So it, it, well, it's- At the it's, same time though, yeah, it did do things that helped a lot of people. It, it, it made, um, you know, you could put your, your child on your policy until he was age, or he or she's age 26. Uh, it, it, it stopped rescission of uh, insurance policies. It uh, prohibited, um, I can't think of the phrase right now, uh, pre-existing condition uh, mm -hmm. uh, denials. It limited how much they could advertise. But here's the thing, Professor. I talked to a friend who is a Republican complaining that it costs him $2,500 a month to pay his health insurance bill for his family. The, the, under Obamacare, the premiums have gone up, the deductibles have gone up, which means the profits for the insurance companies have gone up, and the idea that medic that that Obamacare was going to be an entry point into single payer and Medicare for all, it's a fallacy because the insurance companies are more powerful now than they've ever been thanks to Barack Obama. We're never going to get Medicare for all because they the insurance companies have just too much power to and they control the narrative. Well, that brings up just one more thing I wanted to say. It is true that. Uh, the Republicans come in, they're horrible. The Democrats come in, they're slightly less ho horrible. They ameliorate the worst of the policies of, of this kind of rapacious capitalistic system we are in. But in the long run, if, if Obamacare put back single payer by 20 years, yes, uh, some people got help, but the amount of people that got helped in the short term did not make up for the, the amount of people that, for instance, uh, ProPublica estimated that anywhere between 100 and 300,000 people died of COVID simply because they did not have, we did not have a national healthcare system. They didn't have access to healthcare. Uh, what, I, I'm on the insurance- and you had a roll of the dice, excuse me for one second. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you, here's what's really left out about this is, you had a, if you were of a certain income and you thought you had COVID, you had to roll the dice, go into the hospital and hope it's COVID. Otherwise, yeah. you're going to get a bill for a million dollars. So they've got a substantial increase in the uh, premium support this year. And what did the insurance companies do with that extra money to keep, you know, their client base? Well, my my, deduct, my deductible went from seventy six hundred to eighty seven hundred. As I said before, it doesn't matter. I never go to doctors. <laughs> the last time I needed health care, I I literally had a vet take care of it. So funny. Not going to give it anyway from Better Call Saul, but that I laughed when I watched that program <laughs> at that point. But it's like, you know, I don't go to the emergency room. I only go to the emergency room when I am unconscious and somebody else sent me to the emergency room. That card is only for me to get on site at Fermilab. That's it. It's a shakedown racket so I can get on site at Fermilab if Fermilab ever opens this year. So this is the way it is. I'm lucky because I don't need doctors. So far, I have, I mean, nothing that I couldn't handle with diet or yoga. But, you know, that's not well, the situation every a lot of people come in. Right. And people have accidents and people get mm -hmm. sick. And the older you yes. get, the more likely it is that you're going to get sick. I understand um, that. So, you know, just, you know, I hate to grow older, but on the other hand, when you think of uh, health insurance, insurance premiums, boy, Medicare seems still so far away. <laughs> it's like it would have been yeah. tremendous to lower the age. You know, it would have been... helped me a lot. I'd be a lot closer. And it's like, wow, you know. But the thing is, none of that's in here, and you know the the even the the squad is going to go off and tout all the things we gained for you know working class families, and people are just not going to feel it. If 
whatever small benefit they're getting from this bill is offset by higher higher property taxes or higher costs for food or higher, you know, whatever is, is going on in the economy because we live in a rapacious neoliberal capitalist and game capitalist society right now. And so I, I don't I, I wanted to make that point because inflation, and you m mentioned Mark Blythe, who's a well-respected uh, political economist at Brown. Uh, he said, you know, inflation is a generalized increase in prices that is continuing to go on. It is uh, a psychological event where people buy now because they fear that the, whatever they need to buy is going to be more expensive in the future. So it's a reinforcing psychological phenomenon. We call a positive and, feedback loop. I has a, right, positive feedback loop that is across all prices in the economy. What we have going on now, I don't think would qualify as that. Uh, you know, we have a number of things going on. There, there is uh, supply chain problems. Mm -hmm. uh, there was, uh, you know, uh, companies that did the things during the pandemic uh, that hampered their ability to produce uh, later on. And now they're still ramp trying to ramp up to where they were. Uh, we have uh, increasing petroleum prices because of what Saudi Arabia and and uh, Russia are doing. We have um, uh, companies that are trying to recoup losses that were sustained during the pandemic, during the mm -hmm. shutdown. They're trying to make up for what, for the profit they lost during that time now. If you look at um, consumer sentiment, specifically whether the consumers think it's a good time to buy now, it's lower than during the Great Recession for things like houses and automobiles and major purchases. So what could very well happen is that these higher prices will be rejected by consumers and this will cause um, uh, prices to go down that companies will have to cut their prices. So this may in fact be transitory. But what else is going on is you have monopoly capitalism where you have you know, large sections of the, the economy controlled by a few firms that are able to manipulate the prices upward. Right, <laughs> right. If, if we had antitrust legislation and I might add We're that forcing what we have would be. Yeah, the there's just a little historical context. When Bork was working at the Reagan Justice Department, he changed antitrust enforcement. He came up with the Bork rule that the Justice Department should only enforce antitrust legislation if it puts a uh, if it creates a monopolistic increase in prices they weren't concerned about power they weren't concerned that ge would accrue all this anti-competitive power they weren't concerned about anti-competitive practices and and driving little businesses out of business they only con were concerned about the upward pressure on prices now, what the Democrats, what the left should be doing is saying to all the right wingers who say inflation is out of control, say, OK, break up Amazon, break up Microsoft, break up Apple. Why isn't the Justice Department breaking up these companies? Obviously, they have too much control over the price of things. Be very interesting than to hear the Republicans saying, well, you know, inflation isn't so bad, actually. Now is the time to start to use inflation and say, it's time to break these companies up. Nope, we don't hear that. 
We, we don't hear it. Bernie Sanders. You, you we'll hear it from Bernie Sanders and maybe one or two other people and nobody else. Right. Because again, the Democrats, at least the leadership, are they're supported by the same cohort that support the Republicans. And, and it makes me wonder, it makes me wonder whether or not inflation has always been bad. But if they told us that inflation was non-existent, they could justify not breaking up these monopolists. Because as Professor Marianne and you have pointed out countless times, healthcare prices, are you kidding me? Education to get educated? It's beyond inflation. This is like we Weimar Germany inflation we're looking at when it comes to health care costs and a college education. Right. It but it's not being caused by too many dollars in the economy. It's being caused by restrictions to competition. It's being caused by rent seeking. It's being caused by a, a number of factors that don't have to do with this, the factors that were in play, say, in the 1970s. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm looking at your graphic there. Um, bacon up 20%, steak up 24%. Uh, you know, as a, as a vegetarian, I, I'd say that's probably a good thing. I agree uh, with you. <laughs> but... Um, Cereals are up 4.5%. You shouldn't be eating cereal. Fuel oil, 59%. Right. Fuel, Fuel oil, oil is, is highly uh, volatile, right? Remember, about a year ago, oil was trading for negative dollars in the futures market. <laughs> right? It, you, they were paying you... Uh, to store it. They yeah. store it, right. They had no place to store it. There was so much, such a glut. Right. Um, and this is showing inflation from October 2020 to October 21. Uh, again, there is that effect of prices were going down on a lot of things because the demand just wasn't there. Right. Uh, during lockdowns, nobody's buying uh cars or laundry detergent or laundry equipment or whatever so um you have to consider that as well and you know when it comes to automobiles part of it is the uh the shortage of uh chips computer chips yeah because of the way we've structured um that supply chain i mean you've got it concentrated in a few countries among a few companies that produce most of the computer chips in the world. That is insane. The, you know, the U.S. should be able to produce large amounts of computer chips on its own for its own market. Mm -hmm. Instead, we've outsourced all of that. That, right. that is dangerous for a number of reasons. Right. Well, Again, this is you know, this oh. is just maximizing. It's only maximizing the system for a few people. Just like a lot of trade, the, uh, this trade going back and forth is highly inefficient. But the costs are borne by us, by the environment, by you know, uh, people, particularly people producing in these countries. Um, you know, it, it, and it's only run for the benefit of a few people. This right on time, just in time type supply chain model, just for a few people. Right. <laughs> and so no sense of the commons, no sense of you know collective even national security hell we had this problem uh back in the 19 late 1980s pappy bush was president and there was they were holding up the manufacture the completion of a couple of uh, los angeles class nuclear submarines because the chips that they relied on were back ordered and the and the japanese company that made the chip the integrated circuits circuitry was on back order so Pappy Bush actually had an emergency panel set up and they started, they started production of chip making in this country. And I think in a couple of uh, countries in Central America that were closer. But anyway, the point is, is that we can move, we can move to change things if we really want to do this, you know, but 
it's working out great for the people on top. Um, I don't know if you care to get the the uh, situation in Kenosha into this, but uh, I would ask everybody to watch the video that my, Matt Orfalia put up just a few days ago about what caused this. And it was just pretty much unended video of the Jacob Blake, what, of the killing of Jacob Blake and what happened and how this whole, the whole riot scene evolved. And you realize that, wow, we've got some real institutional problems and structural problems, but it's so much easier to hate on a kid with an assault rifle. You know, it, 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 that's just an easier thing for people's brains, particularly liberals to deal with rather than looking at this situation and ask ourselves, how did we let things get to this place? Because this didn't happen overnight. And this was both Democrats and Republicans. So, you know. Well, yeah, just for the sake of keeping the show going and the conversation, the, the Democrats did pass an assault weapons ban. Clinton did pass an yes. assault weapons ban. And this kid got his hands on the problem of the riots in Kenosha wasn't started by this kid. The problems of the riots of Kenosha was started by institutional problems with the police force, the perpetual economic depression that is in places like Kenosha and, you know, all over the Midwest. You, you've mentioned and, this before. So yeah. the, the as I understand it, a car dealership, 100 cars, got set on fire some trash cans got on fire but was was it were we seeing looting on like oh yeah we were uh, look the, the, just the first night alone i mean it was what was remarkable about that first night i guess orfalia is putting together a whole documentary about what happened in kenosha but this is the first eight minutes of it it was just beginning, beginning. one of the things that struck me was um when it started a mob scene in front of the police department that ended up going throughout the downtown. And I actually know that area. I, I canvassed there quite several times for Bernie. Um, it's, you, what struck me is it was that the, it was the African-Americans who were largely telling the crowd to calm down. It was the African-Americans when they were still at that house where they, you know, at the scene where they killed the guy. Right. Particularly older African Americans, they were urging people to just calm their shit down. This is not going to end well if you attack the police. And most of the film footage was showing there, there at the crime scene, and then later that night when they started rioting in the downtown, that um, you know most of the perps were white. Particularly the one guy struck me, he's in front of the dinosaur museum and then he's just had it. He and a couple of friends are there and there's a whole bunch of people who want to break the doors of the dinosaur museum. And he goes, this has nothing to do with what just happened. This is right. the freaking dinosaur museum. They showed a church being looted and vandalized, which had a big Black Lives Matter sign in front of it. And it was, you know, it's insanity. So it's, it's just people's, obviously people's pent up frustrations, but you know, there was, this is the kind of thing that's not going to be good for Black Lives Matter because again, same thing, nowhere near as bad, but it, we did have a lot of that in, 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 our, in Aurora, Mich Aurora, Illinois. Um, and a lot of people kind of associated the looters and the people that set one building on fire, on fire with, with, with the Black Lives Matter protests. And that's right. not helping the Black Lives Matter movement. Yeah, but it's not the Black Lives Matter movement. And we know it isn't the Black Lives Matter, but there were certain. But the left has not been clear on this issue, and certain lefty writers have been have have been justifying that. Well, of course, people are going to smash things. You know, they're just expressing their anger at the police. And I'm going, but the people who were protesting were not the writers. Who in in, in Aurora, they were just mostly kids, right? Claiming to be Antifa, but this. This is a problem for us, right? Because we it's hurting. It it's it's hurting these poor neighborhoods. Right. So we have to wrap it up. Uh, Professor Marianne Cummings, Parks Commissioner, Aurora, Illinois, physicist. What's your Twitter handle? Razor Girl. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Yes. And Professor Jonathan Bick, political scientist. Thank you so much. You're there. Great job.
Really great. This is turning out to be a great show. Thank you. I hope to see you both at office hours. Friday night at 8 p.m. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. Coming up, Professor Harvey J.K., author of FDR on Democracy, and Alan Minsky, the executive director of Progressive Democrats of America. But first, new music from Professor Mike Steinel. I'm a poor scene gourmand of the art of romance. I'm a maestro of the boudoir when I take off my pants. All of this is true, all of the above. I wouldn't lie to you, cause I'm a pig for love. My appetite's rapacious, but my capacity is dim. I seem so audacious, some call me Gentleman Jim. When all is said and done, and a push comes to shove, I'm second to none, cause I'm a pig for love. Others won't come close Cause they think I'm suspicious Please pardon me If I'm somewhat repetitious Like a hand in a glove I'm a pig for love Welcome back. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, davidfeldmanshow.com. Carm. Dot karma. Dot karma. Office hours every Friday night at 8 p.m. We're just loading up the snark here. Professor Harvey J.K. joins us, thank God. He is the author of Take Hold of Our History. That is a great read. People should pick it up. It's a collection of his essays and speeches. And you might want to pick up FDR on democracy and just go through the whole canon that Professor Harvey J.K. is responsible for. And Alan Minsky is executive director of Progressive Democrats of America. Well, we're waiting on the infrastructure bill. Right, right. If the professor could tell us, is this uh, going to be as big as uh, the New Deal? That's Sorry. not fair. That's that. That's not. Sorry. That's not fair. Obviously, it's uh, not. Am I echoing in there? No, you sound no. good. Good. Okay. And Alan, if you can unmute yourself, that would be great. So while you're it's definitely you're, not going to be, it's not going to be as big, but I have a question for Alan before we proceed. In fact, right. I texted him just a minute ago um, regarding this. So this is the house now and it's still, it, but it has to go back over to the Senate. Is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. And so what's the what, what's the likelihood of thing of it making it through the Senate in the current status? Do we have any idea? Manchin doesn't like it. Yeah, he, he was grumbling today. Um, we shall see. Um, I, I think it's fair to say at this point, it's highly likely that a good, a very significant portion of what's coming out of the House. Hello? Alan He's froze. froze. Alan is frozen. That's a good picture of him, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Let's have a con- let's hey, let's have a contest. Caption this picture. Yeah. Uh well, so while we're waiting for Alan, it's we, like, I, clearly it's not going to be it, look, for the, for anything to be as big as the new deal, it has to be not only what's here in this. It also must include the pro act. It must include the pro act. And clearly it should include before, before the, the I mean, let's face it, Medicare for all would have made it. If you want a new deal, you do this, you do the PRO Act, and you do Medicare for all. And then we can all be bowled over by the, by the New Deal character. But, the, but it is significant. The, but the, the, the other question would be, how soon will it start affecting people's lives? How long is it going to take the Senate? What's the Senate going to cut out of it? Um, you know, I think that... I think the last couple of weeks, the, the major news has been the non-news, that is the ridiculous contest underway between Harris, and who the hell knows where she is, and Buttigieg on the one hand, and Biden as the, you know, the other party in this strange, I want to say menage a trois or something like that. You've got Pete Buttigieg, who mysteriously is going to be the most consequential secretary of transportation in American history, they say, because of this infrastructure bill. We have the McKinsey loyalist, Pete Buttigieg, this disgusting, reprehensible human being. There's an Amazon documentary out about him, Mm -hmm. and he's going to be the one you associate with the largesse being given out. He's actually going to be able to run on something. No, 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 no. no. He's not going to be able to run on. He, you know, he is a const. I don't think they're going to be able to shove him down the throats of the American public any more easily than they can do that with Kamala Harris. Well, he, um, but he. Excuse me for one second, Alan. He had more delegates than Joe Biden had before he dropped out. I mean, he, yeah, he, he was he connecting did, with the idiots in, in America. He did really well in two very white states. And he, he when I, I, I had no opportunity to see him live, I went to Iowa, I didn't go to New Hampshire. Um, I certainly was around his people a lot, however. And, um, and I was mystified by his appeal. Because this is a guy who, just like Harris, said, I'm for Medicare for all. Then he gets out on the campaign trail, his consultants say, no, no, you're not for Medicare for all. And he literally would get up on stage and just lie about it, right? Mm-hmm. And now that's that's what neoliberals were going to do about Medicare for all in general. But uh, what was his appeal? Well, his appeal was he built, okay, he, he really hurt Bernie in Iowa in the places that Bernie rocked it in 2016, which were the small towns. Yeah. Right. He absolutely crushed Hillary in 2016 in those towns out in Iowa. And um, and but but because if you remember that beautiful ad that was done to the song America, um, that was a very powerful ad in Iowa in 2016, 20, late 2015, early 2016. And off of that ad and its representation of a positive vision of America, Bernie Sanders built great support there. So what was Buttigieg's big appeal is he could build up the dream. He had almost like a Reagan-like capacity to speak. An Obama-like capacity, more like Obama. Well, yeah, sure. But I mean, you know, Obama and he then are capturing, you know, the glory of America and passing that off as part of his campaign pitch and his presentation of himself. Okay. And he's a veteran. And he's a veteran. That probably does better in the Republican Party generally than it does in the Democratic Party. It's going to, pro- I don't know what portion of the Democratic Party that really appeals deeply to um, at this point. It could be stronger than I, I think. 
but um, he sort of he sort of was was you know starting to lay an egg by Nevada. He really was, and and uh, he had no campaign infrastructure out of those two states. That's that's logistics stuff. But I just don't know. He never really rose that high in the national polls. It was more his impact in small towns in Nevada and Iowa. Of course, he comes out of South Bend, Indiana. I don't know. If how you're a neoliberal, mm-hmm. you've got this. He's a McKinsey loyalist. He's uh, uh, I believe he served in Afghanistan. And he parrots the right talking points. If you're a neoliberal and he he just adopted to kids with his husband democratic party won two elections with neoliberals they won four elections bill clinton and barack obama as much as it sort of is is you know sort of almost have to uh, choke back the vomit in your mouth to say it especially around bill clinton right now those two guys are just olympian political figures compared to what if, what if pete buddha judge is an olympian political figure don't forget that clinton at first was a disaster. Remember his speech at the Democratic Convention in, I believe it was 88? Didn't he make a complete fool out of himself? To to be able to win as a charismatic young Southern Democrat in Arkansas and then lose and then come back and win, that already showed more political chops than Buttigieg has shown in his career, even though he gave a terrible speech, you're right, at the DNC. Clinton gave one of the worst speeches in the history of politics at the DNC and came back from it. What if if you but you don't win these things unless somebody puts their thumb on the scale for you? Biden only won because Buttigieg got the call. Aren't you if you're the one making the call, aren't you going to make the call for Buttigieg and not for Kamala Harris? Don't you want Pete Buttigieg to run in 2024? Doesn't he represent all the neoliberal interests that control the Democratic Party? Again, I don't think his national polls were ever very high. He was he was very popular in two very small states. She, she'll she'll, she'll like she'll likely be the 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 heir apparent. And the question would be, will Buttigieg try to primary her? And in hopes at least of getting the vice presidential uh, place on the ticket, but the two of them, the two of them will then be also primaried by others, I believe. Well, she yeah, didn't win anything. Things, it's, it's, game, it's game on for everybody. She was a disaster as a candidate. Absolutely. Zero. Yeah, and she's he been was, a, a nothing as a vice not president. A I'm sorry. She's she's nothing. nothing. Right. He was not a disaster. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, sorry, go ahead. No, no, he, there was a lot about the way he ran his campaign that was super successful, but he was completely out of resources after those two states. And nobody, and it's telling that nobody really invested in him after that either. But again, he's obviously got a, now he's sort of there. He's the secretary of transportation. I, I don't oh my God. I mean, Alan and Professor Kay, he whether or not it's true and it's not he can position himself as the deliverer of largesse he's the it's this these how, 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 i've heard people say that hey, tell me how that can, how he can do that hey i don't understand that i don't understand how he can position himself as anything he's he was on leave for a whole period of time he, he showed no i don't think he raised the telephone to lobby for it he didn't get out on the trail to push for it. How is he? Well, for yeah, I, I, outlo- I outlobbied him, man. I outlobbied him. Well, you outlobbied everybody, and I don't say that as a joke. Yeah, it's it's perception, and the fact, as I understand it, at least the bipartisan infrastructure bill, there are a lot. You know, these that is, there's a, it. Some of this has to be approved by the Department of Transportation before it goes to the states. The bureaucracy dictates that you approve, you sign off on some of these uh, block grants through the Department of Transportation. It's just confusing enough that an opportunistic infection like Pete Buttigieg can show up for a ribbon cutting, can 
be sent out, you know, to uh, Wisconsin. For, if it wasn't for, for the fact that I was completely wrong that, about Trump ever winning the presidency, right. I would say you're making a mountain out of a molehill or you're making a super highway out of a back ro country road. I'm uh, making a molehill yeah, yeah. into a mountain. That's what I'm doing. Well, if, it's any, if it's any consolation, I'm agreeing with you, Harvey. And I was one of those one of those jerks who, at least in this middle of 2016, we thought Trump would win. OK, well, I'll change the subject. I just want to point. To, let me just go on record. I think that Pete Buttigieg is getting money from the McKinsey clients. McKinsey is you talk about deep, dark state. McKinsey is as evil. Really? Yeah, fuck yeah. Yes. They, they, they don't you know, they don't they don't um, they don't consult the Saudi government. You know that they are the Saudi government. Right. And you're joking. You're not joking around. Explain that. Explain that. Yeah. The Saudis don't. The Saudi royal family does not trust Saudi citizens to have the reins of state power. So they literally hand over the running of the state. Uh, certainly certain portions of it, significant portions of it to McKinsey. And they operate as the state inside Saudi Arabia. And you're, you're talking about possible. I mean, again, this sounds like, you know, deep, dark state conspiratorial thinking. But McKinsey has access as a consultant to the books, the inner workings of all these top corporations and access to our government and they're advising you on how to invest your money whatever deep dark forces are at play here and there are many he is the recipient pete buddha judge it will be the loyal recipient of mckinsey's largesse not not to be you know, uh, Kamala Harris gets money from the Getty family. The, the McKinsey is way more powerful, as you well, say. Look, look, as we used to say, when the revolution comes. We're all moving to Canada. <laughs> the Saudis have really great LGBTQ plus, uh, you know, um, human rights policies. Well, let's... Uh, turn to why Professor Harvey J.K. is looking to 2020, uh, 2020, 2024. What is happening in the news that you're thinking about 2024? Have you just given up hope for the Democrats on the midterms? Uh, I, I think, well, let's put it this way. I, I can't somehow this massive bill may may serve the Democrats interests, but they likely they won't know how to sell it in terms of their success. I mean, they have no they, they have no package. They have no no voice. I mean, I, I don't know what they're going to do. OK, I just I just don't know how they're going to overcome the general. I mean, his his favorables are so low and she is currently she's like the least favorable vice president, I think, on record right now. Right. So it's it's just I don't know what what turns it around. Alan has a little more optimism, I think, about what might ensue than I do. Um, I, I just don't I, I, I let don't me, let me paint I don't know how they can overcome this deficit. Let, let me let me let me paint a pic, a, a rosy picture for the Democrats, an undeserved rosy picture. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, COVID is up 20, the, the, the 14 day rolling average is COVID's up like 24%. So we're seeing a, a spike, yeah. but. Hmm. That's going to last a while, Dave. It's going to last all winter. Right. Right now, well, it seems to be strangely enough across the Northern tier of states as yeah, well. Not where it's, where it's cold. Where people, right. Yeah. We go inside. And it's going to get worse because you're going to get Thanksgiving holidays and people are going to. Right spread it and you know so let me just paint a, a rosy picture by alan when when are the first primaries for the midterms i would Most assume important uh, primary that's right in front of us is going to be in uh southern texas um 
and Jessica Cisneros versus Henry Cuellar on March 1st. And who do we and, like? Oh, Jessica Cisneros, Henry Cuellar is rotten. The most oil-saturated <laughs> Trump voting uh, Democrat in Congress, pretty much. And Worse do you like Beto? I cannot Beto, stand Beto. Beto's going to roll in the primary. He'll, 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 win the primary. He'll, he'll win the primary easily. And then he also has said we're going to get... Re the only good thing he ever said running for president is, are we going to get rid of the AR-15s? Hell yeah. yeah, that, yeah. Does that fly in Texas? Uh, it's not going to hurt him in the Democratic primary. But he's not going to beat Abbott, right? He might. We'll see how thing. That's that's a, you know, it's a, it's a good thing that for Democrats that he got in the race all all around because it's certainly better than a non-entity losing by you know twenty points. But he is a despicable human being, Beto O'Rourke. He's married to a Republican. He's been bankrolled by by the family, by her family. Yeah, he's not. He's, I, I don't know. I don't know a great deal about him any more than I did about Buttigieg. But something there was something about the two of them that struck me that they they they, they, went, they 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 went and endorsed Biden for Super Tuesday. They turned their back on yeah. Bernie. Yeah, and they're nothing to me. They turned. Yeah, well, their they back. were nothing to me when they started, but then again. Yeah. You know. So let me paint you a rosy picture. Please do. I could use a rosy picture. Okay. So they pass these two infrastructure bills. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter that they, they completely abandoned the working class, which they have. It doesn't matter that they haven't addressed the eviction crisis, the health care crisis, the immigration crisis. And. And the voting rights and the voting rights and the pro act and the pro act and the gerrymandering problems. That yep. the that are just baked into a it's going to be a republic. I, I don't. From what I've been reading, the Democrats don't stand a chance. But what if the economy heats up in twenty twenty two? What if it just goes on fire? Uh, inflation isn't as bad. The country opens up there. Pfizer has this new pill that can treat COVID. The, the vaccines are working for the people who take them. The stock market is up 40 percent, 30 percent. It's conceivable with this money being pumped into the economy that I mean, I would assume we're going to have inflation, but with inflation comes record profits for corporations surprise tax revenues on april 15th they go mike we were surprised last april 15th 2021 they were surprised by how the budget deficit wasn't as big they were surprised uh you know a rising even even a an economy that's working for the one percent it helps a little. Yeah, it does. Yep, it does. Is it conceivable that the Democrats could could win? Why do people not like Biden? That was his whole thing. You liked him. That's the only re that was what he was selling was his likability. They don't like well, him. Well, he wasn't Trump. That that helped a lot. But but the thing about it's you know it's Joe. It's you know me. I'm middle class Joe. <laughs> why don't they like him? I don't know. Why don't they like him? I do know why. But I'm a hateful human being. Why don't you like him? Why don't I like him? Yeah. I don't like him because of forty. Is it forty years? How long was he in? in the House and Senate, 40 years. plus years. How many years? Yeah. 400 years, something like that. And <laughs> uh, and and all I remember, I mean, the only time he seemed to get uh, excited, really excited, was when he was 
uh, calling for an end to it or to cutting into what he, you know, what people call it. I hate the word entitlements. Right. And uh, all of a sudden he was, and look, and also because he, he's, he was, he's a loser. <laughs> he was a lo- I think I told you once, the only time I think I ever liked him was when he plagiarized Neil Kinnock, the labor leader in, from Britain. Right. Right. He, he, he stole from a halfway yeah. distance. You know, I, 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 I mean, you know, there are lots of other reasons people didn't like him and they didn't trust him. And uh, but but, you know, the, the real thing is, is that he, he had there was no way that he should have come out as the winner in the in the primaries. The Democrats did their best to keep Bernie from from winning in 2016 and from winning in 2020. Bernie would have been president in 2016. Could I I think any Democrat of a solid sort would probably have beaten Trump this time around because of, you know, COVID, frankly. Um, people, you know, the other possibility is that COVID, it just hangs in here and it makes the, and basically this whole question about shots and boosters and uh, masks and all that does not enhance the this presidency. So, Which, yeah, I mean, that, so the supply chain issues persist and inflation persists, but we're not you know, going the supply back. chains are shouldn't be scoffed at today in Green Bay, Wisconsin. You couldn't get Beaujolais Nouveau. My God. And it, today you, was the day they to. release it, you know. So what are you going to do? I wait till tomorrow. <laughs> I don't know what it, I, I'll buy. I'll buy Beaujolais Village as if it matters. I don't know. <laughs> My God, it's like. I, I generally drink, I generally drink low price Spanish sparkling wine. So, well, Trump, the head of the Republican National Committee, Ronna McDaniel, I believe she's Romney's niece. She finally said, a year, took a year that Biden won the 2020 election. So the head of the RNC is saying. Trump lost. Now, normally you would think that's no big thing. Like it's duh. Ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, yeah. How big? I actually is think it? It's very big, not because it shows you that Biden won <laughs> at all, right. but more the case. And and I've been saying this for a while. I'm not convinced Trump is the next is the Republican candidate in 2024. I'm just not convinced. I know he's got incredible powers over people inside that party. But I, I'm just I don't I don't believe it. I think that I think I'm not even sure he'll be alive in 2024, given his general stature and, and, and right. you know, carriage. But I really don't think he will be. But I'm still I'm I, I'm on record. I think Josh Hawley will be on the ticket in 2024. Right. Well, right. It, won't be, it won't be Trump in uh, Pence, that's for sure. No, it won't right. be Trump in Pence. He does face a significant number of lawsuits, Georgia, for trying to overturn the election. He hasn't been indicted yet by Merrick Garland, but we still have the state attorney general in New York and Cyrus Vance. He's leaving his new uh, the new D.A. here in Manhattan prosecuting the Trump family. In three years, he would have to declare. See, I think he runs because that politicizes the prosecution of him. Once you're under indictment, once you're being prosecuted, if you run for office, then it creates the illusion that your prosecution is political as opposed to criminal. So I think he has to run. That's, and yeah, that, that's interesting. I think he that's has right. to run not to go to prison. Alan? I don't know. He won the second most votes ever in a U.S. presidential election. You know, five, six million, five million more or so than Obama did in 2008. I don't see how... Um, the Republicans escape him, though he lost by. I'm looking at it now. He actually added up to losing by seven million votes. Yeah, but and, if you take uh, California off, that, yeah, and, and he won, lost by forty thousand votes only, which is half of what Hillary yeah. lost, which was eighty thousand votes. 
you know, the, the thing to consider is that, I mean, he could run or whatever, but there, there are some really hungry people in the Republican Party. Hung, I think hungrier publicly than than the Democrats can offer. I mean, you've got, I mean, Harris and Buttigieg, you know, that even if I just, it's hard to even imagine either one of them running and decidedly even winning the presidency. Um, but it's the case you've got this DeSantis is obviously salivating at the possible right. prospect. Right. I, th- I do believe Hawley is salivating at the possibility, though he's young enough to say, well, I can run on the ticket. I don't have to be at the, at the top of the ticket. Um, don't forget if he, if he, if, you know, if, if he's as impressive as you say he is, and, and I'm not that familiar with him. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, hold with, on. I'm not saying he's Harvey. impressive. I, mm-hmm. I don't mean that. I'm talking about he's a Republican who has a, a really significant appeal and he he will, if he runs, run against the establishment. No, and I, 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 I say impressive in the sense that, you know, he can be horrible and all these things or whatever. But for a Republican politician, he's apparently somewhat charismatic. And um, and more so, say, than um, the relatively sane uh, Florida senator has to face reelection this time. Uh, the what's his name? Rubio. Oh, um, yeah. who probably will be the banner carrying the banner for the moderates. Right. Yeah. And um, so um, Holly, yeah, Holly, if he does take a VP slot on a DeSantis or Trump ticket, he is perfectly positioned to take the nomination then in 2028 because he's that young. Right. We had uh, Dr. Philip Hershen fell on the show earlier. He's a Freudian psychoanalyst. And I asked him earlier today, I said, it was about a year and two months ago that you, Dr. Hershenfeld, said you were nervous about the election. And as a psychiatrist, it's his job to say to his patients who have anxiety about Trump, you know, this is about something else. This is about your mother. This is about your father. He said, you know, like a year and four months ago that he would tell his patients, no, this isn't about your mother. This is about your country, that this is scary. And I said, I've noticed a lethargy, uh, a generalized anxiety that I believe stems from the deluge that awaits us because it sure feels that Biden and Harris are not up to the task. Pelosi is not up to the task. They are making Trump's case every day that the Democratic Party does not work for the people. Yeah, they're they're making the populist, the wrong populist argument for Trump. Is that a fair statement? Yes, I think and so. we're beginning to feel it and internalize it. I'm feeling anxious, angry, depressed. And it's you. You can get anxious, angry and depressed by a government, a, a political party who is letting you down. It's, and it's funny I you use the word lethargy because I started tweeting just that this past week or so, because I all I could imagine. I mean, it just seemed to me. The Democratic leadership was lethargic. It's uh, just lethargic. What that, you know, they they just don't know how to be. They don't even know how to be winners. I mean, they don't know how to enthuse people. That's the striking thing. I've been doing push-ups. I'm ashamed to tell you how few I can do. <laughs> but let's just say I can do more than one, right? This is who the Democratic Party is. I know I have to do three push-ups, and I get to two, and you go, David, you got to do that third push-up, and I put everything, and I just collapse. I am physically incapable of doing that third push-up. This is who the Democratic Party is. They cannot do the heavy lifting necessary to beat Trump. They do not have the muscle they might have the will, but they don't have the muscle and, and they cannot stand up to their donors and they're collapse. They're, they're going to collapse. It's, 
unless something seriously changes the the structural disadvantages they have going into these midterms it's gonna be a bloodbath isn't it could be could be and then it's Maxine Waters losing her committee assignments because they're going to get even for Gosar. They're going to they're going to the Republicans are going to show us what leadership looks like. They're going to introduce articles of impeachment. They will block any Supreme Court nominee. They will go through every you know AOC will lose her committee assignments. They will censure. They will just censure everybody. They'll show us, and they'll get rid. Of, they'll get rid of the filibuster. And they'll, they'll hire. They'll hire, they'll hire two hire. sergeant at arms. That's what they'll do. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 when they do that, our side is going to say, "Boy, we should have done that. Let's support Pelosi and Schumer and make sure they get reelected. Because this time, they're going to show some muscle. This time, they're going to do that third push up." Sam Cedar was on the show earlier, and he said as a political analyst, not as a political activist, he doesn't see the Democratic Party, see it being a winning strategy for the Democratic Party to, to find God and just go all in on the working class. He's, he's not so sure that the... He says the the national polling is there, but um, you know district by district it doesn't add up. Is that true, Alan? Uh, I don't know what he means by that, but he's yeah. yeah I, I, don't know. I, I I think. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. I hear you, but I I was gonna say I I agree. I don't know what he's talking about either. But go ahead. Yeah. Um. The yeah. It, there's there's no doubt that if you you know even if you go all the way back to the Kerry Bush election. One of the polling groups did a poll of the whole population, not likely voters, not registered voters. And the Democrats in that poll had about a two or three point greater advantage. So the people who just aren't voting, you know, when given the consideration who to vote for. Now, who are the people who don't vote? They tend to be young people and they tend to be poor people who vote much less. Um, in fact, PDA right now is involved in a large um project to get renters to register okay and that's important because housing and housing costs are off the charts people are getting crushed by their their the rent that they're paying and uh you know this will actually be a nonpartisan activity of our 501c3 but it is about getting um, the homeless is it le- can you yes imagine? It's, it's in it's in coalition with the national i forget the name of the group that we're in partnership with there getting about getting the homeless uh, register too. But but the thing is, is so poor people generally don't vote, especially in off-year elections, especially off-year elections for state legislature, et cetera. You get some turnout for the presidential election. And we all see that the numbers are much, much higher on presidential elections than local elections. Um, and there's a whole set of equations about how you maintain the core structure of the Democratic Party as a sort of um, go along, get along attitude from the unions for a neoliberal party pulling out uh, the election of the state legislative Democrats, especially in the majority Democratic states like California. It's a very cynical operation. And um, the um, um, so it's very difficult to cobble together, even at the presidential level, um, a until you inspire and organize the people who are not voting to get out and vote, the Democratic Party is stranded inside what its rich donors want it to be, which is a coalition of uh, basically a few very, very wealthy people. Um, The financial industries in New York, Silicon Valley out in California, socially liberal wealthy people from those two cliques, and then the professional classes, and then a portion of the working class largely from communities of color. That's the current democratic coalition. And the white working class, the vote is is very bad for the Democrats, even now among white union members, though they still might eke out a victory there in some races. So especially in highly blue states. Because there are there are there, some of the states that are completely democratic are are white states. You just look at New England, right? 
right. and then Washington too, majority white states. So um, it's, um, but it doesn't add up to a class, uh, a class politics, um, working class political party. It's not that, right. you know, that's simply not the Democratic Party. And until you win over basically the white working class into a multiracial class coalition and you mobilize poor people and young people to actually get out and vote, not in even beyond presidential elections, that transformation can't happen. So we have to go forward and organize those groups of people uh, with policies that are appealing to them, including, by the way, strong labor unions and, uh, and also work with people inside the labor union movement to break away from that coalition that is, has maintained its uh, seat at the table at the Democratic Party. Well, the, the, the worst, that, look, 2022 is the Democrats are not going to win. They're just not. OK, because I, I don't think people are going to be motivated to vote for the Democrats. They've not enthused. Look, young people. When I when I talk to my former students who are just, you know, like in their mid 20s. The first thing they remind me of is that nobody's done anything about student debt. They feel they feel betrayed. That's the first thing to say that he lied. He lied. And they would have been happy with 10,000 just the, with the fact that, you know, you know, to maintain some semblance of a promise. Uh, but also, it's thinking. also like not prioritizing voting rights. It's right. electoral, electoral idiocy, idiocy of the highest order. Yeah. The no, I mean, order. we could we could lay them all out. And then um, look. Not to mention anybody with half a memory memory knows that Biden did nothing to secure the fifteen dollar minimum wage. We're, I mean, the working poor. What are they going to do? What are they going to say? They couldn't even get a. They couldn't even get fucking fifteen, right? Right. A liar. Well, before you go, I'm going to start end the show with how I started it. My friend Jeff Blackwood, he is a, that's a nom de guerre. He's a political consultant from the vast and deep, dark left side of the political spectrum. He runs candidates who uh, should win but don't. He <laughs> turned me on to CapitalTrades.com. Everybody should go to CapitalTrades.com. I'm going to tell you the Josh Gottheimer story. New Jersey Democratic Congressman Josh Gottheimer, who attached the massive tax cut to the spending bill, right? Is he, the, is, he is Gottheimer Bergen County? Yeah, he's my sister's. Where, where, where we grew up? Yeah, okay. Yeah. He's a also Harvard Law School graduate and a Democrat. So according to CapitalTrades.com, while all this is going on with the infrastructure bills, Josh Gottheimer last week purchased $15,000 worth of Apple stock. He sold his Texas instrument stocks and used the profit to purchase NVIDIA. That was about a $20,000 trade. He bought in the past week $50,000 worth of Microsoft. He sold $15,000 worth of Uber. He purchased $15,000 worth of Netflix. He sold $15,000 worth of John Deere stock. He sold close to $50,000 worth of stock in PayPal this week. During the run up to the bipartisan infrastructure bill, while the rest of us schmucks were worrying about infrastructure. He was asking, how do we pay for this? How do we pay for this? I'll be right back. I have to call my broker. He was trading stocks, buying and selling individual stocks. It's all public knowledge. He sold stock in Twitter. He sold $15,000 worth of stock in Zillow last month, right before Zillow tanked and said it was getting out of the home buying business. What did Democratic Congressman Josh Gottheimer know? Right, Back good in question. August, mm -hmm. it gets worse. He sold close to $8 million worth of Microsoft stock options alone. 
he was going long, and then the next day he was going short on Microsoft. He was face down in his iPhone trading tens of millions of dollars worth of stocks when he was supposed to be doing the government, the people's business. How is it possible that this is not the top story that Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House, in the past year, how is it possible that we are not being told about her trades that come close to about $100 million? She made, no, I'm sorry, $19 million worth of trades. She personally made. That doesn't include her criminal husband, Paul Pelosi. Ro Khanna purchased $25 million worth of stock and sold off $15 million worth of stock in the past year. Democrat, Bernie supporter. How is this not, how is this not told every single day? Wasn't there, who used to end every speech with death to Carthage or something? No, I don't know, but that's... There was a famous, uh, was it Cicero who, who used to end each speech with death to Car Carthage? How is this not the end of every speech? Hmm? I don't know. I, I'm, you've just depressed me again. No, I think it's great. What's great? That you're bringing that forward and we're learning about it i'm glad you oh no it's, it's important you do i mean yeah. jesus but how capital, is it possible it's that capitaltrades.com is the place or something like that yeah how how is it possible that this isn't the number one story in america alongside a, a, yeah alongside of uh what what is wrong with trading stocks if you're if you're Josh Gottheimer or Nancy Pelosi, by the way, there's Bernie doesn't trade. Joe Manchin doesn't trade. Matt Gates doesn't trade. Uh, Kevin McCarthy, the head of the Republican Party in the House, the future speaker, doesn't trade stocks. How is how is this not? Piano wire and guillotine time. Well, I'm not sure that a week before the Bastille fell, they actually knew it was coming. Just keep that in mind. Well, there's that, but also it is because of the whole layout of the party I was talking about. The Democratic Party, you know, there's a, there's a it's a byproduct of a guy like Chuck Schumer being in charge of the party and saying, you know, for every working class voter we lose, we'll gain two in the suburbs. So you have the focus of the party being districts like Gottheimer's. I've been involved with um, um, trying to recruit a progressive to run against Scott Peters in San Diego. You know, if we had a class uh, defined politics, just really just organized around economic class, which most people think who are Democrats think we do, like we're the left economic party and the Republicans are the right economic party. party. Um, the Scott Peters district would be a Tory district. It would be a conservative district. It's incredibly wealthy. And Gottheimer's district is really wealthy. And so in all the places we're challenging, I'm actually think that in San Diego, the Hoya area of San Diego, a UCSD in the district, it's possible that we can actually elect a progressive and um, not fear losing to the Republicans. Gottheimer won a very close race and the sentiment is any other kind of Democrat would lose that district. And it's really hard to find anybody from PDA, Justice Democrats, anywhere who thinks otherwise about that district. Now, you guys know the district better than I do, but um, the, all the splits and, and stuff, in fact, I think it's a plus red district. So, you know, that's the problem is when you have a party that is a coalition between the professional managerial class, liberals in the suburbs, and really rich people from the financial industries, you get you get monsters like Josh Gottheimer in the same political party as, uh, well, just pick anybody else who's more decent, which is about everybody else in the party who's in the caucus. 
I'm looking at Scott Peters, Democratic from uh, California, Democratic Congressman, middle name Harvey. In his defense, he has Scott Harvey million. Peters. That's his name. Scott Harvey. He has. He seems to have tens, if not, he has tens of millions of dollars. Most yeah, of it from municipal. his wife. Yeah, but I'm looking at it. He's mostly buying. He's clipping coupons, municipal bonds, and treasury bills. I'm not seeing any uh, stocks. Right. His family's much wealthier than Gottheimer. Uh, you know, he doesn't have to. He doesn't have to play dirty like that. Where's it, where does the money come from? From his wife, and I can't remember where. So he gets paid to have sex. <laughs> he's uh, <laughs> yeah, and he's quite the Don Juan. Um, he's um, that's why they call yeah. him Peters. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Um, he's an incredibly uncharismatic fellow, actually, as a politician. He's, That's why they call him Harvey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now you just got to come up with a joke for Scott. Yeah. Right. He's, he's getting off scot free. How's that? Um, he's an ass wipe. There like we go. Scott. That's good. I was, yeah. I was thinking toilet paper. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, this was great. Thank you. And, uh, we're here. By the way, for I, I, I just tech. Uh, by the way, I just I went on to my phone quickly, texted capital trades to my fo my former students. I want them to have access to that. Yes, thank you to Jeff Blackwood for capital trades. Go to capitaltrades.com, and I'm putting calls in to. They, they, they won't. I don't need Godheimer to come on the show, but I, I would like to interview a press spokesman from Gottheimer's office to go over the trades, explain the trades to us. We're entitled, I would love to have somebody from Pelosi's office explain the $18 million worth of trades. Why did, you, why did she buy NVIDIA and sell Salesforce? What was she thinking? I would think she does <laughs> owe that to us. She does owe an interview where she explains her stock trades. You would think, a more powerful you, you, when you were when you were going through the Gottheimer trades, it did seem like there would be the kind of um, insider information that a politician could discern that he was um, he was banking on. He was, so to speak. Yeah. How and, can you not have the government? The, the government, whether you like it or not, moves the market either the federal reserve and jerome powell the head of the federal effing reserve has been trading stocks in october of 2020 he sold he needed he was selling something like a couple of million dollars worth of stock we we've discovered that the the federal reserve board presidents they're like 12. But two, David, David, he had no advanced knowledge of what he was going to do in the future <laughs> You have Federal Reserve presidents who had a, who have mysteriously resigned. They were caught trading stocks. By the way, Warren G. Harding has his hand up. He wants oh, to. Warren, G. <laughs> well, Warren G. will be at office hours Friday night. What what hath Harvey wrought, uh, Warren G. And he'll be talking about being a trader to his class. Right. Right. It's it's Powell Your probably did Powell, you? Powell probably did that, but it was actually the vice chair, Richard Clarida, is the one that uh, that Warren wants the his head on a spike. He was he was the bag man for PIMCO. He was a Columbia University econ professor. I thought he was who's Richard, running the Richard Clarida. Is that the FDA? Who who's the FDA appointee? He's the vice chair of the Fed. He's he's okay. the guy that's the vice chair under Powell. Sorry. Right. And he traded, right? Is he the one who stepped down? No, I don't think he stepped down, but he's the one that traded. He's the one that got Elizabeth Warren's um, panties in a bunch. Right. 
I have a question. I have a, I have I a question. I'm going to raise my hand. Yes, sir. Can I, I, I remember some time ago, all the talk of they were going to hire these, uh, they were bringing these folks into this administration who would move to break up some of the big the Lena big Khan. Giants. The yeah, FTC. It, it, Lena Khan. And others. And others. Anybody know what's going on there? Breaking up the. What's going on? I haven't is heard anything of them. happening. GE self broke up. By the way, this is why the Democrats aren't going to win anything. Right. Because if you, you know, you l l truly for years, they've refused to, at, even to bark at the at the hand that feeds them. And working, working people, people that, that, you know, they, they want they want to hear some. They want to hear something. They want to know what what what's what are you going to do? That they would say, what are you going to do about the ways? I mean, you know, inequality is so vast that people don't even think of it in terms of inequality. They just want to know what are you going to do about these rich SOBs who are basically dictating things. I mean, you know, this the the this, the John Deere strike. Yeah. At one point, they act, they actually wanted to institute John Deere a policy in which. New hires would not receive pensions. I mean, you know, these corporate bosses, working people want to know the Democrats are on their side and they have, there's nothing to indicate that. Yep. Yep. Warren, did you want to say something before we wrap it up? And that's 100% on Harvey JK. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, beyond crazy it's i've never seen it this bad ever but then again we haven't lived that long yeah yeah i would say i i don't remember seeing it i don't i mean i remember you know difficult years but i don't remember ever seeing i'm trying to remember other than well even even under carter it was even you know i despise carter as you know the and the presidency was one of the worst but it really is the case that right now this administration and the Democratic Party is just I, even if they pass this two trillion dollar thing, I, they just won't even know how to celebrate it. They won't even know how to go out and promote it even, with all its faults, which which they don't have to talk about. They won't know how to promote it. Well, I can hear my father. My father's been dead for 20 years, kind of like the Democratic Party. No, the Democratic Party has been dead since 70 dead for 45 70. years. Yeah. 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 My father would say, it's always been this bad. You just know about it more. And, the, and what's bad about it, he would say, what's bad about it now is we know and we don't care. We didn't know how corrupt Jack Kennedy was. We didn't know how corrupt LBJ was. Mm -hmm. We didn't know how really bad Nixon was. Now we know how bad everybody is. But here, let me play out. Let me, you know, I thought that's easy to say. And I think your father was in many ways right about. It. Right. But it is the case. I know we're getting late here, but it is the case that between 1938, possibly even earlier, and 1973 or four, there was actually a reduction in inequality in the United States. There actually and there were significant laws passed both in the 30s and again in the 60s, and even in the course of the, in, 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 in the 50s, things happened, okay, that actually made life better. And this $2 trillion may have that, may have that impact, but it also remains the case that I, I don't see, I don't see the, the capitalists doing anything less than getting even richer over the next few years. Right, and if they get richer, we get poor because they can it is the if yeah. the rich get richer they have control over washington and as i was saying earlier you don't get rich unless you control washington the the idea that bill gates and jeff bezos ever got rich without the assistance of washington the financial assistance of washington it's foolish to think that that you don't get rich 
unless you have power in, in yeah, Washington. And, and something we haven't mentioned, maybe you did earlier on in the show. I don't know if you've talked to any foreign affairs people. Um, and, and I'm not I'm not promoting military conflict. But in what I'm saying, I'm just pointing out a, a strong possibility that during the course of this next year, there will be some kind of confrontation between the United States and China. And that could change all the equations, basically, about the politics right now. Luckily, we have, I hate to say this, we have people like Matt Gates and Rand Paul who stand up to the military industrial complex. They're trying to block the arms sales to Saudi Arabia right now to assist in the mass slaughter of women and children in Yemen. I, I don't think one of the benefits to a divided country is I don't think it's going to be that easy for Joe Biden to take us to war. I'm not saying they would take us to war. All I'm talking about is it's the very image of a confrontation that would could change the equation. And by the way, I, and I, I, I've learned enough, you know, in hindsight, basically, as opposed to watching what's going on, that the price of oil, and I think I said this to Alan on a, in a phone call the other day, the, the price of oil is rising faster than anything else, it seems to me. And surely the, that's the Saudis letting, letting the world know, don't, don't try to fuck with us. <laughs> right. Or McKinsey, you mean? McKinsey, yeah. Right. I mean, McKinsey's raising, Pete, you're right. McKinsey is raising the, uh, the price of oil. Pete, Pete Buttigieg is the Secretary of Transportation. Interesting that uh, he works for the company. Congressional that... congressional office holders apparently can trade in all the tra stock they want. Um, can can cabinet officers? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure Wilbur Ross. I, I think the Trump. Yes, I, I remember reading uh, those blind trusts are uh, designed to uh, make us blind to their <laughs> trades. Let me yeah. end on a positive note. Okay. Okay. You getting married? No. Uh, an alternative history. 9-11 mm. happens under our current political climate. What is the response? So President Bush wants, well, the Democrats would do what they always do and they get in line and they do exact they would do exactly what they did even with divided government they would believe bush and launch an attack on afghanistan and iraq and we'd have a 20-year war i was i was thinking i was hoping that if the political divide got so bad in this country we could never go to war no, it's, just, it's often the other way around, but. Yeah. Okay. I, I wanted to be optimistic. All right. Professor. Okay, well, I assume next Thursday night we are not gathering. Why? Thanksgiving? It's Thanksgiving. Yes. Your people celebrate Thanksgiving? That was always my favorite holiday. Your people? My what are people. your people? I, by your people, I mean, you know, my the, people. The, 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 the tribes, you mean? What do we have to be thankful for? We do a show here. For some reason, Thanksgiving falls on a Thursday again. <laughs> <laughs> Through some quirk in the calendar, once again. Oh, those crazy Maccabees, what are they doing? They're like right on the heels of Thanksgiving. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true too, yeah. right? Like, like two days two days after Black Friday. That's that's rough. You've got to wrap those gifts fast after buying them. After all, all the Jews are going to have to be out there beating back people to get their stuff and during Black Friday. I mean, Jesus. Yeah. Uh, the Mac, the the uh, we Jews should don't, Jews don't Jews, Jews don't fight the lines on Black Friday. They they get it wholesale. <laughs> Let's perpetuate more things that are absolutely true. Let's do that. Let's just perpetuate all the, the stereotypes. That's, where we're, that's what we're about to do. But yeah. seriously, I, I assume, therefore, I, we won't be seeing each other next Thursday. I'm doing a show. Are you serious on Thanksgiving? <laughs> Come on. Well, I, I'm here. 
I do a show, rain or shine. I'm in an air shift. I, I, I hate to tell you this. As much as I'd like to imagine it, I think I'll be asleep by this hour. Are you really doing a show, David? Because I'm going to be with a whole slew of, um, of um, I have a big lefty Thanksgiving I go to. Well, pop in. It's going I, to be- I can't commit to that because I'll be at dinner. But if you're really doing it, let me know. Yeah, we'll do what we did last year. You are serious then. You are really yeah, serious. I do, a, I do an annual There's Nothing to Be Thankful for Thanksgiving special. And I list all oh, the special. So, so we, So you, you don't need me. I mean, I, I, I'm I do need you. Because I'm I, not I, traveling. I, I will be here in, in, in Wisconsin. So maybe it's not out of the question. I can't commit. But... We, we come up with all the reasons not to be thankful. Mm-hmm. And we crap on the Puritans and thank God that they've been wiped off you know that original thanksgiving dinner the indigenous americans the indigenous the first peoples it's horrible what we did to them but the puritans those mfers dead gone nobody ever thinks about that there i'm ending on a high note we still have indigenous americans from thanksgiving but the effing puritans non-existent wiped off well i have no to, buckles I, on I, my I, shoes I, as i vaguely recall i don't think it was the puritans the puritans and the pilgrims may well have been somewhat different but whatever but, religion yeah. they were yeah they were probably the same but i i, I somehow remember being corrected at some point along the way because i it's not my period of history that's all i can tell you um you know and I, guys i gotta go i've still got Tons of homework to do. All right. I have abandonment issues, but uh, go ahead. Abandon me on Thanksgiving. I took a nap before we came on so I could handle it. <laughs> I fell asleep, had some yeah, wine. I, I took a nap time. about an hour ago in the show. Well, we just need some <laughs> tryptophan to, to, to go yeah. with it, too. Yeah. That's what I was thinking with turkey. And uh, I, I've got this great wine. I'm, got, I, I'm not to upset you, David. This great wine I've got that uh, I'll be drinking. Okay. Thank you, Professor Harvey J.K. Take hold of our history. Follow Professor Harvey J.K. on Twitter at Harvey J.K. By take hold of our history. It is a great one thing I have to say, though. Should I fail to show up next? Hang on. Let me have some. Let me let me sell your book. No, no. I actually want to sell something else. Okay. Oh, Nick. Since you're doing it, what we're not thankful for next Thursday, I want to go on record today and say I'm thankful for you, David, and for Alan. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I wish I felt the same. I really do. <laughs> Come to office hours. See what you've wrought. Do a reading at office hours, or you know, run anyway. Thank you. I'm obviously I grateful for Alan Minsky, executive director of. Progressive Democrats of America and Professor Harvey J.K. Thank you. Thank you both. Thanks, Thank you. David. Let's go to Mexico. This is always this always makes me laugh so hard. Rodrigo, are you there? This guy, because he's not an American, has had to learn other languages, and I just find that so funny that as an American we don't have to know anything. And you've, you speak French, Japanese, Spanish, English. Boy, it's great being an American. You can just be stupid and think, think your country is number one when you're living in one of the worst countries in the industrialized world. Hello, Rodrigo. I had two things I'll try to be fast. Um, it's okay. One, uh, Kyle Rittenhouse is going to walk, not only because he's white, but because a white supremacist judge wants to send a clear and loud message that he believes white supremacists should get away with the murder of darkies and their allies. <laughs> But he didn't kill, he didn't kill, he killed white people, I believe. And their allies. And we oh, their allies. talk about what that means for peaceful protesters. And the second... I don't know, I don't think he killed, I think the, the, 
And I'm not so sure he killed allies, but go ahead. One of the guys he killed was a crazy... Like it's, uh, you're not allowed to call him crazy. He was released from a mental hospital probably too soon. But the other two, <laughs> despite having... Uh, the other guy who testified was a gun nut. Sorry, what? The, the guy who testified, who had his bicep evaporated by Rittenhouse's gun, he's like a medic, but he's supposedly a gun nut. Like, not not necessarily an ally. So, don't mean to correct you, but you, you've been trying to cancel me <laughs> for two years now. So any opportunity I have to alpha dog you, go ahead. And the Did I throw one... you off? Are you now, are you flustered? And the most important question anyone should ever ask Alex Vitale or any police abolitionist is this. What if we fire most of the police? Won't the crime numbers go up? And then Alex Vitale, who will hopefully come back and tell you about study after study, statistics from real communities and more that show that you can fire 80%, 90% of the police force, and crime will not only not go dramatically up, in some cases it even goes down. Uh, you real lefty listeners will be happy to hear why we should defund the police, but your liberal listeners with a thin veneer of leftism, many of whom are on the Zoom chat and the YouTube chat right now, uh, the YouTube chat right now sorry um, uh, yeah have, uh, panic attacks and plan to secretly vote Republican unless you get Alex Vitale back and let him explain why and how crime will not go up if you fire most of the police forces let alone if you stop selling them surplus tanks for urban warfare or if you fire all the cops who have cost New York City, not the state, just the city, one billion dollars in settlement money yes. over 10 years. Yes, that's absolutely right. The cops have cost New York City alone close to a billion dollars in out-of-court settlements. You're absolutely right. Which suggests, just to be a little argumentative, okay that when you fire cops, crime goes up because cops are criminals. Right? Like, it's they like... They will probably find jobs in... No. Sometimes private they're going to They're going to they're, they're gonna become criminals in the private sector instead of in the public sector. They're gang members. Most cops are, are gang members. They're, they're, they're part of the the police department, that's a gang. You fire them, they're gonna create their own criminal enterprise and crime will go up. And without any cops, we'll be told that crime has gone down because we won't have any cops to count crime. Right? We so We don't need cops to count crime. In fact, uh, there's a statistic, you can look it up, that in both in Mexico and the United States, uh, cops solve 2% of all crimes. And commit 98% of them. More violent crimes, but of all crimes, they solve 2% every year. In a Feldman administration, and by the way, you would be my press spokesman, you would be my Jen Psaki. In a Feldman administration, we would round up and arrest corporate criminals, white collar crime. We would hold CEOs responsible for any death. They'd be locked up. Would you support that type of police? I, I think without 
changing the whole system, you end up with something like the uh, the war on crime, where thousands of people get killed every year, and there's always someone to take their place. So if you send Nancy Pelosi and her husband to jail, uh, for example, there will be someone to, happy to take their place. Even if they know that they might end up in jail in a few years, there will be someone happy to take their place. Yeah, but it would be nice to see Nancy Pelosi and Paul Pelosi in prison for insider training, right? Well, yes, but there are, hopefully, we can find uh, systemic change more important than revenge. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. And what else before we say goodnight? Is that it? Yes. Um, what are you bringing to office hours? Nothing. It's full. There's, I think, one hour left, but I need two, so last, last week. Office hours is all booked up? Yes. Wow. I'll give, right. you my, I'll give you mine, Rodrigo, if you want it. Who's this? It's Warren. Warren. What do you mean you're going to, you, we just promoted yours. Why would you give it I up? Understand. Because Rodrigo says he needs it. But we were all excited about your your office hours. Don't give I'll up. Wait. I'll do two hours next week. Okay. Thank you. No, Warren, don't give up your slot. How many languages do you speak, Warren? Just just, just one. Yeah. But, uh, but at the same time, it's just like Rodrigo's right about that. But the, the, did you see that there was an article in the Times during the Seattle um, free zone where some business owner calls the cops and says, you're in the free zone. There's nothing we can do to help you. And basically it says you have to go to the people that are operating the free zone in the, for protection. There's not, we can't come in there. So that that's the potential of what will happen if Oh, that's a real world example. It's something that happened. So, all right. There, there, there is like there's another aspect that um, you should bring up with them. Just remember, the cops' pension fund is huge. It's gigantic. You, you watch the first episode of Billions. It's like what five, six, five, five or six billion dollars. That's real money. So is the AFL-CIO's pension fund. So oh, yeah. is the teacher's pension fund. And they turn it over to hedge funders managers who invest it against the own interests of the teachers and the Teamsters. And right. That, that's, you, watch, you, know, you watch Billions. Come on. It's like you don't think that. Don't watch are, oh, you don't? Oh, no. I need to watch that. It's like, but you know what I would it, love? What I would love is to try capitalism the right way where the american government starts owning stock in these corporations that we nationalize and still have capitalism where we own 50 percent of a business and the unions are powerful and they take their pension funds and don't turn it over to blackstone they have their own money manager who invests the pension in like an index fund, a safe index fund, and punishes uh, corporations that are anti-labor. That would be capitalism at the at its highest level. And I'm tired. We're going to call I'm, it. I, I'm, I'm, br I'm bringing you the evidence tomorrow night uh, okay. on that. It, Mariana Mazzucato talks all about this, and I'm going to Okay. Display her to you. So. All right. Yes. David, right. I have one quick announcement before you. It's Milo. So, I, 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 I thought I hang on for one second. Hang on. What? I not. I'm not criticizing you, but I thought I had the power to mute people. But is this a, well, like? Can anybody just interrupt in the chat? Well, you you unmuted me earlier, and and so I just. Uh, I mean. Once yeah, I unmute yeah. you. Oh, yeah. Well, hang on.
hang on, let me just try this for one second. Let me not that don't take this personally. Oh, can We're, I make my quick announcement first? No, no. It's about Andrea and Ben. No, I want to see if I can mute you first. Uh, I want to make sure I have power. No. Of course you do. I want to hang on for one second. All right. Well, uh, okay, go ahead. Okay. Oh, thank you, David. They already set a date in place, Sunday morning, 1030 your time, Eastern, on her channel, above it all. Ben and Andrea will talk amicably. Great. So I'm looking forward to it. I will get up and try to see it. That will be great. Great. Good. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Myla. Thank you to everybody who came to this show today. Thank you to everybody in the chat room. If you would like to meet a better class of people, uh, I was going to I was going to insult people in my chat room, but uh, go to davidfeldmanshow.com, hit attend a live taping, and sit in our virtual studio audience and ask questions of our guests and engage with the people in the chat room. It's always a, a spirited conversation of left of center people who know how to behave. And if you don't know how to behave, you get tossed out of here. We are a uh, community here on Zoom after all. Please subscribe to this show wherever you get your podcasts and be nice enough and kind enough to give us a good review and smash the like button. I've been told to say smash the like button, subscribe, share this show wherever uh, you're listening. We're on every platform where podcasts are heard. If you would like to see what we look like, we have a YouTube channel. We simulcast the taping of the podcast on YouTube. We have about 6,000 subscribers. So if you would like to watch a live stream of the show, go to YouTube and watch it and subscribe to the channel and share it with your friends. That's a great way. YouTube, I'm discovering, is a great way to share this show. And we have timestamps. So if you want to revisit an interview or a conversation, there's a timestamp. And on YouTube and Spotify, you just click the timestamp and it'll take you directly to the conversation you're looking for. So please do that. Friend me on Twitter. Follow me on Facebook. I mean, friend me on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter. Thank you to Sam Cedar, Majority Report. Thank you to Dan Frankenberger in the doing the community billboard. Thank you to Sergio Alcabilla. He's a candidate for U.S. House of Representatives, Highway, Highway, Hawaii one. Rorikki Hutchinson from Weekly Marks was back and he had a great conversation with Professor Alex Vitale. And he is the author of The Critical Criminologist as well. His new book is The End of Policing, published by Verso. The End of Policing, published by Verso. Go buy that book. Professor Ben Burgess's new book is Canceling Comedians While the World Burns. The Hershenfelds go right now to YouTube and watch Ethan Hershenfeld's new comedy special, Thug Thug Jew. Emil Guillermo, go listen to him as the host of the PETA podcast. Read him over at the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. The Reverend Barry W. Lynn, go to barrywlynn.com for a treasure trove of his sermons and appearances on places like Crossfire and Firing Line and Professor Marianne Cummings, thank you. And thank you to Professor Jonathan Bick. I hope Professor Ann Lee and Professor Adnan Hussein join us next Thursday. We will be doing a show next Thursday, even though it's Thanksgiving. Professor Harvey J.K., follow him on Twitter at Harvey J.K. Pick up his book, 
FDR and democracy and take hold of our history. And of course, Alan Minsky, executive director of the Progressive Democrats of America. Special thanks to my friend uh, Jeff Blackwood for turning us all on to, what is the name of the website there? Hang on, capitaltrades.com. Spread it around. Find out the criminal inside trading that is being done in Washington, D.C. by our leaders. And thank you to Professor Mike Steinel for Pig for Love. I'm David Feldman. Remember to stay strong and protect the weak. I'm a porcine gourmand of the art of romance. I'm a maestro of the boudoir when I take off my pants. All of this is true, all of the above. I wouldn't lie to you, cause I'm a pig for love. He's a pig for love. He's a pig for love. My appetite's rapacious, but my capacity is dim. I seem so audacious, some call me Gentleman Jim. When all is said and done, and a push comes to shove. I'm a second to none Cause I'm a pig for love Others won't come close Cause they think I'm suspicious Please pardon me If I'm somewhat repetitious Like a hand in a glove I'm a pig for love time right now for the David Feldman show he's talking politics and comedy too he'll tell a dirty joke if you want him to he's just a lefty from way back he's a union man with an Emmy for writing someday he's mad and he feels like fighting It's time right now for the David Feldman Show So get your ears on right, buckle in real tight He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way It's time right now 
of the David Feldman Show. So get your ears on right and buckle in real tight. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. He's got a lot to say and he's coming your way. He's got a lot to say and he's coming.